Okay, thank you so much, Sierra. Good morning, Board of Commissioners and to the citizens of Douglas County. Today is Monday, October 4th, 2021, and is now 10.01 a.m. Uh, thank you for joining our work session this morning, and I will call this work session to order, and I'll start with roll call. Well, uh, District 1, Commissioner Henry Mitchell III, are you here? Hello, Chair. This is Sherelle Penniman. He's actually on the call, but he said he will be a little bit late with actually um, signing on, but he, you guys can go ahead and start. Okay, thank you so much, Legislator. You're welcome. All right, we're gonna move on to District 2 and Vice Chairman Kelly Robinson. Present. Okay, District 3, Commissioner Terenia Carthen. Present. District 4, Commissioner Ann jones Skyder. Present. Ramona Jackson-Jones, Chairman Present. Our Board of Commissioners, we do have a quorum. Clerk, certainly we're gonna move right into public comment this morning. Clerk, do we have anyone sign up for public comment? Yes, ma'am. We did have Mr. LaVon Dixon, and I believe you just heard from him. He is on the line. Mm -hmm. I just want to remind the public that when you're speaking, you will have three minutes to address the board. Um, once, you are, once your three minutes are up, I will let you know to wrap up your comments. And um, if there's anything that we need to get back with you on, we will be happy to do that. So Mr. Dixon, you may begin, and if you will repeat your name and your subject matter. Uh, my name is LaVon Dixon. Uh, I am calling a reference to a few emails I've sent out to Chairwoman Jones. It's regarding the $160,000 fine that was paid on behalf of Kelly Robinson uh, due to the fact that he reneged on the initial agreement that he had signed into. I had sent over some questions to Chairwoman Jones on probably about five different occasions in the email format. And I've never gotten a response back to them at all. Uh, so uh, I'm going to just ask the questions and actually get them on record right now. But I would like a response to them, and I will send them out, back out to email to everyone uh, regarding this matter. And we can kind of move forward from that standpoint. Uh, but I have about 10 or 12 questions, so hopefully I can get through them. I will try to read through them relatively quickly. I do know I have a short period of time. Uh, but if not, I will pick up the remaining questions at the next se se uh, session. I, I guess it'll be in two weeks. Uh, my first question is this. Uh, city taxpayers had to pay close to $160,000 in attorney fees because Kelly Robinson decided to renege on an agreement. Uh, he had signed into that agreement uh, uh, due to the fact that he did not want to be criticized by the people whose taxpayers pay his salary and who also had to pay the $160,000 in legal fees for a private action uh, that the commissioner chose to make. Uh, I had a question in terms of who made the decision that this should be the responsibility of the Douglas County taxpayers to cover those costs when it was when he initially uh, uh, made that decision himself that he wasn't going to honor an agreement that he had signed into. Uh, so I wanted to know, was it a collective effort by all the commissioners to agree to this? Or was it a, a unilateral decision? How was that determined that the taxpayers would cover those costs? Uh, the second question I have is, um, when we were reported on this, it was also stated that all other elected officials who whom had similar problems acted totally differently. Uh, when they signed into an agreement not to block citizens, they honored them. Uh, Commissioner Kelly Robinson was the only official who did not honor the agreement and thus cost the taxpayers of this county over $160,000. Uh, I want to know were there any corrective actions taken by the Douglas County Commissioner's Office in regards to Mr. Robinson's behavior? Uh, Douglas. Douglas, Douglas County uh, government condone this action itself. Uh, my third question on this is uh, Douglas County decided to use a particular law firm, uh, I think by the name of Olin's, in which it paid out the $160,000. I want to know how was it decided to use this particular law firm uh, from the standpoint? Did this particular law firm make any contributions to any council members on staff? I mean, how was the law firm selected? Uh, it seems like a, a very unique case. And I have a history in working with, with prior law firms. And there's a lot of different firms out there. And I just want to get an idea what the backdrop was and how this one firm got to receive this, this very lucrative contract uh, from the standpoint to work, what contract, very, very lucrative job uh, to, uh, to uh, I guess, acquire these fees. And I want to know what legal justification, uh, justification was used uh, uh, that stated the residents of Douglas County should pay these fees for a private action taken by the Commissioner Robinson. I mean, this is probably one of the most important questions that I want to ask uh, from that standpoint. I mean, this was a private decision that he made uh, from that standpoint to violate an agreement that he had entered into. Uh, and I want to know why was the Douglas County taxpayers on the hook to pay for the fines uh, uh, that that he he specifically chose to uh, chose to 
this sign of the agreement that he had made and why should we have to cover those costs associated with that. And I also want to know what government fund was used to pay the $160,000 in fees. Uh, was it budgeted for? Uh, did it have to come out of other funds specifically within what district that those funds had to come out of? And was it spread out evenly across all different districts of all uh, commissioners? Uh, uh, what particular district did it come out for? And if the item was not budgeted, what city projects had to be sacrificed as, as a result of the Commission Robinson's violating the agreement he had uh, agreed to and be signed into? Uh, was there any type of alternative economic analysis done to illustrate what the $160,000 fines could have been used for instead of paying for a problem that the commissioner specifically caused and created himself as a private citizen? Uh, from that standpoint, uh, yes. Can you please wrap up your comments? Your, your three minutes have Sure. I, 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 I'll, I'll, Okay, I'll just have this one last uh, comment. Uh, how many economically distressed uh, Douglas County citizens and children could we have fed with that hundred sixty thousand dollars? How many housing assistance? How much housing assistance could we have uh, provided to Douglas County residents with that hundred sixty thousand dollars? How much financial medication of purchases could, assistance could we have made and provided to some of our elderly residents with the hundred sixty thousand dollars? Did anyone evaluate that and look into that and see if that was the best appropriate use of taxpayer dollars? Uh, but those are uh, some of the questions and I will kind of uh, sign up for next week and, 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 and continue with the other ones that I have forward. And I would love to get a response from this. I've been asking for these questions now for probably about a, a few months. I've sent over numerous emails and I never get a response back, never got any feedback regarding it in any in any form. So uh, I, I, will, I will welcome it, welcome my questions to be answered. And I will again send them out in, a, in, in an email format to all my all the commissioners and I look forward to hearing, hearing the responses. And thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Dixon. Uh, we did not have anyone else sign in, Chairman, but I would like to extend it to any other citizens who may be on the line that would like to speak this morning. Is there anyone that has called in that would like to speak? Chairman being none, I turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Clerk uh, Watson. All right, Board of Commissioners, we're going to move on. And thank you again, uh, Mr. Dixon, for coming in. Madam uh, Chair. Uh, Vice Chairman Robinson, would you like to? You, ha you have the May floor. I? Mm -hmm. You have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate Mr. Dixon um, for joining us this morning. And um, it's interesting how his, his personal attack is predicated on his own behavior by not paying his own HOA fees. This is where this started from. And it's unfortunate, Mr. Dixon, that you're even in this place. I mean, I, I advocate for you. Look at your behavior, right? And so you're, you're trying to, and, and I, I watched something on C-SPAN recently, again, by elected officials at the congressional level, state level, where every now and then you're like, oh, you gotta make sure the record is correct. We allow citizens to speak, first amendment, but it goes both ways, right? It was both a, for me on Facebook, and again, one more time, why do people waste time with that, right? So the lawsuit was a federal lawsuit against me politically and personally. That's the operative word, and, right? So in other words, it got covered. The person got covered by the public. That was their choice. I get to defend myself in ways it's allowed. But it shouldn't be about that, Mr. Dixon, where the very thing on the agenda today is advocating for HOAs, the situation that you caused in your own life. And I told you I would get at this. I got this. But you're attacked by bringing it back into balance, man. I got this, right? And this, this, this is where, come on now. But I get it, you're loud. And you, you're, you're converting that energy. And I, I understand, I understand what it means to be under pressure. I understand households. But your situation is not mine, but I'm here to advocate, regardless whether you vote for me or not, to advocate what I believe is right. I agree that those HOAs, that, that they're heavy handed. I told you I would do it my way, not when you wanted to because it's a process. You tried every type of angle to go after everybody from Senator Dugan to, to Representative Nakima Williams. I mean, you've gone after everybody, you try to yank this, like, okay, I got this, man. 
You're going after the chair. You're going after the press. You've done everything you could to sort of like, but we got this. It's a process, man. This is really a state issue, but we're going to do what we can do at a local level. Like I have, I've had HOA townhomes. I've been working on these for five years. You came to me. So the, to your, 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 your onslaught, like, wow, look at this. But this is the cost of being elected. It's, you know, people will change and they'll do what they do. But nevertheless, I mean, um, the, the, that's a legal matter. Whether they respond or not, that's up to the board. They, they understand their role. So it's not trying to say this, trying to create some type of atmosphere. They know better. But just for the record for them, like they, they don't have to. Legal matter. But as it relates to you know, me representing you, it's like, I got this. Right? Just, just, just chill. Like, walk through the process. Show up and talk about that. Help shape the legislation that you're under. I was hopeful that you're on there going to talk about this. And yet, very God is advocating for you for them putting that lien on your house because of your behavior. It's like, okay, look, man, I'm like, right? I got you. But okay, Madam Chair, I had for the record is public comment. I mean, obviously it goes back way. But I mean, rarely do we do this, but every now and then the record needs to be established so that it's not off, off keel. So I yield the floor, Madam Chair, going with your agenda, respectfully. Thank you so much, Vice Chairman Robinson. All right, we're going to move on, Board of Commissioners. Uh, just if you would just be mindful of the approval of the minutes for tomorrow, if you just take an opportunity and, and review the minutes and be prepared to approve or deny accordingly tomorrow. Also, tab number four is uh, proclaiming the week of October 3rd through the 9th, 2021 is Fire Prevention Week in Douglas County. And our uh, Fire Chief, Joe Levette, will be presenting uh, the proclamation. So, Board, just want to make you aware of that. I'm going to pivot back to presentations. We have one presentation. Am I correct, Clerk? We have one. Has anything changed? We have one presentation. It's the TAD redevelopment plan. Correct. Okay. All right. With that being said, uh, our Executive Director of the Development Authority, Chris Pumphrey, are you on the line? There you are. I am here. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, in front of you all this morning. Um, myself and our uh, consultant, Gary Monjin with KB Advisory Group, will be um, doing the presentation uh, this morning. So I think Rick has our slides. Perfect, perfect. So I'm, I'm going to walk through um, the first slide, and then I'll turn it over to Gary uh, to do to do the balance uh, of this. So, um, just for the the sake of the the public, just to make sure everyone is is aware, um, the the public voted for a referendum to allow Douglas County to have redevelopment powers uh, last year, November. Um, the purposes of getting of obtaining those redevelopment powers. Um, was to then move forward on the creation of a tax allocation district. And the purposes of tax allocation districts are to define a redevelopment area, go into that area and look at an, an opportunity to spur new development in the area to counteract you know, pervasive poverty, uh, low property tax values, um, just uh, a lack of new development taking place in a particular area. And so that TAD was created and we focused the, the, uh, the attention of that TAD around the Lee Road and Fairburn Road intersection to encompass the, the Lee Road um, corridor where we have the widening that is going forth, where we've got the um, embarking on the Southern Inner Arc, which basically becomes our east-west connector uh, here in, in the county. And then which also captures a piece of property um, that we uh, did a master plan on uh, several years ago. Uh, Rick, you can go to the, the first slide. <clears throat> so just some, some background uh, on this. In 2018, um, the Board of Commissioners adopted um, a small area uh, plan that was uh, performed by Clark Patterson Lee. Um, though that plan was funded through SPLOS funds um, they put this plan together, got a lot of public input um, to, to develop this plan. Um, it's important to note that in the plan, it was really, as I mentioned, taking input. What does the public want to see? Um, what are the kind of activities that they want to experience? Um, how do we kind of create this 
mixed use development that has a transformative impact uh, on, on the corridor. Um, and so that was really what went into it. What it did not take into account was the site acquisition uh, process, you know, that was going to be necessary in order to fulfill a plan, you know, construction costs, um, the market research or financial analysis. So it really became kind of how do we want to activate the site? What do we want to get out of the site the most? Um, and then from there, then it becomes an, an exercise of, all right, what do we need to do in order to perform this? Um, so the development authority um, began to acquire options uh, on key parcels. So we took down about 133 acres. Um, this plan that was done was roughly 220 acres. Um, so we were able to, to get under control about 133. We identified future parcels that we knew needed to be brought um, under, uh, under the plan as well, but we also identified that there were just certain parcels we were not going to be able uh, to obtain. Uh, we then hired KB Advisory Group um, in 2019 um, to evaluate the financial feasibility of that site plan. Um, we uh, incorporated the, the updated site acquisition. So what are the parcels that we know, you know we, can, we can bring along? Um, we also engaged um, an engineering consulting firm to kind of help us understand what the uh, development costs uh, might be uh, for this plan. So in 2019, uh, we presented that, uh, Gary presented that to you all as commissioners um, at your retreat, um, performed, did the analysis of the CPL plan, what is the forecast of the resulting property taxes, you know, what are some other revenues uh, that could be raised to support, you know, the, the redevelopment. And then we, we launched into the need to have the tax allocation district, you know, brought along. So it's important to note that there is a very uh, legal um, process um, in order of implementing a tax allocation district and the state governs you know, what, what that process is. And so this, this redevelopment plan that Gary is going to present to you today is what's required uh, by state law. Um, what it does not do, it does not dictate what is to be built in the redevelopment area. It is simply just to look at a concept to say, if we were to develop this, this is what the projections would be, the tax increment that could come from this plan. Here's how this would impact the poverty levels, property values, so forth and so on. Um, there is a, a, a separate process that would involve the rezoning um, of, of the property, but the, the redevelopment plan um, does not dictate what that rezoning is. So it is not a a decision of the board to say, this is the zoning, this is the site plan um, that we will adopt. It is basically to adopt this redevelopment plan so that we can put a tax allocation district uh, in place. A prime example of this is the um, old jail property, which you all uh, sold to the city of Douglasville. Um, that there was a, a proposed plan that um, the architecture firm, and I can't think of their names right now, that was hired by um, the city of Douglasville. Um, they did a plan that had, you know, the, the town green, it had three office buildings on site, and it had multifamily on site. Um, the plan that Mill Creek, who is the developer for that site, it does not look like that plan, but the TAD was adopted under the original site plan that had the three office buildings and the apartments in the back. Um, and so now that the TAD is in place, then we kind of went forward to identify a developer for that. Our process is more concurrent, um, but still very fluid because we don't have a final site plan uh, for that project. So I just wanted to make sure everybody was kind of aware uh, of that. Um, so the presentation here will address the contents of the draft redevelopment plan. Um, we are not looking for a decision on anything right now. Gary will kind of walk through the timeline um, but we will need to have a public hearing um, uh, to, to present the plan to the public and allow for their input. We wanted to have this presentation with you all today to answer any questions that you might have. So from here, I am going to turn it over to Gary. Thanks, Chris. Um, good morning, commissioners. Uh, it's a pleasure to, uh, to be before you again. I believe this is the third assignment that uh, our firm has done in Douglas County in the last few years. And I certainly enjoyed working with your authority and working 
uh, with you as well. Um, could you uh, go to the next slide, please? I'm gonna to try to give you just a very high level of what's in the draft redevelopment plan. I wanna stress that it is still a draft um, and to kind of just reiterate what, what Chris said. I think your most important role in this process uh, between now and the end of the year as policymakers is two things. One, uh, you'll be asked to pass a resolution uh, stating that this area is in need of use of redevelopment powers uh, and you've made that determination as elected officials. And then secondly, is to get, is to determine a geography within which uh, redevelopment powers can be used. Beyond that, the redevelopment plan is a business plan. It doesn't have the force of zoning. Uh, it's not an ordinance, it's a business plan. And if any of you have ever done a business plan or familiar with what business plans do, they're intended um, basically to be a blueprint for the purpose of, obtaining financing and starting an enterprise. And business plans um, you know, constantly change, uh, but they're, they're the framework for moving forward. So if you think of, of the redevelopment plan as your business plan for this part of the county, um, that's what we're trying to accomplish here. Um, the, biz, the, the first thing that a redevelopment plan has to do is establish you know, what's the purpose? Why, why are we doing this? Why is this area need redevelopment? Uh, what is our objective as a community and as policymakers for doing this? And basically it centers around two things, the corridor plan, the, the, the small area study, uh, the original county economic development strategy that was done a few years ago. Uh, and I've highlighted in this, in, in this exhibit, pillar two of that, um, strategic plan, which is invest with intention. Uh, I believe this whole focus on Lee Road and Fairburn Road started around um, you know, that process, invest with intention, turn this area of the county, which is currently undervalued and underperforming uh, in terms of your economy and tax base and really making it the focal point of unincorporated Douglas County. So, a lot of emphasis on the redevelopment in the redevelopment plan is talking about that process, talking about how this redevelopment plan, not necessarily individual projects as they're currently proposed, but the redevelopment plan is fully consistent with county objectives to turn this part of unincorporated Douglas County into basically your economic engine moving forward. I think the term in one of the plans was making it uh, the recognized downtown for unincorporated Douglas County. You can go to the next, uh, next slide, please. So the first part of the process is to establish a, a redevelopment area. Um, and it's not the TAD itself that has to qualify under the statute in terms of meeting the definition of a redevelopment area. The TAD boundary and the redevelopment boundary don't need to be the same as long as the TAD is located within uh, the redevelopment area. So we, we put a lot of emphasis into analyzing the geography. We knew the intersection of Lee and Fairburn Road was going to be the focal point of the area, uh, but we, we actually did three or four iterations looking at different geographies to see what would be the best um, area in terms of qualifying under the statute uh, and enabling you to use redevelopment powers. And we settle on this area, um, which is basically formed by a number of roads um, and tr trying to stay out of incorporated Douglasville. And we came up with an area that has about 6,400 people. It's almost 2,000 acres. Um, and the characteristics of this part of the county, it seems like it was developed sooner than many other parts of the county. Um, so it hasn't grown much since 2000, only three tenths of one, uh, three tenths of a percent annual population growth. It's a fraction of how fast uh, Douglas County has been growing. Uh, the median income of this area is 20% less than the uh, MSA average, 7% uh, below the county uh, median. Uh, the poverty rate was, uh, is 2.6 higher points, 2.6 points higher than the metro area. And the definition of pervasive poverty uh, under the redevelopment powers law is 10%. So 
So this area qualifies on that basis. 43% um, of the housing units were built before 1980. There, again, there's a provision in the redevelopment powers law. It says a prevalence of, of homes that are 40 years old or older with no historic significance. So it qualifies on that basis. Median home value, again, 35% lower than the MSA, 15% lower than the county median. And then probably, you know, in terms of your fiscal aspirations, again, this is a strategically important part of your county geography. Um, throughout the entire redevelopment area of nearly 2,000 acres, the average real estate digest, the taxable digest, is a little over 85,000 an acre. And it generates a combined $2,700 per acre in city and school district taxes. So in many respects, it's underperforming of what it could be. And certainly it's underperforming the aspirations of the small area plan. You can go to the next slide. Thank you. So this area inside the kind of black dash line is our first cut, actually a second cut, at what a tax allocation district would look like in terms of the tax parcels that would be involved. There will be a second map that will specifically um, identify the public rights of way, um, which would extend beyond this area. What we want to give the county the flexibility to do is make public improvements to any of the major roads um, as funds are available in the future as you see, as you deem necessary. So that doesn't affect the digest of the TAD. We just wanna make sure the public rights of way are included. So there'll be a second map in the, uh, in the full report uh, that identifies public rights of way. But in terms of specific tax parcels, uh, they're shown here. And this again is a second pass at a, at a, at a TAD boundary. Um, first draft, uh, the advisory committee met last week and uh, we made some changes based on their comments. But basically, um, I don't know if you could see my cursor, but it includes uh, everything that was originally part of the small area plan. It includes the parcels that would need to be acquired to extend Lee Road um, to Bomar Road. And what we tried to do is incorporate all of the undeveloped frontage on the southwest side, all of the frontage on the southwest side on Fairburn Road. Um, where the Lee Road extension would occur, and then to the best we could, the undeveloped frontage to the Northeast or, or parcels that might change in character in the future. And then there is, you'll notice a circle toward the top. Uh, I was discussed a possible addition of, of parcels, those large parcels um, on, the, uh, on the west side of Lee Road potentially could be added. Right now, they're not part of the TED, but again, that's a decision that could be made in the, in the next couple of weeks. So this geography is um, in the table kind of summarizes what's there. It's 136 parcels, a little over 700 acres. Praise value, including uh, public property, uh, Georgia DOT. There's a school building in here. Um, the total value, including exempt property, is a little over 52 million. The taxable digest is 18 million. Uh, I do not have the... 2021 incorporated Douglas County Digest, but based on the 2020 values, uh, this area is roughly a half of 1% of the county's unincorporated digest. So the maximum you could put in TADS is 10% of your digest. This is less than, um, you know, one-tenth of 1%. Um, the total uh, county and school district property taxes collected from within those parcels shown on this map is only 580,000 uh, today, um, which is represents an average gross digest of less than 30,000 an acre. And it contributes a combined total of $820 a year in property taxes on the real estate uh, to the county and school district. So this, if this is to be your future downtown for unincorporated Douglas County, it currently generates 800 bucks an, you know, an acre uh, per year to your tax digest and clearly is underperforming. So again, in terms of your aspirations for this area as expressed in the small area plan and your county comprehensive plan, 
that's the basis for doing this. Um, it's what you want to achieve moving forward. This TAD is not blighted uh, currently, it doesn't need to be blighted uh, to meet the definition of the statute. But again, it's a strategic area of the county you have high uh, expectations for, which doesn't currently comply. And that's the purpose for qualifying this area as, as a tax allocation district. Next slide, please. Try to go a little quicker. So again, as a business plan, you have to have projects. And we've written TAD plans in the past where projects are purely aspiration. There's no developer, there's, you know, the community's attitude is we want to do something in this area, we create a TAD, maybe we'll get developers to respond. And in our experience, TAD plans that are based entirely on aspirations don't go very far. Um, so we'd like to include, you know, the latest iter iterations of, of proposals that have been made that might be implemented in some form. Again, not necessarily as they're current propo currently proposed, but will be implemented potentially in some form in the future. So this obviously is the one that's making its way through the permitting process currently. It's called Project Silver. They've developed a couple of concepts and this is sort of their bubble diagram land use plan. Uh, we put some numbers on this plan and potentially it could result in nearly, you know, more than 1.9 million square feet of new construction, including, you know, potentially a, a, a county um, administrative complex somewhere within, within this plan. So again, we, um, we put some numbers on this just like we did a year ago on the original CPL plan. Um, this plan, if implemented in some form as currently proposed could result in a full market value addition to this location uh, about, about 174 acres of $260 million. That potentially generates about 1.7 million a year in annual county property taxes, including potentially 410,000 a year in personal property taxes that would not be pledged to the, uh, to the tax allocation district. So between all of the revenue sources that might come off of the site in the future, uh, you're likely to collect a heck of a lot more as a county than is currently generated from the, the entire TAD. Next slide, please. There are other uh, potential projects that could occur within this area as well. Um, the one change that might be made to the draft that currently is to provide more information on other potential projects uh, within the TAD uh, we've identified three locations in, within the boundaries of um, TAD is currently drawn where there's likely to be investment in the near term. Uh, one next to the school, which we understand has been proposed for apartments. There's another pro project uh, that's potentially been proposed, again, just uh, southeast of uh, Project Silver. And then right across the street from the entrance um, to Project Silver, uh, there's an ongoing office park that's only partially built out. So we've included that. Um, again, projects do not projects simply should be viewed as investments that will create increment within the TAD. Does not mean that those projects would receive any increment directly. It just generates the revenue that you are free as as a, as a policy making body to spend anywhere within the tax allocation district. And we anticipate the bulk of those expenditures would be for public improvements um, rather than you know, direct subsidies to those projects. So again, just kind of view that as these are the areas uh, that would generate increment that you could spend within the TAD to hopefully get you closer to achieving your aspirations for this area than would be possible otherwise. And these four projects, again, we have no numbers on those currently. If we get more information, we'll include it in the report. But this easily represents an, another potential $100 million investment within this part of the county. Next slide, please. So we did a forecast, uh, again, updated um, of what's potentially possible. Um, we assume if you assume the TAD could be in existence for 25 to 30 years, 25 years is typically a good number in terms of forecasting. Uh, 
the gross digest of the TAD could easily exceed 108 million by 2030. If Project Silver moves forward in some fashion, if that in turn stimulates other residential development uh, and other mixed use development along Fairburn Road, I think that's a very conservative forecast of $108 million total digest compared to what's there today, which is a tiny fraction of that total. Over 25 to 30 years, assuming the school district participates at 100% of, of its increment, and that's by no means a, uh, you know, a, an assumption that uh, is, a, is a done deal, um, but assuming the school district does participate fully, uh, we're talking about total tax increment of 62 to 78 almost 79 million over 25 to 30 years. If you think of that as a future revenue stream that you might be able to leverage um, to generate upfront capital for public and private improvements within this district, it's about the equivalent of 26 to $30 million. So again, think of this, you have high aspirations for this part of the county, a TAD could help you potentially generate 26 to $30 million in Republic revenues and incentives to pay for things to achieve your aspirations for this part of the county. Uh, that's potentially what this district could do. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the next step is to say, okay, if this 26 to $30 million materializes, uh, what would be our priorities as a county um, in terms of how those funds would be spent? And again, this, this is part of a business plan. This represents, this table would represent current thinking. It's not mandatory that the numbers be spent exactly in this way, but this kind of sets a, you know, policy priorities for the county. Um, and again, the, the first three components of that are all public improvements. Um, making you know the geography the 174 acres shown on that previous site plan developable um you know the roads the roundabout the internal infrastructure the public parks the public amenities and the extension of lee road what happens in the development itself you know that will evolve over time but those investments are are necessary and that's about half of the total revenues would be for that uh, those types of investments uh, we anticipate, we don't know for sure, again, depends on the final site plan, that there'd be a structured parking component uh, to make this density uh, possible. The original CPL plan had even more structured parking requirements than this plan, uh, Project Silver, may require, but we felt it was important to set aside at least 10% for, public par uh, for structured parking should that eventually become uh, part of the redevelopment plan. And then the rest would be other development incentives, um, again, to make the initial investment feasible. Um, and a lot of times these development incentives are to pay for additional costs that the public sector imposes as a condition of permitting, as opposed to a direct subsidy to a developer to, a developer to make the project more profitable. So again, our expectation is, as this goes through permitting, you're going to ask for lots of stuff that isn't feasible today. And the TAD could help, again, create more quality, build the kind of project that you want as a county, and help pay for those additional costs that wouldn't be feasible otherwise. So again, that's the rough concept for how these TAD funds would be spent. And again, it's subject to, again, additional input, and it can evolve over time as conditions change. Next slide, please. Uh, other parts of the redevelopment plan that are required by law you should, be, you should be aware of, as the current draft says that the county commission will be the redevelopment agency uh, who will de delegate day-to-day -day administrative responsibility to the development authority. That's the way the plan's currently written. Um, it addresses consistency with the county zoning and future land use map. Again, the redevelopment plan is what's consistent with the county zoning and future redevelopment and future land use plan, not necessarily individual components of individual projects as currently you know, being presented 
to the Planning and Zoning Commission. It's the plan, the, the, the redevelopment plan that's consistent. Um, as a statement, you have to make that you're, you're committed to following state and local historic preservation policies, as well as relocation policies. Uh, historic preservation is not likely to become a critical component of this plan, but potentially as the extension of Lee Road may require some relocation. So there's a statement in the plan that's required by law. Establishes a potential 30 year life for the TAD. Doesn't mean the TAD would need to be in existence for 30 years, but again, the intent is to give you flexibility as an elected body moving forward. Um, it gives you maximum flexibility, to use different approaches to finance redevelopment projects. That includes issuing bonds, may not necessarily issue bonds, um, but again, we want to give you maximum flexibility to respond in the, in the future as, op as opportunities and conditions dictate. And then probably a, a critical thing to, for you to think about is that this plan only, as it's currently written, only pledges real estate increment to the TAD, doesn't pledge personal property, could, but as currently written, it does not pledge personal property or sales taxes to the tax allocation district. So any revenues of that type is generated by this plan, that goes to the general fund. And those revenues are gonna be substantially higher than are currently generated from all sources for those parcels that are currently inside the TAT. And it finally includes a school district, a school system impact analysis on the Douglas County school system. And again, that's a requirement of, of, of the statute. And then there's a list of the individual tax parcels that were illustrated on that map that's uh, contained in the, in the appendix. And again, there's 136 individual parcels as the map is currently constituted. I suspect that map could change again, maybe even a couple of times before you uh, vote on, on, on a resolution adopting the plan. Next slide. I think we're done. So what happens next uh, is there must be a minimum of at least one public hearing before you can uh, schedule a vote on whether or not to adopt this plan. Um, the plan ha uh, has to be scheduled, it's submitted within 60 days of that vote. We're, we're on schedule uh, to do that before the end of the year. Um, the public hearing has to be advertised at least once. You have 45 days after that first public hearing to hold a meeting for the purpose of considering approval. You could potentially schedule a TAD public hearing and approve the redevelopment plan the same night, the same day, if that's what you decide to do. But typically it's a two-step process. Most communities, again, uh, there's also, yeah, they also have, you, know, you also have your own process for public hearings and adopting local legislation. So a lot of times communities choose to do their, um, you know, their normal process as opposed to condensing something that's important, uh, you probably want to have a hearing, you'd want to have time to consider input from that hearing, uh, and then have a second meeting um, that ha also has to be advertised the day you, you vote, and you could have a second public hearing prior to that vote. Um, and that's, that's basically it. Uh, after the, again, as, as part of the vote, you have to adopt a resolution. That resolution has to be written in a certain format. Um, we've been through this with the city of Douglasville. Writing the resolution should not be uh, all that difficult, but it has to be, again, address all seven sections uh, that are specified in the law. Assuming you adopt a redevelopment plan in TAD, then we would make sure the tax base, the TAD base digest is certified as of the end of the year. We've been through this process with uh, the county tax assessor before in Douglasville, so this should be, uh, you know, fairly easy process. And then, again, and once the resolution is adopted, um, you would begin the process of requesting school district consent, and we would recommend um, sending a copy of the draft plan and inviting their comments and inviting them to the public hearing, at least making them aware of the TAD public hearing. Uh, as well, so that they're fully informed in this process. And if they have input, uh, they can provide. And I think that's it. I hope I haven't talked too long. So. Thank you so much, Gary. Uh, Board of Commissioners, you have any questions for Chris Pomper or even Gary? 
Okay. No questions for it? Yes, um, ma'am. Okay, Commissioner Geiger, you have the floor. Yes, Gary, uh, to simplify it, uh, just take a scenario. Say I own a parcel and I don't. Uh, I want to make that clear, yeah. but I say just say I own a parcel within this TAD. What value is frozen? Well, the taxpayer sees no difference. The taxpayer continues to pay their taxes just like every other county taxpayer. Uh, what's frozen is the base value of the district. So the value of the district as of um, December 31st of this year is, is the base value of the district. So the unimproved, if it's uh, no structure on the parcel, it would be the unimproved value. Then as the TAD uh, say, then I sell it to someone and they build a, an apartment complex on it. Those funds go back into paying um, any bonds, I guess, <laughs> or uh, goes back to the county to invest in the infrastructure? Yes, I mean, that's basically how it works. Any, any, once the base value of the district is sent, annual revenues coming out of the district as of that date continue to go to the county and school districts general funds as they always have. The incremental value of what's created over time goes into, instead of the general fund, goes into a TAD fund that will be managed by the county. And that fund can be used to pay off debt service on bonds. Um, does not necessarily have to be a TAD bond. A lot of communities use tax allocation districts as one source of revenue to fund other public improvements that they're making in, within the district. Woodstock has done this extensively uh, they do public works projects. They make public improvements. Um, other cities have, Duluth has, um, has, has funded uh, public projects using conventional sources that they use for public bonds. Um, and they just use TAD revenues as one source of repayment of those bonds. Whether only TAD funds are pledged or other sources are pledged and TAD funds are used to backfill, uh, you can easily use TAD fund if you decide to say do something with SPLOST and you decide to reimburse that SPLOST investment over time with TAD funds, you could do that as well. So there's lots of flexibility in terms of how those funds can be used in the future, as long as it's for capital costs not operating. So let's just say my property is on the, the books, on the assessor's books for $1,000. But then I turn around and sell that property for a hundred thousand. So that does not play in the value that stays on the digest, right? It's the value as of, of uh, December thirty first this year. So it stays on the books at a thousand dollars. The base digest would yes, um, and then any. Any increment that's created as a result of that transaction, that would impact the TAD fund uh, positively. Even the, the difference between the 1,000 and the 100,000, that also goes into that fund? That, you know, if the taxable value of that parcel changes as a result of that transaction and it goes up, you know, two, three years from now, it's reassessed at a higher level because somebody paid $100,000 for it. That the taxes related to that incremental increase in value goes to the TAD fund. Just one way to look at this is that, you know, instead of, I mean, the revenues from this part of the county, those county taxes, those school district taxes, instead of going to the general funds of both those jurisdictions, they would be spent within, within that geography. Um, however, you decide to make those investments as the county commission. Okay, uh, I heard the term relocation several times. <laughs> say I, I have a home there, uh, or say a rental house. I'm just renting on one of these uh, parcels. And then 
this is fall, falls into the tag. So the property owner wants to sell it and move on. So uh, what happens to that person that is renting that house? Well, the only, the only situation under which relocation costs might be incurred is for the extension of Lee Road. Other than that, um, we don't anticipate. I mean, there potentially could be some road widening that might require acquisition of sites as would occur in any public works project. Um, but again, uh, just by virtue of being in a TAD does not, does not provide any additional powers of eminent domain than the county already has. I only anticipate, we only anticipate that this could occur under a scenario where it's necessary to extend Lee Road or to make public improvements. Again, as you would any other public works project uh, within the county. Well, as y'all were talking, uh, it, it was evident that this is uh, sort of beginner homes, what you might uh, refer to as beginner homes. And so they're, they're not the 1800 square foot homes that we require sure. out here and everything. And so it, beginner homes are um, hard to find uh, as, far, as far as renting them. Uh, so I just wondered what happens to that citizen that's living there because they, they rented a smaller home and all of a sudden the government's taken over and you have to move and it's hard to replace that. Sure. Type home. Uh, again, the, um, the only, it's important to distinguish between what the redevelopment area is, which is almost 2000 acres and what's inside the tax allocation district, which is 700 acres. Uh, we're only, uh, this redevelopment plan in terms of, again, tax increment and the ways the county could invest tax increment in the future only applies to the 700 acres within the tax allocation. And among those 700 acres, um, there's only a handful of houses. Almost, it's almost entirely either undeveloped or commercial property. So again, distinguish that between the rest of the redevelopment area, which again, other than, you know, road widenings, road improvements, public amenities, um, giving those people access to employment and commercial services and county services and recreation inside the TAD, um, they should not be affected adversely. Um, hopefully, um, you know, the, the value of property in that part of the county will appreciate because of these investments that make, you know, will make these 2000 acres more valuable. Um, but I think that'd be a quality of life improvement for, for everybody. Um, I would the, the, caveat the to what I, I'm sorry. The, yeah. the maps were are kind of hard to read. I understand. No screen. Uh, will we have a? Can we come down to the development authority and look at these maps and see the overall picture? Or can the citizens do that? <laughs> so, um, so I I emailed the Gary's presentation. I think maybe a week or so ago to everyone. Um, we don't have any big maps. Um, that have been printed, we, we can definitely do that. Um, but to, you know, to Gary's point, um, within the TAD, it's very little, if any, single family housing um, in there, uh, other than kind of what's kind of destined to be already um, developed via a contract. Um, but we, we can definitely present a bigger map and that will also be a part of the public hearing process. So um, we will, um, to go through the public hearing, we have to make sure the public has all of these documents that they can read through it, that they can see all of the maps. So we'll make all of those readily available online. Right. Well, I got the small maps, but even those are hard to um, tell exactly. It's hard to even read the roads, but I would like to see a bigger map that we can read the, you know, the roads that um, they touch and how far into the uh, from the corridor, sure they go into the residential area, 
So, uh, and I had 45% <clears throat> of the uh, people that own the houses live there, is what you had on one of your slides. And that 80% of um, uh, 1,921 acres was residential. So I, maybe I'm talking about the corridor and you're talking about the extension. Well, the, the, yeah, the, the redevelopment area is the geography that qualifies for use for the county's use of redevelopment powers. Where you would focus those powers is limited to the tax allocation district, which is only a third of the geography of the entire redevelopment area. So that's, that's the distinct, distinction. In the future, if the county wanted to, it could establish more TADs within that those 2,000 acres. Right now, there's no, there's no, um, there's no intent to do that. That's just an option you may or may not have down the road. I just want to make one point, uh, just to make sure I don't misspeak. The there is a mobile home park that's included within the boundaries of the tax allocation district. Um, there is no immediate plans to do anything within that area. The reason it's included is again, we wanted to include all the frontage on the Northeast side of Fairburn Road that might possibly be impacted um, by this investment in the future. Um, and to give uh, the county flexibility to do something down the line if should it choose to. So that mobile home park is in the TAD. There is nothing specific related to it in terms of uh, public investment or use of TAD proceeds. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and yield back because uh, we have time to um, talk further offline to sure. clarify some of the issues. But uh, thank you very much, both of you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Commissioner Peter. You have questions for comments? Yes. Question, Robinson, you have a forward. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I'm gonna be quick because I know we got the rest of this agenda to get through. But um, gentlemen, thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, gentlemen, for being here this morning. Um, again, I want to acknowledge the fact of, of, of a TAD as a tool uh, that is available uh, to help advance uh, the county's objectives. Um, I have to acknowledge um, public input that has been given um, over time regarding this. I have to acknowledge the city's efforts for using a similar tool, the same tool, in their footprint. Um, Overlay that with Lee Road uh, extension, and there's there's a parallel. Lee Road was already in play. Lee Road extension was already in play prior to this being a targeted area, right? Lee Road was about mobility in the county. Go back to the two. I mean, we're looking at rainstorms right now. Go back to what 2009, 21 inches in 72 hours. We learned with our grid. Our capacity was in this county, everything was north south. So, uh, out of that became that whole focus on we got to be able to move people east west. And so, obviously, that's something that had been on the books um, for quite some time the widening of the roads, uh, perhaps the use of eminent uh, domain, which we did, and the currently road widening. Um, it's, it's, it's nothing new, uh, it, it's, it's part of progress. Um, you use it selectively. And the questions they're being asked um, obviously are very valuable. Second part is public input is something that has been going on for a while. Um, the master plan, the master concept is, was shaped by citizen input. Uh, it was a good process. It was interesting just recently, um, September Saturdays, there was a listening post that um, my staff established and. The citizens, the few citizens who did stop by and uh, ask questions, they, they weren't interested in the strategic plan of the county. They were all about that Lee Road. They were all about that. And like, okay, this is what I'm talking about. Okay, this is nice. When is that going to get built? So I'm going to speak just from district two uh, perspective on this is something that they bought into. This is something that was part of a referendum. Um, I've got to acknowledge the process in which you guys have gone about doing this. Um, it, it, it has allowed um, the citizens to participate along the way. Some people are brand new, they never saw it. And some people are like, oh yeah, I, rem I remember that. Like, when are we gonna bring this online? 
Um, but I, I just got to emphasize it's all about being strategically intentional in how we move. I'm going to go back to District 4 and, and, and sort of the whole, whatever that project was, was out there. And um, that, that was um, obviously a similar project, um, generating economic development in different districts. Chris, I think you recall that as condition of, of, of my vote, um, we rewrote development for development authorities policy and what we wrote your charter to acknowledge that we will not go beyond 10 years in straight economic development and symptoms. Uh, we recognize that obviously if you're going to put 40 million out there, you're going to put it in all the other commission districts. And obviously I was next up, um, which is why we're here. So I'm giving a history lesson on how things evolve. Right. And I'm going to go back to um, the comment that was made about money in it. Remember that project was we're going to put guarantee a bond 40 million in we get what 1.7 million dollars chris over 30 years and obviously i just put on my hat to say it's okay interim return their present value i mean i get i get this is a different play but this is not nothing new our capacity to be able to look at projects and, and look at is it in the best interest of the county um and and, and moving forward and there's different tools um, that you use i think this one is appropriate here uh, but we've got to go through the process. Uh, we, we must continue to allow the public hearing to uh, go forth and get citizens input. I think there is, again, refinement of two things for me. And I'm sure I'll yield. The legal part, I'm going to go back to my comments before. Uh, that still stands. I want to wrap this up tightly. And then there's the financial part, which is I hear the numbers. But again, we got to keep, keep refining them, right? Just keep refining them, keep refining them. It's like, okay. What are we going to get out of that? Are we going to be upside down? Is this, it, it, what we potent, when you use words like potentially, and it could, that means like, okay. But I got to get a plus or minus. So it's like, I get it. It's all relative. But, you know, again, right now, we're, you're working through the process. I know you have people at the table. And the more we go through this process of conversation, the more people can become educated. And as my peers, they'll, they'll make their proper decisions accordingly. So um, I just want to thank you guys for coming. I would like to have seen this a couple of weeks ago, about a month ago, but nevertheless, it's here now, and um, um, this was very good. Madam Chair, I'll go back. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Um, any other questions from the board or comments? Certainly, I just want to weigh in with a quick comment uh, regarding our chief financial uh, advisor. I'm hoping he's at the table with this project today, Mr. David Corbin. I'm not sure if y'all had any discussions with him at all, Chris, and he's just... Yes. You have good. Yes, good. Madam Chair. Um, I'll, I'll just point to that point. We do have a TAD committee. Mm -hmm. um, so that committee consists of uh, Vice Chair Robinson, uh, Commissioner Carthen, uh, Tax Commissioner Baker, um, our Chief Assessor Steve Balfour, Planning and Zoning Director Ron Roberts, um, and our Financial uh, Advisor, Senior Advisor uh, David Corbin. I'm not, I, ho I hope I didn't miss anybody. Oh, very good. That's that's good. You've given me a piece a sense of comfort. And uh, in, in the discussion, I certainly heard Project Silver yields room to leverage this tab. So that that's exciting news as well. And then, uh, I, Gary, you said there were many uh, assumptions built into your presentation, uh, which, in my opinion, precipitates the needs for risk analysis. But it sounds like all that's already done with all those key players that you just mentioned, uh, Executive Director Chris Pumper. So that gives me some comfort. So, well, I know we, we, we're going to um, have this come before the board very soon in terms of public hearing, and we just uh, will stay tuned. If there are no other questions or comments from the board, I'm going to move on to the next item. Thank you again, Gary, and thank you so much, Chris, for coming in this morning. Ma Madam Chair. Yeah. But, okay. Chair. Uh huh. Uh, I'm trying to put on. Yes, ma'am. I just wanted you to know and the board to know I've had discussions with David Corbin, and if David were on the line, he would be asking that any documentation that is going to be presented, that we get it well in advance of any meeting so we can properly vet it both legally and financially as suggested by the vice chair. Yes, okay. So- Agreed. Agreed. Uh, Chris, did you hear that? And Gary, we need that information uh, for the legal and the financial uh, side in advance uh, to the public hearing. Yeah, absolutely. The uh... The full draft plan, um, it's, it's still evolving. I'm just waiting for any additional information on potential projects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's, that's the major 
thing we're waiting for. Um, once that's done, um, the draft can be finalized very quickly in, in terms of the draft that's presented to the public at the first hearing. That draft uh, would be available no, no later than the day of the hearing notice is published, uh, hopefully prior to that. Uh, you would have an opportunity to amend that document at any point from, from today to through to the night where you, uh, you vote on a resolution. Mm -hmm. um, and again, the, the redevelopment plan is basically the business plan blueprint, does not commit anybody to any financing. You really can't until you know the terms under which the school district would consent to participate. Yes. Uh, that's the way the process works. Um, you know, you adopt the plan, negotiate consent with the school district. Based on those terms, you have a, a formula for projecting revenues going forward. And when you have, when you're in the process of negotiating with individual developments, um, that is when you have a better sense of the financial revenues that would be available uh, to support, you know, public financing should you choose to do it. So those kinds of financial decisions are probably not going to occur until the first quarter of next year at the earliest. So again, just to understand the process. Okay, thank you so much, Terry. And thank you so much again, Chris. Board Madam Chair. Okay, Vice Chairman Robinson. Yeah, yeah, just, just to help, but but I need to develop for you still have to, it needs to be acknowledged. No shotguns at the last minute for us to hold the wall. Your comment, well, you know, when they, when they, when your side gets information and you're waiting on it, and so well, we didn't get it until yesterday, so then we gave it to you, but you you're missing the point. That, that's what you, and that's why I just, as I'm listening to you, like, okay, they're not hearing. I, we get the process you've got to go through. You've got to recognize my, my peers from the fourth district, the third district, the first district, Madam Chair needs to get this ahead of time. It doesn't matter what the details are. It's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the process in which of sharing of information. They're trying to get their minds into this and you're almost like dismissing the what they're asking for. And it's like, okay, guys, just help us with this. Just, just acknowledge what we just said that like, okay, so my point to the county minister, if we don't get this at least one week prior to that, then it doesn't get on the agenda. Don't shotgun us. I understand your side. We didn't get the information from this. I, okay, y'all not listening. Get us what we need. So we need to put a, a let's put a time frame in. Chair. Like, I mean, you guys, we already got the rule in place. So just enforce the rule. It says, well, if it's not in by this period of time, the Tuesday before, it, regardless of the, the public hearing, you just have to reset it again. You just have to do it over. But please don't, don't this, this one right here, it needs, I just need for you guys to acknowledge what's being said. And I thank you, Ken, for what you did, because it is something that we brought up, which is like, okay, it's about the information. And you, you got to hear that like it's, you're not going to be able to side stroke this one. So just acknowledge what you're saying. This is not just we'll get you the information. That's all. Not what's going to be in it. Just that they can get it timely. And so that means you need to put pressure on your side to get stuff in versus trying to shock us, us based on some time frame because it is our decision. We can just slide it. So be sensitive to that. Um, don't put the pressure on us because again, if we feel pressure, then people are like, I'm just not comfortable. So please acknowledge that. Madam Chair, I just wanted to clarify that because it, it just seemed like it was getting lost and it was important. It did come up in the steering committee. So I yield back, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you so much, Vice Chair. And just want to remind uh, Gary and Chris this is our first time, the Board of Commission's first time giving birth to a tad in the history of this county. So are uh, we in the, the delivery room right now? So I'm just coming a little surgical on you. Just want to make sure you all understand that this is our first time giving birth. So we just want to, if you could just give us everything we need in advance. Okay. So we thank you so much. And we're going to move on to our, and I see you smiling, Gary. <laughs> All right, we're, we're going we'll to get it to you. We can get it to you with the draft as it currently exists um, okay. with the adjustments to the map. I can get it to you this week. Okay, thank you. Just this week to distribute. All right, we're going to move on board of commissioners to our next item. Right. Our county administrator is next. She, our county administrator business. Uh, county administrator Subedan, are you on the line? There you are. You have the floor. Good morning, everybody. Um, very simple this morning, um, requesting authorization to purchase two Jeep, Jeep 
Grand Cherokees for the district attorney's office for a total of 71,770. Um, we looked diligently for vehicles on state contracts, which would have been less um, expensive, but we're unable to find anything. So these are two vehicles on the lot. Um, we're hopeful that if, if you approve this, they'll still be on the lot. Um, the district attorney's office, I'm not sure if she was able to make it onto the call today, but um, had vehicles breaking down on her investigators. We sourced some vehicles from the sheriff's office that were surplus. They were leaving her in a very bad, her staff in a very bad situation. Um, and our fleet management recommended that we try to get something newer. Um, she does have more vehicles that she would like to get replaced, but these two would give her the initial um, bridge to get to our next fiscal year. And that's all I have, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, County Administrator. Board of Commissioners, any questions regarding these two vehicles? I yes, see you, sure. Commissioner Carthen. You have the floor. <laughs> Thank you so much. Good morning, County Administrator Subadin. Um, my question to you is why Grand Jeep Cherokees? Those are pretty big vehicles. Usually, you're going to use a, a Grand a, a Cherokee or any Jeep because you're hauling, you know, more than you know three or four people and you need space. So is there a reason why we're doing Jeep Cherokees versus, you know, mid-sized compact cars, which would of course be cheaper on gas uh, or on utility maintenance, all of that. Yeah. yeah, these believe it or not are the only things that we could find that were available. I know that's probably a little hard to believe, but we have procurement scour all of our vendors um, as well as local vendors, anybody on state contract. Um, I think the request initially was for a full-size car or a mid-size SUV. The, the Grand Cherokee actually falls into the mid-size SUV class. And um, that's why we landed here. We even tried to look at leased vehicles. I asked Enterprise if they had leased return vehicles. That might be a possibility just to give us a bridge. And we came up pretty empty. Um, I think the procurement director is on if you want to hear more information on the research that was done to try to get us, get her something that would be able to um, get her people mobile in something reliable in a short period of time. Got you. So my question then to, um, thank you, uh, Madam Subedin. So my question is uh, going to be to Director Evers. Director Evers, can you tell me how recent, if, if we have updated our vendor um, list in regards to vehicles? Like how old is that list and have we updated it? Normally we use state contract uh -huh. for our vehicles and all of the vehicles, um, vendors on our list are state contract vehicles as well. And we have dated, updated our vendor list with vendors who are not on state contract. However, as the county administrator stated, I did reach out to our state contract vendors to see if they had anything available. They did not. And they also looked on the retail side of it. And the one state contract vendor that did is the one that is presented with these two Jeep Grand Cherokees. So my question to you is then did we um, reach out to those who were not state um, vendors? The yes. ones that are on the list that we send out requests to them in regards to us needing um, cars for our DA's office. I actually got additional quotes um, yeah. from two additional um, vendors yeah. that I received for the cheap train, um, Jeep Cherokee and the pricing for starting at 38,715 was one of the prices that I received. And the other listing prices started at $40,915 was for the second quote that I received. So I get that was for Jeep Grand Cherokees, but when we sent out the request to those vendors, did we send it out as the county is looking for two vehicles, not specifically stating whether they were Jeeps or not? Because I 
in my mind, I'm thinking we can get two cars for less than $71,000 for the DA because they're not ha hauling like any materials like DOT or, you know, uh, um, uh, other departments. They're just going out to do investigations, I'm assuming, unless there is something else that, that's going on in that office. The quote request was sent out to four then dealerships and those four dealerships were under the state contract. So my question to you is the, the request that we sent out, was it for cars or was it for, uh, you know, any cars specifically, or was it just the county needs two cars for the DA's office? The request for specific that the county administrator asked me to ask for is for the mid-size sedans or SUVs. Necessitans or SUVs, which this is, what, this is what came back. Correct. Got you. It was not just sent out for cars because again, we no. This is for the DA. They're not hauling any anything, any bodies. I don't. I don't believe so. Um, Commissioner Carthen, I'm. I apologize. I just was able to hop on. Actually, yes. the, the utilization of the cars is exactly for that to haul individuals, um, community members, those who are witnesses, victims in cases. That's one of the key components of the investigators' responsibilities is to transport um, victims and witnesses to and from court hearings or coming to the courthouse for interviews um, or transporting staff to go out to crime scenes, things along those lines. So there's definitely the need to have a vehicle that can accommodate that. Okay, so, so I didn't know that the DA's office actually will go pick up a witness and bring them into the office. So then is it more than two? Uh, witnesses at a time or is it that you all are transporting one witness at, at a time? That can vary. It all depends on the case. It depends on um, who is needed. There's been multiple times where say we have uh, a witness that we need to testify um, and say they don't have any child care. So we're transporting them along with their children to be able to come here uh, for a hearing or for a court matter. So it can vary from one to multiple. We're known to keep car seats um, within our office or within various cars just to accommodate that scenario. So it's hard to say how many at any time. Uh, also, if there's say a child crime, um, you obviously need to transport the child as well as the family members um, that may be needed. And so I know that oftentimes we, there's a transportation issue that we find um, frequently within our victim and witness population. And so it is not uncommon for us to have to provide this transportation to and from. Got you. So then that would be why you're asking for mid-size as opposed to just a compact car for investigators. Correct. And that would be in alignment with what we've had to date thus far. Um, uh -huh. And so that's why we're asking just to replenish at that same size. Wonderful. That's good to know, because in my mind, I was thinking, why in the world would they need a bigger bigger SUV? Because that means more maintenance, more gas, et cetera. But you explaining that helps me to realize why we need it. So thank you. DA Racine for getting on and, and clarifying that. And this is one of the reasons why we're always asking for our constitutional officers or either someone from your office to be um, to be on board when you're making these types of um, appropriation requests. Because from the commissioner side, we don't actually know what is going into that request. So you being on here really helps us and helps the public to realize why. Um, and so my question then is back to you, um, Madam Subedin, what fund is this coming from? Where are we appropriating this if this is to pass? Thank you, Commissioner Carthen. Um, if you recall, a couple meetings ago, there was some funding put aside for year end requests and four different categories. This will be coming from capital contingency. This would be coming from the capital fund. Do you know how much is um, in that capital fund to date, Ms. Subedin? Yes, we haven't used any. It's six hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. I yield. Thank you so Thank much, Mr. McCarthy. All right. Thank you, uh, Vice Chairman. You have a floor. No, I just uh, I didn't want to interrupt a bit of my my colleague. Just a point of order. I want to make sure we acknowledge the District Attorney. Though it was nice at the end, I, she jumped right in without I'm like, okay, who's talking? And um, then I, I picked up on her voice, but just for the sake of the conversation, Madam Jerry, can you acknowledge her for being here as well? Please? Yeah, abs absolutely. 
Um, District Attorney Racine, are you still there? And I wanted to thank you for uh, coming on. I know you were busy and then you have a lot of cases going on, but you took the time to come. So I wanted to acknowledge you and also uh, Vice Chair, did you have a question for? No, it was just that I didn't want that the public like, well, who is this talking? Because we rarely get to see her. So it was more of just oh, yeah. a point of order. We're good. Yeah. I'm good. Don't believe it. Absolutely. All right. Thank are we you all appreciate it? Oh, oh, you're welcome. Board of Commissioners, are you satisfied with response and the information that was provided to you? If if you are, we're going to move on. Thank you so much, uh, County Administrator. Board of Commissioners. Well, also, I just want to know, are there any other Constitution officers or elected officials on the line that would like to speak? This is your moment. We appreciate you all coming and sharing your thoughts with the Board of Commissioners, and we welcome you to do so. This is something new uh, that we've added to our work session agenda. Okay, being none, we're going to move on Board of Commissioners. We have grants next, tab number six, authorization to accept the fiscal uh, year 20. Uh, OJJDP Delinquency Prevention Grant Program in the amount of $30,000 to provide for service of the Strengthening Families Program and amend the budget and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. There is no match required. Uh, Director King, are you on the line? There you are. I am. Good morning. Good morning. This is a grant that we had been receiving, so it's just an extension to run this program um, longer and for more kids and families. It is called Strengthening Families, and the grant pays for our facilitators, the supplies that they need, and also for meals. Um, this is a program that encourages family communication and time together while they're completing the program. And there is no match, as you said. Madam Jerry. You still here? Yes, I'm here. I'm so sorry I had a conversation by myself. Thank you so much, Director King. We appreciate you. And um, no questions from the board. It's pretty self-explanatory. We're going to move on, Board of Commissioners, to our business item, tab number seven. And thank you so much, Vice Chair, for letting me know my mic was off. I had a conversation long. Tab number seven is approval of the purchasing card, P-card program, utilizing the cooperative purchasing agreement through the state of Georgia's contract with the Bank of America. We have um, Director Miller, are you on here? Our acting finance director and then Don Evers, our purchasing director. Don Evers, okay. Yes, this is Don Evers. And there's we have Robert Bell with Bank of America. He's the director for senior card account manager. He will be providing the presentation. Okay, thank um, you. So Communications Director, would you present the presentation, please? And thank you for being here this morning, Mr. Bell. Good morning, yes, and thank you for having me. I'm going to go through this fairly quickly um, and then leave any, um, a Q&A, a, a couple minutes for Q&A at the end. Again, my name is Robert Bell. I'm with Bank of America. I'm a director um, and a um, on our sales side or solution side for payables, which includes card. And I've been with the bank for about 15 years. So um, next slide, please. All right, so if, I mean, what, we, what we've done here is highlight the uh, program for you. This is a no cost program. Um, we have dedicated product solution specialists myself that are connected with the state and dedicated customer service associate for all of our um, entities under the statewide contract. Um, we also have technical assistance and, and basically at the end of the day, the purpose or the reason that entities will move to PCARD is really to go to, um, to try to eliminate paper out of their offices from an AP standpoint. And with our government entities, there's always um, the opportunity to earn revenue share for paying your bills. We do use a web-based technology called Works. Next slide, please. So this slide goes through the revenue share opportunity under the statewide program. The state controls the, the revenue share. Um, what we do is we pay the state annually. Um, typically, we pay them in the month of August because um, it follows their um, 
actually we actually pay them in July. It follows their fiscal year, June through July, June through or July through June, and we pay them um, in July. And then the state pays the entities underneath the contract. Um, and this chart gives you an idea of what the state is going to pay. So at eight million dollars, the state would pay 140 basis points, or 1.4 percent. Um, Three million to 7.99 in spend, they would pay 110 basis points, and so forth. As you look at this slide, you know I was listening in on the um, conversation um, earlier about the purchasing of a Jeep. In most cases, um, a purchase card could be used to purchase a Jeep, and that would get you at least $71,000 going forward. Um, next slide, please. Program offers um, many different controls and, and consolidated billing. Um, so go through this page fairly quickly. Um, it is centralized billing, which means that the purchase card um, bill would come from Bank of America directly to the county and not to your cardholders. Um, the cycle would end at the end of the month, and the county would have 25 days following the end of the cycle to pay Bank of America. Um, and there are multiple statement options um, or payment options available, including ACH debit, credit, Fed wire. Next slide, please. So what kind of controls do you have in place? Um, and again, this is at the cardholder level now. So we're looking at um, what, we, what the bank calls single purchase dollar limits, which means you could um, set up an employee or a cardholder with a $2,000 um, credit limit but you can limit how much they make, how much they can purchase with any one particular purchase. So a $2,000 credit limit, but you don't want that employee to be able to spend more than $500 at, during a single purchase. So we have that ability. Um, daily cycle and spend control. So you can set, again, a credit limit for the cardholder, but then you can also say, I don't want my cardholders to be able to spend more than X on any given day um, or during their cycle. You can also control it by number of transactions per day. So they can only have five transactions per day, regardless of what their credit limit might be. And the bank also um, follows um, the ability to establish merchant category controls. And basically what that means is that if this is a purchasing card program, you want to turn off um, transaction purchases at, at places that would be more likely suitable to travel and entertainment restaurants, hotels, airfare, et cetera. Um, but you do have the ability to dynamically switch that on from a program administrator standpoint. If an employee is going to be traveling to say a convention for a couple of days and they need access to hotel or restaurant um, and things like that, that are typically more travel oriented merchant categories. We do not have the ability to block transactions at the vendor level but we can block at the merchant category level. And, and what I mean by that is if your preferred vendor is Home Depot and an employee goes to Lowe's, they're more than likely going to share the same merchant category, but we can't stop them from using that card at Lowe's. Um, but what we do provide are audit reports um, so that your program administrator um, and or um, accountant or auditors that are, on, that are assigned to the program can go in and look and see exactly where your cardholders are making uh, making purchases and, and reach out to them if they're out of policy. Right, Next right. slide, please. Um, there are also liability protection Thanks. controls that we put in place. Mm -hmm. And and basically what this means, you know, it's a little bit different from fraud. So we'll, we'll talk to the liability piece first, 100,000. Liability um, insurance is basically insurance that's set up for uh, if you have an authorized cardholder, an authorized employee that uses their card for a personal purchase, and if that cardholder is terminated, um, we will pay up to $100,000 back back to you um, as part of a claim process through Visa, um, through the Visa um, relationship. Now, and, and again, that's an authorized cardholder. So you issue a card um, to an employee. That employee goes out and purchases a. Um, a, a, a new car um, for personal use, not for use with the county. Um, if that employee is terminated, we will reimburse you up to $100,000 for that misuse. Fraud's different. Um, fraud, as long as you, your employee or your PA report fraud within 60 days of receipt of the statement, 
um, we will reach out to the to the merchant and or the merchant bank and 99.9% and .9 of the time we'll be able to um, apply that credit back to that account. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and basically what this goes through really is more about, you know, why entities want to go from um, making payments or, or allowing their, you know, establishing a purchase card program. And it really comes down to um, creating better efficiencies, um, empowering your employees to make small dollar purchases um, so that they can go ahead um, and, and make purchases quickly without going through a PO process. And, and again, the reporting on the back end provides you um, with the ability to see what they've purchased and make sure that they're following policy. And, and typically we see this in the government space with purchases that are less than $2,500 but are high frequency. Next slide, please. This talks to, to some of the additional benefits, um, value-added benefits, benefits on us. Um, and I, I know that you all have the, um, the, the presentation hopefully in a soft copy and you'd be able to click on that link where it says benefits on us and it just talks to about some of the other benefits that are available um, through the Bank of America purchase card program. Um, if this were a travel program or, or if a card holder uses it again using that convention as a um, example, um, you know, if they're flying somewhere, um, there's lo lost luggage insurance, et cetera, associated with the card. Um, there are mob there's a mobile app that's available um, to card holders if the county determined they wanted to turn that on um, so that they can receive alerts. Looks very similar to your home banking app that you may have on your phone today. The look and feel very easy to use. Um, but if the county decides in going forward that they don't want their employees to use the app, the employees can still access this, um, this resource um, via their computers. And your card holders will have um, access to customer service 365 days a year, um, 24 hours a day. Next slide, please. This page it just goes through, again, um, traditional purchasing card versus department card. So, you know, we recommend that you go with traditional purchase card first, which is issuing cards to card holders. Um, but you also have the ability to, to issue department cards. Um, if you have a project that you're working on and you want to control that by budget, you can certainly look at something like that. Um, or as a meeting card, if you were um, hosting or, or traveling with multiple people to a convention, such as the, um, I think DOAS used to throw a convention uh, down in Seattle City every year. Um, and so if you had a group of employees going there, you might want to set up a meeting card where you can um, pay their some of their expenses up front instead of increasing their credit limits on their individual cards. Next slide, please. This slide talks to the difference in cost um, based on surveys that are done by RPMG, um, where they reach out to, to government, local government, federal government, um, large corporate, small businesses, et cetera. And, and they just talk about what the cost is for your traditional PO process when you're paying by check, and then they, they compare that with purchasing cards. So typically the reduction in cost is, is, is about 78%. Um, and you also have um, your, your reduction in, in savings and days in terms of your payables outstanding. Next slide, please. Uh, this talks to what different industries are, you know, using purchasing card as it continues to grow through the industries. And I'll just let you eyeball that for a second. And, you know, it does speak to virtual card and traditional purchasing card. A virtual card is a little bit different where um, purchasing card is used for POS or point of sale purchases. You have an employee that needs to go to um, the local Home Depot to, to purchase equipment um, or go online to purchase equipment. They can do that. The virtual programs are usually um, making using card to pay your invoices. So you receive an invoice from an AT&T or another entity that accepts card and normally you pay them by check but the virtual card program gives you the ability um, to push them a payment um, via card. And that enhances the volume that you put on card, enhances your, your day's payable outstanding, and it also gives you an opportunity to earn higher revenue share. Next slide, please. And that's it. Um, any questions whatsoever, please.
Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Bell. Uh, Board of Commissioners, do we have any questions or you know, comments regarding these PCARs? I want to just frame it by saying that uh, for the public's sake, that these uh, our current process that we have with our credit cards uh, in, in the system is broken. And certainly I've experienced it for five years and not only myself, but the Board of Commissioners and all those who uh, have cards. Uh, we've had at one point of time in our um, travels, we've had our cards declined and this is it's very embarrassing. And also we have numerous amounts of cards throughout the, uh, the county. County Administrator, Madam Subedan, if you could just frame for the Board of Commissioners why they ask and we wanna change from our existing credit card process to P cards, which uh, really moves us into the 21st century. Again, I've had an opportunity to research the, uh, the advantages of uh, purchasing cards. And if you could tell them what we have in our system now, so they are, have a better understanding of why we're asking to move in this direction. County Administrator. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so we have a couple of things happening. We have a corporate credit card and I think we have 12 cards issued, um, but the cumulative amount, cumulative amount of our limits on those cards is about 30% of, um, of what's needed. So that's problem number one. Um, we get charged fees and interest on that card. So there's no real residual benefit to the government. Um, in addition to that, from a controls perspective, we have a number of store cards that have been issued to departments, um, Home Depot cards, Lowe's cards, Walmart cards, all of these were issued prior to my arrival here. And I have great concern about controls. With the P card, every transaction has to be uploaded in works. It has to be approved by um, a supervisor. It can then be coded to our general ledger. So if there's ever a question on what was purchased, we can go back and show why it was purchased, who it was purchased from, and who it was purchased by. Currently, um, finance has a very difficult time reconcil reconciling these various um, department issued cards for Walmart, for um, for Lowe's and Home Depot. They simply get a register receipt, just like you would when you use your personal card. Um, and there are times when we're paying sales tax when we shouldn't. It's just, in my view, it is a liability to the county. I feel like it's not controlled and we're getting no benefit. So this is, this is coming at it from two perspectives. Um, and yes, you are correct. We've had a number of missteps with our current a vendor. Um, we have tried to work with them. Um, they've been less than um, helpful to us. And so for a number of reasons, and you know, this is quite honestly, many, many governments in Georgia are using the Bank of America PCOD program. It is best practice. Um, and so I'd like you to consider it. Um, I will say it's not the only program out there. There are others, but we believe this is the best of breed and that's why we're bringing it to you for your consideration. Thank you so much, County Administrator. And I believe Mr. Bale, you said 92% of governments are using, utilizing purchase cards, P cards. I'm looking at, I looked at your graph and I'm hoping I saw 92%. Yes, okay, I was correct. Yes. Board of Commissioners, you have any questions regarding the sure. request? Vice Chairman Robinson, you have the floor. Thank you, thank you. I'll, I'll be quick on this. This one is Mr. Bell. Um, 30 years ago, my first job was the business card coordinator for Prudential Bank and um, working with Visa and creating the purchasing card program as well back then. So I've got about 30 years of watching this over time. So this is nothing new, um, but to your point, uh, this is, um, it's just how private sector is different than the public sector. And so we're finally catching up. The one, so let me talk industry to industry. And one issue I see here is with our current vendor, it did not match our organizational structure. And I tried to explain to my staff and everything like, okay, guys, they're, they're, they're just not aligned. They're not aligning the signing authorities. And again, it's, this wasn't difficult. So for assurances for me, you can match 
meaning this program can match our organizational structure, whether it's the constitutional officer, department head, level one, level two, level three, level four data. Is that true? Yes or no? We can set, we can set it up during implementation um, so that you have cards that are assigned to your, your card holders. Those card holders can be in a department and that department can have control over that and the reporting that comes back um, can go by cost center, again, through implementation. And NGL coding is also available so that when, they, when those card holders that, that reside in that department make purchases for those department, it's all routed back to that department from a cost center standpoint. Now, right, and, so and if they make purchases outside of that department, um, there's the ability for your program administrator or your auditor, you know, as they're closing out to go and move that to the appropriate space. Understood. I'll be quick. So again, I want to hear you saying department. So I, I, just for people who are listening to this internally, uh, whether I've got a business unit, an operating company, and what you're calling a call center department, it doesn't matter, right? It's whatever we call right. it. And how many, lay, how many levels do you have that we can do? So if I have a card holder, he works for a department that's part of an operating company, that's part of something that ultimately rolls up to a single plan with you. How many layers does it go down? I'm, I'm not sure I follow your question. I, I believe you're, you're speaking to how many different, you know, how we can code these transactions right. from a GL right. coding standpoint. Correct. Right. If that's the question, I mean, last, the last look I had, there were quite a few hundred lines available. Okay. Right. Uh, so I, I don't think you're going to run into a problem running out, of, you know, from a GL coding or string standpoint. But, and this was our problem because it's simple. We were putting people in one department over in another department. And it was just how they were arranged. It's like, wait, wait a minute, they, they're not related. And they're, we were being told well, that's all they can do. That's the levels, that's the, the levels that they had, like maybe two levels, a cardholder and the department. We we're pushing them. It's like, guys, we need multiple layers. So that's all I'm asking is can your internal yeah. controls map our organizational structure? Yes, we do. All right, you answer that. Second thing, and this is for um county administrator. Um, however, we if, if the board so desires to go down this path. There needs to be a commitment on our side for program administration, whether it's in the purchasing, finance, I, I really don't have a position, but you gotta be dedicated to this. You, we, we can't, we, uh, what I'm hearing him say is that we have control on our side. Yes, sir. We shouldn't have to worry about going to the bank on the weekend, That's but right. we're stuck somewhere in Vegas and we trying to like, well, it's the weekend that typical go government speak. No, no one gets stranded ever. And so there needs to be empowerment somewhere on our side. Mr. Bell, can you answer that question? Do we have control on our side and the need for you have program? Yes, sir. It, it, you know, and um, if you're in Vegas, using that example, um, if it's a purchase card program, more than likely your trip to Vegas would, would um, move that card at least temporarily to a different what we call profile within the application so that travel MCCs are open. But yes, you, you and the cardholder themselves would have access to customer service over the weekend. Um, if they call the program administrator and that person's available on the weekend, um, they can certainly call customer service as well. Um, they would call, their phone call would be routed on the weekends to um, one of our customer service reps that are used to dealing with um, businesses and governments after hours. So that they understand what where you're coming from. But and you hear me as the sales guy of this program. You understand our pain. And we're just trying to alleviate our pain, right? You, you have a solution. And we're just, do you hear what we're yeah. going through here? Okay. Yeah, there, there, there are approximately 150 local government entities that are on the statewide program today. And, and they share um, a similar pain or have. Um, but this program has been with the state now for over 20 years. Right. Um, and we think we've we've ironed out most of those things. Every once in a while, something comes up. We're not perfect, um, but we do react as quickly as possible um, if there is an issue that was not that we haven't seen before. Got it. Last question. And this is to County Minister. So we currently have a card that we use, and now we're talking about a P card. Will they? Will I have two cards, or will it just be one card? What are we doing here? Because they right. are just. Go ahead. Sure. My recommendation is that we make the transition um, and, you know, we're not going to force constitutional officers to make that transition unless that's your directive. Um, but certainly internally, I would also not ask you to give up your card until the new cards are issued and um, Bank of America and the team will do a seamless transition. 
The other thing I want you to be aware of is that we will have a primary, secondary, and tertiary internal person that is the PCARD administrator and two backups. So if something happens on a weekend and somebody cannot be reached, then we will have a secondary person that can go in. Um, I know that the, the program administrator can go in once they have an internet connection from anywhere and make an adjustment. So, um, but we will have backup people on the team to make sure that we're not, you know, nobody's left, as you said, stranded. And then the last thing to that point is that implementation. So Mr. Bill, you do have a formal methodology and approach in which you would onboard clients, you would roll us in, how to, how to test, how to do all those things and come out on the other side. Yes, sir. Um, we we um, assign an implementation engineer to all of our new programs, um, and that person will schedule a kickoff call, which usually lasts about 90 minutes um, with your with your team, um, and then determine you know how you want this program to look, how you want us to set it up, um, and then there are weekly meetings scheduled uh, after that, and those meetings go on pretty much until I'm going to say until you receive your first bill. From Bank of America and everything is 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 rubber stamped by you in terms of this is how we want it to work. This looks good. Thank you very much. Um, but if we need to adjust it at that point in time, we will certainly go back um, the implementation team and, and and adjust the setup. Great. So you've got change management built in there, communications, etc. In other words, you're just not having us in the corner with a meeting. We've got to go out. You're going to help us. You're going to guide us through this. Is that what I'm hearing? Yes, sir. Yes. Right. That's good. Uh, and how long went on average? Again, we're only talking about a thousand or so employees. How how how, uh, how long for this size um, um, rollout? What would that be in your mind? Typically, typically, and again, it depends on on you know some of the questions that you asked earlier um, around GL coding. Um, typically, you're looking at I would say with GL coding, uh, probably between sixty to ninety days for implementation. Because right. we're it. doing things on the back end, and we may be testing some some. Um, you know, communications or transmissions with you, you may want us to be able to upload file information um, to your ERP system, all of that stuff. So depending on how sophisticated you want it, that really determines the length of the implementation. So it can be as short as 60 days, um, but typically if you're going to go through the GL process um, and, and, and those types of things, you're looking at about a 90 day implementation. All right, last thing, a cost per card that we're actually being charged. I get the value back to us and stuff, but what, is there an actual cost per month per year? For there, this? There's no no cost to the county whatsoever. Um, there, there's a small opportunity to be charged a one-time fee, yeah. um, and that would be if you decided that you wanted to go with what we call custom plastics. Um, but a, the standard plastic, which is in the industry known as a hot stamp, uh, there's no cost for that. So that's really the only time you would see cost. And that would be, um, we would send that out to our vendor. They'd come back with a quote and we wouldn't move on it until you, unless you approved it. Understood. Other than uh, that, you, there's no monthly charges or anything like that associated with the program. You, you've done a, an excellent job of presenting this. I understand it completely. I'm good, Madam Chair. I yield the floor back to my peers. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from the board? Thank you so much, Vice Chairman Robinson. Uh, Commissioner Mitchell, I see you. I mean, so, so Madam Superdan, I think I heard, help me if, I'm, if I heard you correctly, you will be the administrator of all of the, the structure of these cards. Uh, help me understand that part of it first. No, sir, the um, administration would lie in procurement as it has. Okay. Got it. Um, but I would be definitely one of the backups. I said there would be a secondary and a tertiary, and we would um, get help from finance. Obviously, the setup, you know, how we set it up to begin with is going to be important to make sure we do it correctly um, and make sure we don't have mix ups, you know, like we've seen in the past. Um, so, but ultimately, if it if it's in procurement, it's going to be under my purview. So, <laughs> so, 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 so I'm assuming you will get with uh, Don and others to kind of structure what that would possibly look like. Meaning, what department gets what and how the cards that's will be structured. Okay, okay, that's, that's correct. Mm -hmm. Got it. That's what I was looking for. Um, 
is this is a is this a net 30 mr robert i think it is or somebody can kind of help me with that is this a net 30 on, on paying these bills that will incur on this or i'm assuming because after that there's a late fee i would assume sure there, there's a okay. it's a 30-day cycle okay I, I mean we have multiple cycles um, but be, and and the way the state pays the revenue share to the local entities that are under it, we recommend to all the entities that they go with the longest cycle possible, which is a 30-day cycle. So and typically that can't end on the 30th of the month because we still have February in there as the outlier. Um, so typically the latest you can cut a cycle or, or or have it end is the 27th of the month, and then 25 days later your payment is due to Bank of America. Um, and again. This is a no fee program, um, so there are no late fees. However, if you are missing payments as a centrally billed entity, um, it could have ramifications with the way the rebate is calculated and paid, because that puts you in that would put you in breach of contract of the statewide contract. Got okay, it. so no late fees, but if you spent five million dollars with us and you paid us late. You know, you know, two or three times a year, that that could be an issue from you getting a rebate on that five million dollars. Understood. Understood. Okay. Alrighty. Um, good to know. Okay. And and you, I think I heard correctly. This is Bank of America, uh, correct on this? Yes, sir. Okay. Alrighty. I'll yield. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Commissioner Mitchell. I'm sure. Okay. Vice Chairman Robinson. Yeah, one, one quick question then. Thank you, Commissioner Mitch, because you, you always do a good job of triggering. So I'm back to the late fees um, and mapping our decision-making process. Sometimes um, it, a local government's decision-making process, whether it's legislative or executive, um, and the need to be paid 25 days later or whatever you just said, 30 days. Um, so, um, how do we how will we ensure that we won't have that experience so while uh, right now we're getting charged late fees sometimes on ours because by the time we make our decision it's approved and they cut the paper check and it gets to them does all, all that get eliminated here <laughs> madam Sudaman, you won't you help frame this because you know, we've had or maybe director everest you guys know what i'm talking about we have these yeah. comments and we're sitting here looking at these statements and Citizens, why are y'all getting charged thirty five dollars late fees and stuff? Because right. we get told it's our process, our, our decision, meaning us, the board of commissioners' decision making process. Okay, will this get eliminated or addressed, please? Yes, yeah, this is. I'm sorry. Um, so you know that that has been a struggle for me since since I got here, really trying to understand that. Um, and I think we have to, you know kind of synthesize those specific issues through part of the challenge is on the front end um getting the the, the process the transaction processed um my experience with works is that it's it's really a, a very user-friendly process to get those done and so we should be able to meet their deadline um, on a consistent basis um, for 99.9% .9 of the staff. Um, and the other thing, I guess, the conversation that we probably need to have is, you know, transactions that are made with a P card or any credit card have already been, have already been made. And so, um, we technically owe that money unless it's fraud or unless it is misuse. And so, you know, I haven't found anything in reviewing our, our county ordinances and, and our rules and our procurement rules that really precludes us from going ahead and making those payments. You know, I think if there's something that becomes quote unquote unauthorized on the back end, that's something that we can handle. But I don't think that our current process, which we hold back, you know, making payment for something that's already been charged, I don't know that it's it's best practice. But that's something I think we need to, to talk about some more and get clarity. And we'll start with the, the procurement oversight committee so that I can get some more clarity on that. 
Um, but certainly from a staff perspective, where 99% of the transactions will probably be made, um, we will certainly be turning those around in the time frame expected by Bank of America. And the other thing I like with this system is when individuals who have cards fail to meet certain deadlines, it automatically notifies their upline supervisor. And if, if that deadline isn't met, it updates their upline supervisor. So there's a significant amount of accountability for staff to ensure that we meet deadlines, which are, you know, I think it's your expectation of us that we, we meet appropriate deadlines. Got it. And so th thank you for that. Very good. And you, you triggered another thought, which is again, we're embracing the new technology. So we need to, you know, strategy one-on-one, align your people and your process with your technology. And seeing that we have on the agenda, we're going to begin the process of looking at our procurement process, looking at certain ways. I mean, this is the time to actually have this conversation. So um, make a note of that. We'll come back to that when we get into legislation. So if we need to change our, our, our policy or ordinance to sort of map where we're going. I think this is a perfect time for that. So I just want to make that note that I plan on um, inserting that um, later on. Madam Chair, I'm good. Thank you. I yield the floor. Okay. Thank you so much, Vice Chairman. Robinson, and also for clarity purposes, we just, uh, so, and also for the public, these P, uh, our, all the employees are not eligible for P5, uh, if you could just clarify that for us, county administrator, because I don't want the perception to be that every employee will have a P card, and that's not what the intent is. No, I don't know. Yeah, so if you could just frame it for us. Sure. Um, so we will kind of look strategically at the organization and look at where um, credit cards make sense. Um, I like that slide where, you know, the, the $50 purchase is now costing us $75 because it's being put through New World and um, a check gets cut and then puts in, gets put in the mail. Um, so what we will do is look to see, I certainly think executive level staff will have a P card. Um, and then we look at kind of critical functions in the organization to say, you know, do we need a department card for public works because they need to, or parks because they need to go buy mulch, you know, something that is um, easily obtainable and can be done relatively quickly and painlessly and can be accounted for um, by the parks director to say, yes, I authorize them to go buy 200 bags of mulch, you know, um, and, and we can GL code it appropriately, pay it quickly, and, um, and free up our finance staff to do the important work they need to do in helping me to manage finances of the county. Thank you for the clarity. All right, board of commissioners, if there are no other questions, we're going to move on. Thank you so much, uh, County Administrator, and thank you again, Mr. Bale. For thank you very much. Presentation. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move on our uh, board commissioners to tab number eight, still under our business items. Is it approval, approval of 2022 Douglas County Employee Benefit Offerings as recommended by the Douglas County Benefits Committee? I authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Our director, Perry, you have the floor. I'm sorry, our, our deputy county administrator, Perry, you have the floor. <laughs> Can you hear me, Madam Chair? Yes, we can hear you now. Yes. Got a new, uh, a new screen here, so I just want to make sure you all hear me. Good morning to everyone, Board of Commissioners, Madam Chair. <clears throat> this is that time of year again. Uh, we are here before you with our benefits um, uh, administrators. Uh, MSI is here to present uh, make a short presentation for our recommendations for the 2020 plan year uh, benefit offerings. Um, we are very happy that, um, you know, we are trending very well as they will describe, and I will pass it on to uh, Matt Bidwell and John Leggett. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, Frederick, and Board of Commissioners. We're glad to be here and uh, uh, like to go through this presentation and take a few minutes and then answer any questions when I get done. If we can go on to the first slide. This is our health plan design and deductions that are currently in place. Um, we offer an HMO and an open access point of service for the county employees. We're not anticipating any changes on, the, on any of the benefits. We are looking at no changes on the payroll deductions. 
the um, uh, payroll deductions also include a tobacco surcharge of $25 for those employees who do use nicotine and tobacco products. And if an employee is covering their spouse and their spouse is working somewhere else and has coverage where they work, then the employees also charge an additional $25 per pay period for that surcharge. Um, the, this is uh, the benefits are currently in place and what we uh, uh, look to, to renew with next year. No, no changes were planned on these. Uh, next slide, please. We met with the insurance committee uh, back in early September, and these were the options that were put forth in front of them on the medical insurance. I'm gonna take you from the top to the bottom. Uh, the third party administrator, which is the party that actually pays claims and talks to our employees when they have a question on their claim is currently Anthem. And on all our presentations this year, we recommended that we stay with Anthem on options one, two, and three. On our stop loss carrier, this is the company that actually provides us uh, coverage when one claim exceeds $175,000. And it's currently with Anthem. Our renewal option was with Anthem. Our option two was with Anthem. And we looked at some outside vendors, one of which the, the best option we could find was Voya. And as we talk about a little bit farther down, you'll find out that we could not end up getting firm numbers from them. And that's why we uh, did not go any further with them. Our insurance provider network, meaning the doctors and hospital network that we use is actually with Anthem. And we're recommending Anthem on all of these, these options. And then the last option, our pharmacy benefit manager, currently in Genio, which is in ownership with Anthem, is the current uh, pharmacy benefit manager. We presented to the insurance committee an option for ProCare, and uh, that was presented on options two and three. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on in the program. So when I come down to the very bottom uh, in yellow, it talks about the annual difference. Under option one, which is if we renew with Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield, make no changes in our benefits, we're looking at an approximate annual increase of about $383,000 for 2022. If we elect option two, which is continuing with Anthem, but changing our pharmacy management over to ProCare, then we'll see a reduction of almost 441,000 in lieu of the increase. And then option three, which was also presented, was also looking at changing the reinsurer. And while this presented a little bit more savings, we were never able to get that reinsurer to lock into the numbers. So that, op that option was ultimately uh, not accepted simply because we could not get a firm number from Voya. We're gonna ask for the next slide, please. We're talking about going with ProCare slash Veracity. This would be our new pharmacy benefit manager. This is a, uh, a pharmacy benefit manager that's actually located uh, in Gainesville, Georgia. They have over 400 employees. We have a number of other governments in Georgia that actually use them. And there's basically five ways where they're gonna save us money. And if you slide all the way to the bottom right corner of the page, you'll see that the total net estimated savings is just over $1 million. And this is done through a variety of ways. One through their contracts where we actually are getting just a lesser cost on the prescription drugs that we purchase. Number two, the preferred networks, and this applies just to the generic drugs, where we actually get an average dispensing fee of $15 to $20 less by just using the grocery stores and using uh, uh, the local pharmacy. Our formulary management is just using less cost generics, actually uh, comes in with a fairly significant savings. Our fourth bucket, which is international mail order, we, we can achieve some fairly significant savings here just by getting these prescription drugs mail order out of Toronto, Canada. And the, the thing to remember about this, this is the same drug, same manufacturer, and we're guaranteed a minimum 50% savings just by going through the mail order. And then the fifth component of this is the manufacturer assistance plan. And this deals with a number of specialty, high cost specialty drugs. Most of these drugs are in excess of five to $10,000 a month. 
we estimate that there's approximately 25 to 30 uh, members at the county that are taking these drugs. And we feel that we'll be able to get these drugs directly from the manufacturer at a significantly uh, uh, savings to the county. And uh, uh, it's, it's a program that uh, we feel would be most helpful. Just that one component of the program alone is looking to save the county almost $600,000. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Getting away from the medical plan, there's a couple other components of the renewal. Our Medicare Advantage, uh, which is used for our retirees, we have 189 retirees on coverage. We were looking at a four, excuse me, a two and a half percent increase from uh, Aetna, and we took you all to market. And after putting pressure on Aetna, we were able to get that down to a reduction of 11% on the cost. Next slide, please. This is interesting, uh, particularly as it relates to the pandemic. Our dental and vision are both self-insured, and we typically look at a 6% increase in our dental claims throughout the year, approximately a 3% increase on the vision. And when we go back to ninth, excuse me, to 2020, this was the pre-pandemic, our claims are actually still running less than what they were two years ago. And in 2021, our dental claims are still almost 20% below what they were before the pandemic. The vision claims are running about 7.8% lower. And again, this is people have uh, uh, not been able to get in to see their, their dentist. They've not been able to see their eye doctors. And as a result, we're still low, running less on these claims. We are still uh, putting in the projections to go up next year. And even with those projections for 2022, both are still below the level they were prior to the start of this pandemic. Next slide, please. Our disability insurance has been with One America since 2016. On our first renewal in 2019, they actually reduced their rates substantially. And when it renewed in 2022, they actually did have to increase the rates. We currently have our short-term disability with One America. The long-term disability is what is actually up for renewal. And after discussing with staff and the fact that we have seven current open long-term disability claims, it is the recommendation that we do accept the One America renewal. We did go out and get uh, exhaustive looks, looks at the market. We were only able to find one carrier even to come in and, and offer any kind of a, a renewal competitive. But in lieu of the fact that we have these ongoing open claims, and how it ties into the short-term disability, we were recommending that we do renew with One America on the long-term disability. Next slide, please. And then here's a summation of the uh, renewal options. Um, and I'm gonna start off in the first column. 2021, this is what was projected last year when we did the renewal. And in the renewal, we were looking at about a 344,000 dollar decrease for 2021 and the actuality in 2021 we're actually running almost eight hundred and twenty five thousand dollars below projected so we're actually making some fairly good strides this year in terms of how the the claims are running under our plan when the uh, options were taken to the benefit committee the first option option one was to not make any changes and again, if we make no changes, our total change on the medical, the Medicare Advantage Dental Vision, long-term disability and basic life, taking into account the employee and retiree deductions would leave us with an increase of approximately 481,000 if we just accept the renewal as presented. Under option two, if we make the change, which is the bulk of this is making the change to do the uh, change from Ingenio on the pharmacy to change the pharmacy over to Veracity ProCare, then we're looking at a decrease in cost of approximately 343,000 under option two. And under option three, that option did fall by the wayside because we were not able to get the uh, reinsurer to actually firm those rates up. And so ultimately during the um, insurance committee meeting, it was option two is what the uh, committee had actually uh, recommended. Uh, next slide, please. 
We want to add that we're uh, changing the enrollment portal for the employees for 2022 to a company called Plan Source. This is provided by MSI and is at no cost to the county. And we think the employees are going to see uh, a lot of uh, improvements from this. There'll be more in terms of how they buy the benefits. It's going to be more friendly. Uh, it, uh, the, the enrollment platform we, we were using from the, uh, uh, we've had since 2004. And this new one is bringing up to date technology, which when it actually, when you see it, it'll actually be a lot better for the employees to look at. And so we're excited about it bringing this onto the table for 2022. And then our next slide, I believe is the end of the presentation and I'll uh, yield the floor back to you, Madam Chair, and uh, any questions uh, you and the board may have. Thank you so much, Matt, great presentation. Board of Commissioners, do you have any questions for our benefits team committee? Mr. Bidwell. Okay, Commissioner Carthen, I see your camera. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Yes. Good morning, Mr. Bitwell. Thank you for your presentation. <laughs> My question to you is in regards to the, the pharmacy benefit program and those um, 25 to 30 employees who, you know, are, are having to take those expensive drugs. And, and you know, we, we um, we're very sensitive to that, you know, because, uh, you know, our our employees are family members. We, we work with them. We see them on a consistent basis. So we, we understand, um, you know, how sensitive that can be. Can you talk to us before we make a decision in regards to how will these employees, um, physicians be able to work with the pharmacy company just to make sure that there's continuity of care, that there is nothing dropped here, especially if we're talking about going into um, Canada to get those uh, specific um, drugs to um, our employee. Uh, two things on the, on the international mail order, what will happen there is that they'll take the existing prescription and actually they transfer it to the pharmacy up there. It'd be like you changing your prescription from maybe I'm going to Walgreens and I want to change them over to Kroger. Literally, they'll just change the prescription. So once you have a, a, a prescription provided by a drug, it's actually just a matter of which pharmacy you want to get it filled at. Um, and that, and the, the international pharmacy, um, um, that piece um, doesn't have any kind of a financial component to it. So there's really not going to be much of a question it's just a matter of asking that employee to get that prescription filled through that, that mechanism. Got you. So, so what I hear you saying is that that employee will not incur a cost to use the international um, Canada pharmacy versus using the U.S. pharmacy. They will actually get a reduction because if they participate on the international mail order, then they, they have absolute, they're guaranteed absolutely no copay, no cost. The drugs provided 100% uh, cost free to the member. Got you. And my other question is, so here, here's one of my, um, I guess you can say um, hindrances as to saying just completely yes. With Walgreens, my Walgreens is up the street. It's, it's literally at the corner, right? But Canada's Pharmacy is not at the corner. So how, how can I be assured that I'm going to get my prescriptions on time? How, how can a employee ensure that their prescription will come on time without any hindrances um, through the mail? Because we just received a email, at least I did, that the United States Postal Service will be uh, changing its hours and its operations. That means mail is going to get a little slower. So, so how can I be assured that I'm gonna get my prescription on time without any delay? Because if I'm on a prescription, I need that medication. <laughs> I'll say it this way, amen, I agree. The folks <laughs> helping us to administer this program are actually here in Kennesaw. And it's actually three pharmacists and they actually have the power that if you don't have your medicine, they can actually just turn it on and you go up to your local Walgreens and pick it up. So that if there is any kind of a delay in the mail order, you get a live person on the phone, it, they, they know what's going on, they'll just literally turn it on locally so you can go pick it up. That's good to know. 
and yeah. that will that will be done if 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 a um, employee needs to pick up the phone they haven't received their prescription they can just pick up the phone call their um their doctor or the or the pharmacy or i'm assuming uh i can't remember the name of the the new program now procare and they will be able to to do that for them without any complications. That is correct. That is okay. correct. All right. Because it does happen. Okay. Yeah, I'm I'm trying to be proactive in my thinking, like putting myself in someone's you know scenario or situation. I work in the in the healthcare field, and I mean, people call all the time wanting to see if they could get an extension on their medicine. It hasn't arrived. They're getting ready to run out, and so I know these things do happen. So I just I had to ask. Um, but other than that, I yield. Thank you so much, Mr. Bidwell and Director Perry. I yield, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, Commissioner Carthen. All right. Sure. Okay. Vice Chairman Robinson, you next lean you, Commissioner Geiger. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll be quick. Um, to, to, to that point, um, uh, my, I am a user of specialty for my eyes. And so I know what it means to be delayed. I'm about to run out my medicine, like, okay, and the timing is off. So if it goes to Canada, and I'm gonna speak for my other 29 um, fellow workers here, if it goes to Canada, will we, how will it get to us overnight? Like there is a provision currently uh, with the specialty provider that you can like get that thing drop ship. You know, there's a timing, you know, those who are in it, they understand how it works. So will, will, will you match that capability? In other words, like life just happens, Will you be able to drop ship that? Does international have anything to do with how, to Madam Carthen's point, about the post office? I don't care if FedEx, I don't care who drops it here as long as it's on my door. Will you, will you be able to accommodate that? How does it work internationally? I hear Canada, but I don't shop outside the United States. I don't do like most people and stuff, but explain that to me, please. Sure. Uh, what will happen is if you need your prescription and it's not available through the mail order in a timely fashion, they just literally will put it out there for you to go pick it up locally. And uh, uh, I don't know what the ship time is that's allowed for that. Um, I, I, I'd be guessing, I, I honestly don't know, but I do know this, that if indeed you don't uh, uh, get that prescription in time, they do have the capability of letting you go pick it up locally. I, I wanna also say this, the two basic category of drugs that are gonna be prescribed through the international mail order, they're drugs specifically for HIV and for diabetes. Those are the really two main categories. And the other thing on those, on those uh, uh, prescriptions, uh, uh, again, they are gonna be shipped. They know that the average shipping time and if indeed that prescription's delayed, the local people can put that uh, delay in immediately to, to uh, get those, let's allow you to pick those drugs up locally. And, the, the other thing is the drugs that are coming from Canada are from the same manufacturer of the drugs that we get here in the States. It, it is the same manufacturer that's actually dispensing those drugs. Okay, so I, I get you. And so I'm going to come back to, yeah, the drugs, 98% of the drugs that you're talking about are, you can push them locally by pressing a button. But we're talking about the specialty, which they may not carry it locally. You can't just press a button. In other words, that's the whole point of it being specialty, being in that warehouse. Um, uh, so you, you've answered it, but I wanted to make sure that you, you didn't quite answer my question, which is uh, you can't get it at the local store, right? It, it's not there. It literally is not there. So to put a lever and say, go pick it up, well, it's not there. So my question is, um, again, back to the assurance to Madam Carthen's point about just make sure that the system will respond like it's been responding. And so you're saying that you don't know the time of how fast, it's, I guess it's normal shipping time. Uh, but that matters to people when, they, again, like anybody, uh, if you're out and you got to go to Highway 5 and because the Thornton Road is out, I mean, that matters, right? Even that 20 minute drive, it matters for a delay, it just in the psyche and the mindset of a, an actual individual. So, let alone now, we're in a different country, different time zone. So, we, we're asking the right questions and we're just we're trying to get our our piece around what we're going to decide, but you, you, you can't respond because you've already answered it. So um, I'm going to just take it at that. Madam Chair, you the floor. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Vice Chairman Robinson. Uh, Commissioner Guido, you have the floor. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, I just have uh, 
three short questions. Um, some people, some doctors will not prescribe uh, non-generic uh, prescriptions um, for some of their, uh, their uh, patients. Uh, will that cause any problems for those patients? What will happen, it'll go through a review process. And if indeed the physician can prove that that drug needs to be dispensed for that reason, if there's a medical cause behind it, then they will allow that exception. Now, if we have a patient that ultimately there's a disagreement between the pharmacy area and what the physician is saying, we can always come back to the county and the county can always override it. But if you have a, uh, uh, a situation where that prescription is being uh, uh, medically evaluated by the physician and saying, this is the only drug, then I don't see how the pharmacy area can override that. But again, there's always an appeal process. And during the appeal process, if it doesn't fall in the favor of the member, they can always take it back and ask the county to override it. But it's, it's gonna go through an appeal process. Well, the, um, the reason I ask, I know a lot of people that um, have cancer and things like that, and lupus, something like that. But uh, they have a, specific medicines that the doctor wants you to use. So I just wondered if there would be a problem, <clears throat> but you said there's an appeal process. I guess uh, they need to address that up front if we go to this system. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I didn't mention this, but if indeed this is approved, we have a, a file coming from Anthem and that file from Anthem is going to include any drug that's currently approved for usage under the, the county, and I'm talking, they call it a prior approval file. When you have those expensive drugs where the doctor has to call in and get them authorized, that file is actually coming to Anthem, from Anthem over to the ProCare folks. And so they're actually going to go ahead and adopt all those existing prior authorizations, and there's not going to be a change there in those prior authorizations. <clears throat> So, it's good to hear. <laughs> yeah, and so until until it comes up to the normal review, and then they're going to take it through the same process Anthem would have. Okay. Another question is, um, I get reminders from my drugstore when my prescription is due. Will you be uh, providing that service? <laughs> now, well, I, I, I think what happens is the prescription actually goes in, and that, I think that's separate from the pharmacy benefit manager. So like if, if you're going to public, Publix or Walgreens or wherever you may be going, that, that, that'll that still continue because that's outside of the pharmacy benefit manager. Okay, and one last question is uh, sometimes uh, it slips up on you that your prescription is only good for so many um, renewals and uh, you run out and then all of a sudden you realize you have to call the doctor or go to the doctor, what will happen in a case like that? Uh, again, yeah, what, again, that'll probably be done by your pharmacy. I, I, I get my drugs from Publix. And um, what, what happens there is if, if uh, I don't, they actually, they don't notify me, but I happen to know when my annual physical is. And I know if I don't get my physical and I don't get that referral in from my doctor, they're not gonna refill my blood pressure. And it's gonna be the same situation. Um, we are getting another file, a second file from Anthem, and it's got a record of how many fills you've already gotten under your prescription. So my doctor will write a blood pressure medicine good for a year. I get it filled in June. And so if I were working for Douglas County, the new company is being told that I've got six fills left. So they're gonna fill your, your blood pressure up until your normal renewal time. But um, I, I think it's still up to you to go and get your, your, your refill from the doctor. Uh, my, my pharmacy doesn't remind me, but I just happen to know, but I don't think the, the pharmacy benefit managers, they do not get into that arena of notifying you when a prescription is due. It's literally, they got the stop date. I, I think that falls back on you and your pharmacist. Well, uh, some, uh, this has happened. It, it happened uh, quite often with my husband when, cause he was taking so much medicine before he passed away. but. Um, uh, the 
the drugstore would actually give him a small supply since mm -hmm. his prescription had expired, you know, and he'd have to contact the doctor and things like that. Uh, I guess the pharmacy can continue to do that. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. All right. With that, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Commissioner Geiger. Well, Commissioners, any other questions regarding this presentation? And Matt, what I want to do, if we could circle back to uh, Vice Chairman Robinson's concern, because certainly uh, this uh, the benefit committee, so we are um, wanted to bring the good news of the net savings regarding this formulary, but at the same time, we want to be intentional about access. On those specialty drugs, uh, I know we've worked on the formulary uh, since I've been in office uh, starting in 2017, and we generated some nice savings, but I want to make sure on those specialty drugs that are, are really, that's uh, focusing on our 29 employees or uh, that's in the system. Those specialty drugs were in the United, they're available in the United States, I'm hoping, because uh, we were not utilizing the Canada system before, correct? So those drugs are readily available here, correct or incorrect? Uh, I'll say half correct, if I may. There's okay. kind of two different animals. Um, there, there's two places we're really getting significant savings. One of them is coming from the international mail order. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and that is not restricted to just maybe the 25 people or so. There's actually more individuals who could be under the international mail order. And that is a, um, again, going to be the same drug being mailed from a pharmacy up in Canada. Where I mentioned there was about 25 to 30 people was under the manufacturer assistance program. And on our slide, that was the fifth bucket where we were getting almost a $600,000 savings. Mm -hmm. And that is, that saving on those drugs is being generated because of the um, drug is actually coming not from Canada, but it's coming directly from the manufacturer here in the United States. So you're no longer going to be getting it through a specialty drug warehouse. You're not going to be getting it through any pharmacy, but it's being mailed directly by the manufacturer to the member's home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure you could get in any quicker, but it, it's coming from the manufacturer, not from any uh, dispensing pharmacy. Okay, thank you. You answered my question. Mm -hmm. So it's coming from the manufacturer. Yes. Of the, the pharmaceutical. Pharma Correct. Pharmaceutical, and I know they have. The, they're going to have some inventory. <laughs> oh yeah, they, it's coming directly from them. And you know, I I live in an area where I get my mail like two or three times a week. I don't get it every day. And I understand what you're saying about the mail. I mean, it's so, uh, but a lot of the specialty stuff is mailed. And uh, I do know that if there is a delay on anything coming in, if that drug's available locally, they can put in that override for you to pick it up. But on the specialty drug, whether it's coming from the manufacturer or from, a, uh, or from the insurance company's uh, specialty drug program, it, it you know, we, we all have to live with those delays, but we don't want people to get down to where they only have a day or two left. We want to make sure they get that prescription with at least a week left before they have to use it. Right. Okay. All right. Any other questions from the board? Thank you so much. Uh, Director Perry, you have anything else to add? And thank you so much, Matt and John. Yeah. And John, thank you. And Madam Chair, I just uh, do that we do plan a uh, robust uh, campaign to um, highlight this, uh, this new uh, prescription benefit. It will be included in the employee benefits uh, handbook mm -hmm. and will also be highlighted in the uh, presentations that MSI will perform uh, as we go into open enrollment. Okay. All right. So basically, uh, if, if, if you could Fred, wrap it up for the for the board in terms of it's no changes this year, right? It's the 20. Right. Uh, as far as the benefit standpoint is concerned, uh, the only change is, uh, is what Matt just talked about as far as. Uh, okay. Madam Chair. All right. Commissioner Carthen. Yes, before we go on, while we have Director Perry um, in front of us, um, Mr. Bitwill talked about the, um, the new program that they will have that will allow the employees to go in and put in their selection for the, uh, the medical and pharma 
pharmacy benefits. Mm -hmm. I would like to ask Mr. Perry, if possible, could we also roll out our e-employee benefits with that as well? Um, you know, the technology is here. I think if we could do both simultaneously, it would be great for the county employees. I know, you know, we, we've talked about this, Madam Chair, and the board has already given you the, the finances to, to do it and the approval. So I'm just asking you and Madam Subedan to go ahead and roll that out so that employees can do both. Can I jump in, Madam Carthen? Sure, you can. Yeah, so we recently had an updated um, demo of three different pieces of New World that we really think are going to be beneficial. Um, and I don't think, while we're going to be very aggressive with the portal, um, I don't think we're going to be able to do it in conjunction in a week with um, open enrollment because we have to get open enrollment going. But I do want you to know that we are actively engaged with New World um, on three different pieces. One of them is the portal, which you'll like this. I think you'll like this. I know I like it. Will enable us to be able to move away from printing um, check stubs. It will allow employees to do minor updates on their own. Um, mm -hmm. Things like address changes and things like that. Um, as well as the benefit piece. And then there's a timekeeping piece, which is very exciting. Um, that they told us would be a little further out. And then there's another part called the notice of personnel action piece, which would eliminate paper. So there are three pieces that we are looking at and with New World, and we actually wanna come back to the technology committee and explain how those will be rolled out. Um, because there is some benefit for us to marry the implementation of those and stage it. And um, so while we can't get it done in a, in a week, we are very engaged in that and we'll be certainly bringing that back. And there is some cost associated with that. Um, those three pieces that we also wanna bring back to the board, but the savings will be remarkable. Okay. And so this is separate from what civic um, HR, I believe is the demo that we had before Director Perry, is that this is separate from that, this is different. So you're pivoting Director Perry? I'm sorry. So are we pivoting? We are not pivoting, uh, they are separate. Civic HR is a separate uh, entity, that's our online application process. Right. But I thought I thought our um, what we requested was was um, a module that you can turn on from Civic Plus in order to in order to allow employees to make those changes. So are we pivoting from that model that we got demoed on to what Madam Subedin is speaking of now? No, it's the same model. That's just, oh, okay. That's okay. So these are just additions to that. That that is correct. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Director Perry. Thank you, Madam Subin. And I look forward to uh, getting um, looking at that and hearing that proposal. And I hope it's soon because we've been asking for this probably over six months now. And so it's, it's taking a while. So I'm hoping you understand the urgency of it. We don't want to go into another year and we haven't implemented this for the employees. Um, so I look forward to that implementation really soon. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield. Okay, thank you so much, Commissioner Carthen. If there's nothing else, board, we're going to move on to our next item. We're going to move on to tab number nine, authorization to approve an employee agreement with Lynn Weatherton uh, as a real, real property consultant for the appraisal department and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Uh, Mr. Steve Balfour, right, there you are on the line. If you could just brief the board quickly and then we'll, you know, certainly open up an opportunity, we'll yield an opportunity for the board to ask you some questions, if, if they have any. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. uh, they, uh, Lynn Withington has been with the county for uh, six months, less 35 years. She has a wealth of intellectual property and she will be retiring. Um, we do have a replacement for Lynn. However, um, we require that um, we keep her on as a real property consultant for at least one year. And um, uh, I 
spoke to the board of assessors already. They have approved um, that um, contract. And this is why we are now um, looking to the board of commissioners to assist with the approval for the contract to go so we can have facilitate smooth operation of the tax assessor's office and um, a continuation of what we have it's a very smooth operation. So I'm looking to the board for us to keep laying on as a real property consultant for at least a part-time, as part-time, and she will have the typical contract okay. for part-timers. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Balfour. Board of Commissioners, you have any questions regarding this uh, request? Yes. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, Commissioner Guider. And the amount of... <clears throat> What is the amount of the contract? It, it is 35,000 for the, um, the full contract for one year. For one year. All yes, right, thank you. You're, you're back. Okay. Thank you so much, Commissioner Guyton. Any other questions forward? Okay, Commissioner Carpen. I'm just looking at the squares light up. It's like Hollywood squares. There you go. Commissioner Carpen. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Hi, Mr. Balfour. It's good to see you this afternoon. We're into the afternoon now. Ooh, so afternoon. Um, I'm familiar with Ms. Weedington and I know her, her body of work and she is absolutely um, great. She, you know, however, I just want to know, um, will, will this, will this be full-time, part-time? How long and will we be able to, um, to pair her with an, an, another one of the assessors so that they can get her, her knowledge? Because again, like you said, she's been with the county almost 35 years. So there's a wealth of knowledge that we don't want walking out the door. So you know, have you and the Board of Assessors at least set up a succession plan so that we can get, you know, if this is approved, um, we can get that that knowledge that she has um, before she totally transitions out. And thank you, Lynn, for uh, for for even considering this because I know when you retire, you you just want to be done with what you were doing. But um, we thank you for even considering this. But I'll let you answer, Mr. Balfour. Yes, we do have um, her um, replacement. In fact, we um, we did get a replacement starting today as a result of um, pilot technologies being implemented. So I do have a replacement who is on, on the staff currently started today and with Tyler Technologies experience. But Lynn does have a wealth of experience with running the real property department. And so we will uh, definitely have um, be acquiring a lot of her intellectual property as we speak going forward. Okay. And one, one other, while I have you on Mr. Balfour, uh, one of my constituents asked if the tax assessors was assessing property and can you speak to that? Because they said that people have been knocking on their doors and they just wanted to know, you know, was that the county? And, and is that going on? And I know we talked about this a few weeks back, but again, just for those who didn't hear it and didn't know what we had approved, can you talk about that a, a little bit? I know that was for commercial properties, but assessments for residential uh, apparently is going on as well. Yes. Um... Assessment of properties is ongoing. Um, the market is dynamic, properties are being sold, there is additions and um, we go out um, typically on a daily basis. We look at additions, we look at sales and we, look, we looked at um, just for general review for um, our properties. By law, we are required to see each property at least once every three years. So we do have data collectors, which goes out and um, sometimes knock on doors just to get um, additional data. You may, um, some properties we, on record, we may show three, um, three bedrooms, three bathrooms, but they may in fact have three bedroom, two bathrooms. It's good to have, to knock on doors and validate our data. So we do have data collectors that go out to validate that our data is correct. And just for the safety of our constituents, what should they be asking before they open their doors to these individuals? The first thing is our, um, our appraisers, um, assessors, they should go out with a mark car. They will have a county ID 
and this is required also by law, we must have a county ID and we must have um, at the front a marker. We will have yard signs. We do have yard signs which we place for most part if we're gonna be in a neighborhood at the front of the subdivision which says our tax assessors are in the area and will be um, knocking on doors and will be reviewing your property. We'll possibly be in your yard. Um, if we do knock and there is no answer, we are, um, we're allowed by law to be on all properties. So okay. if there's a knock and um, there is no response, for most part, we'll walk around the property, get some updated pictures so we can have four records. Got you. Thank you so much for explaining that process. I hope this helps for those who are watching or those who go back and watch this to let them know that the county, um, what to expect if someone knocks at your door and what you should be asking in order to keep yourself safe. We know that there's a lot of, you know, um, scammers out there, but, you know, if in order for us to do our job and to make sure that each um, county taxpayer is paying their fair share, not too much and not too less, we, this is something that has to be done at least every three years. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Mr. Balfour. Uh, with that, Madam Chair, I yield. Thank you. Commissioner Carpenter. Commissioner Carpenter certainly wanted to just add to what um, Mr. Balfour, our tax assessor, just he was responding to you. He had a question. This position is part time, if I heard you correctly. Yes, uh, it is. Balfour, and it's $35,000 for that. And you said for a one year period. That's what you look at. That at. is correct. So those are the, the answers to the three questions you had. All right, thank you so much, um, Mr. Balfour. And we're gonna move on to the next item. All right, we're gonna move on to our next item, which is tab number 10, authorization to approve the 2022 schedule for work sessions, commission meetings, planning and zoning board meetings and various variance hearings. Our clerk, Watson, you have the floor. Yes, ma'am, uh, good morning. I need everybody to mute their, their mics if you're not speaking. You have the floor, clerk. Okay, thank you, Chairman. Uh, good morning, Commissioners. Um, each year, we put out a new schedule for the following year for our work sessions, commission meetings, planning and zoning meetings, and variance hearings. Um, these are attached in your um, packet for you to review. Um, I hope you've already looked over them. There are just a few changes um, that were made due to holidays um, and election days. Um, but other than that, all of the dates, the work sessions generally fall on the first and third Monday, Monday of the month, and the commission meetings fall on the third, um, second, uh, the Tuesdays of the second of the first and third, I'm sorry, first and third, um, weeks of the, of the month. So if you have any questions or if you want me to go over which ones I moved, I'll be glad to do that. Please go, just go to the ones that you, that, you know, we discussed and you changed so the board would at least be uh, okay. aware. Okay, the know. ones I adjusted, um, the first one in January, um, the one for January 13th, that's going to be on a Thursday. It would have normally been on the um, 17th, but that is Martin Luther King holiday, so we are not at the courthouse that day. Uh, the second one was the work session. We moved to June 30th, which would have normally been on July 4th. Um, obviously that's a holiday as well. Uh, the next one was the, um, the one that falls around Labor Day. That was a work session, would have normally been on the 5th. We have changed it to September 1st, which is a Thursday uh, prior to the commission meeting. And that was due to Labor Day holiday. The next one was um, our commission meeting that normally would have been held on November 1st. We moved that to Thursday, November 3rd, due to November 1st being an election day. Um, the last set of meetings we moved were in December. We moved those up a week, um, all the December meetings up a week, just due to the Christmas holidays. And those are the only changes. Thank you so much for, for the commissioners. Do you have any questions regarding these revisions and these, these adjustments just made to purely respect the holidays and also just to, yeah, to respect the holidays? Okay, thank you so much, Clerk. We're gonna move on to our next item, our tab number 11, authorization to renew an agreement between Douglas County Sheriff's Office 
and control concept for the period of October 1st, 2021 through September 30th, 2022 for $11,640 for building management system preventive. I need everyone to mute your mics, please. Please mute your mics. I see one mic unmuted, uh, clerk. If you could work to see if you can mute that. There you go. Let me try this again. Tab number 11, authorization to renew an agreement between Douglas County Sheriff's Office and contra, uh, control concept for the period of October 1st, 2021 through September 30th, 2022 for $11,640 for building management system, preventive maintenance and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents subject to final legal review. Uh, Major Holmes, are you on the line? Lieutenant. Good afternoon. This is Lieutenant Colonel Pounds. Uh, Major Holmes isn't here today, so I'll be presenting this. Okay, thank you. You have the floor, Lieutenant Colonel. Okay, so this is CCI. They monitor and control our HVAC system. We've been in place since 2012, since we moved in the building. We've trained, and they have trained our maintenance division to check and maintain the system. And the system runs well, and we have a great working relationship with them. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Lieutenant Colonel Pounds. Any questions for, for Lieutenant Colonel Pounds? Yes. Uh -huh. Vice Chairman Robinson, you have the floor. All right. This, um, uh, good morning, Lieutenant Colonel Pounds. Um, this is just general background. You know, yes, the building came online, uh, what, 2012, moved everybody in 13. Yes, the building's almost going on a decade old. It's a half million square feet. We've got another 600,000 square feet in county property, right? That gives you the balance. The jail is that big that it equals that. Um, and yet, um, I want to make sure that the maintenance of that HVAC is equivalent to what we're doing for the rest of the county or vice versa. If you're so pleased and happy and content with what's going on on the inside, um, um, and I, I have to take it at, at your word, um, we've got the county administrator who's brand new who needs to give a validation of that. But that being said, we're responsible for all the rest of the building. So Madam Subit, and help him out in this because you know where I'm going. You, you've got these two, and I, I get they're constitutional. I get they're special. I know that's their building, but we still have to appropriate. So we have to ask the question, can you help bridge the gap here? How are you going to line all HVACs up? And when you've got these, these pockets of differences and maybe we can leverage something, have you had the conversation yet with them? Um, yes, sir, in fact, Item number 13, which is in two agenda items from today, from, from I mean, from this one, um, James Worthington will be giving you an overview and will include some, um, some parts and um, pieces for the jail, uh, because I do want to make sure we're taking a holistic approach of every county facility um and having a plan so we're starting with the very oldest ones first and then in the budget you'll see that we also are going to be continuing to ask to maintain HVACs on an ongoing basis and part of that is going to be to replace um old units as well as upgrade units that are maybe not at the end of their life but they need a mid-cycle um upgrade Okay. And duly noted. So you, I knew that was on the agenda. And I'm, I think, well, why is that down there? Then we should talk about this one first. But I get it. So then my question then back to Lieutenant Colonel is, has this, are you aware? And it's okay if you don't know the answer. Are you aware? Have we ever had have whatever, whatever the um, concepts, have they always had this contract that's over five years? Have they had it straight yes. continuously over five years? Yes, sir. Absolutely. You, all right. So but you're satisfied with their service, and, but you are aware of, uh, of the board's consideration, any, any service provider over five years, there needs to be a rebid. A re we understand the value of why we don't want lifetime contracts. Are you aware of those I conversations we've been having? Yes, sir, I do. I am, I am aware. Okay, but all right. In, in, you're okay. Go ahead, sir. No, you're, you're fine. fine. I, I just want to know if you were aware. Okay. Uh, yes, again, we're going to wait until later on in the agenda to hear the rest of it, but I'm fine with what I heard. I mean, you guys are satisfied. I have to respect the will of the sheriff and his office to a certain extent. We just got to ask tough questions. Madam Chair, I yield. Thank you so much, Vice Chair. 
Um, any other questions for Lieutenant Colonel Pounds? If not, we're going to move on. Thank you so much, Lieutenant Colonel. We're going to Thank move you, ma'am. You're welcome. We're going to move on to tab number 12, Certificate of Preliminary Plat Approval for the East Villages at St. Andrews. Ron Roberts, our manager of planning and zoning, you have the floor. Yes, Madam Chair. Yes, I, uh, this uh, 92 lots um, are coming before you. There's 37 in phase two, 55 phase three. I've got Phil Schaefer pulled. Oh, there it is right there. You got Phil's got it pulled up for you to look at. It's also in your packet. Um, and we're ha happy to answer any questions. Phil, you want to add anything to it? Yeah, went through DRC a couple months ago. We uh, have complete approval. You can see the red stamp. Everybody signed. So we're ready for the certificate of preliminary plat approval for these lots. Last couple of phases for St. Andrews, and we can finally cross it off the board as something to get finally finished out. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Thank you so much, Mr. Schaefer, as well. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Commissioner Guider, you have the floor. Just uh, a little clarification. This was uh, originally platted years ago. Correct. Okay, and that it was a PVC community, I guess you'd say, <laughs> at one time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so this uh, this plat was approved before the downfall of the market and all that. Yeah, they're coming back through for recertification is what it amounts to, so they can finally build out the last lots. Mm. And these are um, these will be on sewage, right? These will be on sewer. You're correct. Okay, and uh, what price range houses? Do not know yet. Do not know yet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, as soon as you know, let me know. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> <I> sure <will. laughs> yes, Thank you. Sure. You're right. <laughs> Chair. All right. Thank you so much, Commissioner Fighter. Vice Chairman Robinson, you have the floor. Yes, this, thank you, I'm sure. Um, um, th this begets a question. Um, triggered by Madam Guider of the 4th District, which is where do we stand on all of our, what we call PVC or Pi Farm? We had an initiative that was engaged in, Madam Chair, you, you recall this, mm -hmm. of, of, it was intentional. Again, one more time, why do we redevelop? Why do, why do we take tax dollars and reinvest them back in, right? Dude, sometimes things are not realized the way they should. Sometimes we have to give an incentive and a kicker to sort of get things going to get rid of that blight or slum, or you know, I'd say correct, Commissioner, that, that, that blighted area in those communities that, that was bad. So um, I know there was what, eight communities um, in the county and maybe one in the city uh, that mm -hmm. you guys did initially, that was part of that initiative with WSA to go back and, and fix all that and recapture it. What do we, Madam Chair, can we get an updated report on that? I don't have to believe at the moment. I just want an updated report. Sure. What we started with, where we are today, include Madam Guiders uh, and whoever else was not part of that original list. I'd like to know the answer, Madam Chair, so we can sort of see how much we progress or not. Gotcha. Okay, absolutely. We'll get that information to the board as soon as possible. Yes, ma'am, full board. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, full board, yes. All right, any other questions for Manager Roberts? All right, if not, board, we're gonna move on again. Thank you, uh, Thank you guys. and Philip. Thank you. All right, we're going to move on to tab number 13, approval of the Douglas County HVAC Revitalization Program. Our Senior Director, James Worthington, are you on the line? Yes, ma'am. Good okay. afternoon. So as was alluded to earlier, uh, I'm requesting to approve a revitalization program for the HVAC throughout the entire county. Um, basically, what we're looking at is a two-year program and year one we're looking to do about 25 HVAC units that are 20 years old currently or older so right now we go from about 20 to 26 years old um, those vary in sizes and they're in a number of different facilities about a dozen different facilities and then also in the first year we're looking to do upgrades to the jail um, and the jail, I, the information I got was from Captain Tim Sword. He's over there, maintenance over there. So basically the, the request they're looking to do in this first year uh, generally pertains to one of their chillers. They have already redone one and they're looking to kind of refurbish the other. It's not something you just go in and replace, but it, you'll need to do, you know, uh, bearings, gaskets, cooling, seals, labor and all on this chiller 
um, plant, I guess you would call it. It also includes control upgrade components for their units that aren't, um, they won't currently communicate with their current uh, computer software, uh, monitor control upgrades, water treatment systems, cooling tower cleanings, number of duct actuators. So they had a, a pretty list, pretty good list, about $100,000 worth of stuff that they wanted done this year that that would felt was very important. Also, it includes the courthouse. The courthouse HVAC upgrades are chiller controls, air handler controls, um, some of the variable frequency drive motors. Some of these units, I believe there's four left that are original when the building was built. And if any of these motors go out, we'll lose uh, HVAC on entire floors until the, the parts can get ordered and replaced. So we, we kind of move those to the front as some priority. We want to do this stuff up front. Um, also, HVAC upgrades to telephone closets, uh, UV lamp installations in the air handlers throughout the courthouse. That does, um, it's like a disinfectant to the air, air handler system. It will also kill COVID. Um, so that would cover the entire courthouse. Uh, the controls, controls are one of the major problems we have in the courthouse. They're pneumatic controls, which was great um, decades ago, but in the last 20 years, everybody's kind of phased over to digital controls and pneumatic controls are getting hard to find replacement parts for. Um, so the courthouse has $174,500 worth of upgrades they need to do this year. And then the 25 existing units that are antiquated, I think it's a polite way to put it, but uh, they, that will run us uh, approximately $215,000. So for year one, that would be $489,750. And then year two would just be more old HVAC throughout the county. Um, it would be 23 more units that are currently aged between 15 and 20 years old. And those are in about 13 different facilities and that would cost 254,000. So altogether, if, if approved and completed after two years of, of the program, and completing the program, we would have nothing older than 15 years old, um, with the exception of some of the chiller units that, that do age better as long as you replace the parts that are serviceable. So total cost is $744,000. And I'm, I'm hopeful that we can get this done, bring the county back up to speed. We're, we're kind of behind on some HVAC, so. Questions? Okay, thank you so much, Director. Any questions for certainly? I want to assure the board that uh, uh, certainly that R22 Prion, I know just enough, enough about HVAC to be dangerous, but that's an obsolete Prion now. So we're pushing up against needing to change out and right. uh, damp as soon as possible in all these uh, uh, HVAC systems. Uh, Vice Chairman Robinson, I hear you see your hand. Yes. On the floor. Can you see me? Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Good. <clears throat> no, thank you. This is um, obviously this is um, a continuance of, 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 a, of an initiative. Um, in addition to our, our lighting and plumbing, we did, which we call 1.0, probably a few years ago, Madam Chair, when you took the helm, that, that was an important initiative. Mm -hmm. And that the county, again, one more time, had not historically maintained much. I didn't say anything. And these things have aged out our buildings, not, not, not just our, our structures, but uh, meaning that the, the, the substructures within the structure, I mean, the parks have aged, our systems have aged. And, you know, all this is, you know, we're, it's not that it's coming due now, we're just as administration willing to take it up, willing to deal with it. It had always been there. I mean, anybody who's been here longer than night since 1990, like me, you, it's always been here. So all the leaders and all the people along the way that stood here in these seats allowed it to get to this place. They pretended like it, it's going to be okay. It's okay. It's okay. No, you have to maintain these systems. You have to be intentional and deliberate to, to set aside 
And, and while we did do it, it didn't do it enough to where we, you got this big balloon here. You've got a massive balloons in here. You guys are doing a good job of trying to just tack it one at a time. And you know, there was probably more that needed to be done. You looked at it by A's like, okay, all right. Now I appreciate that. But this is something that, you know, this is not about a spin. This is about an investment. This is about, no, this is maintenance, M N O. Right, this is what tax dollars should be done. You can't just build it and think it's okay and that it's just gonna run if you don't change the oil, if you don't do the things that are necessary. But again, I just gotta highlight that. So now that I made that point, and I'm glad I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear, and this is nothing to Lieutenant Colonel, I wanted to make sure that um, our staff acknowledged the constitutional officer the need to include you in their consideration. So what I'm hearing, Director Worthington, is that sheriff stuff is in here, correct? That is correct. All right, that's very correct. good. All right, that, that's fine. It's just, I know they've got their own individual contract and who go do the extra work. We'll come back to that later. But the fact is the dollars, which is where I'm at, um, is included. Madam, uh, Madam Administrator, um, what is the source of funding from this? Is this the ARP money? How are y'all going to fund this? So that is um, to be determined. Um, we do have contingency and capital um, contingency that can fund year one. Um, but I didn't want to take the liberty and assume that this would be funded out of ARPA since you haven't as a board finalized that list. And we are anxious to go ahead and get this started. So I would certainly ask that we start this program this year with contingency so we can at least get purchase orders uh, requisitions started, purchase orders in place, encumber the funding. Um, we know there's a very long lead time for uh, equipment. So I'd like to be able to get the ball rolling with contingency. And if you decide to allocate ARPA funding at a later date, perhaps that could handle year two. All right, thank you for that. So I'm gonna go ahead and put a pin in this. This is that, that but that's the whole point. We really have contingency. And so we're going to consume all that with this. I, I don't think I could support that. I have to be just outright. You have this art money once in a hundred years, mm -hmm. right? Think about it. This is that, that heavy structural stuff. That's the whole point. The American recovery plan. Look what its intent was, mm -hmm. right? Allows us to clean up things that you normally wouldn't get to because if you had to normalize this over, look how far we would have to spread this out just to catch up on this. Uh, I think it's, um, you have to appreciate what it took to get the, the county's budget in its current solid state. Mm -hmm. And I just can't see consuming it just with one single, all of that, like, ah. And you got this bucket over here, like, no, because that's my point. Where's the ARP list? Now we have used some of that ARP money for small things that I know have come through, right? And, and so let's, we need to finalize it, but it's only because it needs to come before us. Right. Right. But it, um, it, it's like, no, we'll just put it on the table. So I'd like to make a request that we get the art money before us at our next meeting. There's no reason yeah. for us to continue going on and on with this. Because that's my point. You've got to align everything. We keep input before us and I'm going to keep making it to it. The object lesson is received. You can't have me making one decision out of one bucket and not showing me the other bucket. Show me all the buckets so we can make the proper decision. Now I can process it, but it's like, but for everybody else, like, Guys, why would we, when you got this big giant money over here one time, don't take the annual stuff that we know has a cap. Mm -hmm. That has a cap. You're restricted. That was by design. Like, no, don't, don't play with that budget unless you, this is a one-off. Only one time will we be able to go do something like this. So I, I wouldn't want to do your annualized budget. That's for your normalized maintenance, but not to catch up for historical. Mm -hmm. Like, don't, don't, I wouldn't do that. But I, again, I'll support whatever the will of the board is. But I wanted to make that point. Art money, next list, the full list, next meeting, let's go ahead and talk about it and get it approved. As it relates to source of funding, I mean, I think more importantly, I, I would use the art money on this because that's what's key. Um, but I'll, we'll, we'll see what the board has to say regarding that. I know I submitted a half million dollars at least on that and I, that's about good range for me. So it looks like I'm on point for that. Um, had no idea that you were bringing this forward, but at least that was my suggestion. Um, um, secondly, um, who will do the work, right? So are you going to outsource this, bid this out to a firm? Um, is this something pre-existing that you're using? Are you thinking about using staff? I mean, who's going to oversee the structural 
work over these this whatever be, it was 12 or 13 buildings yeah this will be bid out um yeah. and the well i can let that uh, james answer that but this will be bid out we certainly on the um on the sheriff piece will and on the courthouse We'll be using our, our in-house personnel to work closely with the contractors. Those are very large expenditures and um, both the sheriff and inside the courthouse, we have, um, I'm very confident in the leadership that can oversee those contracts. And then the others are generally gonna be turnkey, but they will be bid out as a package so that we can try to maximize the economies of scale. Yeah, I'm just going to hold now for that. We duly know that we had two different issues before us, <laughs> and um, I'm, I'm going to process what I just heard. Madam Chair, I yield the floor. I'm good for right now. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Vice Chairman. Any other questions from the board? And certainly, uh, Vice Chairman, I want to assure you that we will have that uh, list before you. Our county administrator will have the uh, ARPA list before this board so we can make some quick decisions because I know I agree with you. We're dragging our feet. We need to have that alignment out there. So you can see it, and I could not agree with you more that uh, that the ARPA money should be utilized for the at, uh, HVAC revitalization program. So uh, there is room uh, in the end for this money uh, to be appropriated out of the ARPA funding. So County Administrator, if you could just make sure you make that adjustment that for, I believe the first uh, request from our uh, James Worthington is 489,000 to get us started. So I know mm -hmm. we have the money, we have it in there. We just need to, Go in and make some some adjustments uh, and bring it to the board. Yes, ma'am. And, and 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 we will be ready. You have all seen the draft ARPA list, and I've added everybody's requests. Um, and then we'll have some suggestions. We'll put it in categories um, to help you with your decision making. Um, as you know, there's there's one dollar, but ten dollars worth of requests. But I'm I'm happy to work through that with you all so that we can get an adopted ARPA plan for next meeting and then set up the framework for management and reporting on that sooner than later. All right. Thank you so much, uh, County Administrator and Board. Just wanted to uh, share some good news with you. We've had an extension by the, the federal government has extended our reporting date uh, to, I believe January, is it the 1st of January? Um, County Administrator, I sent that information to you this week. I think it's either January 1st or December 31st, but it, yes. it definitely gave us a little bit more breathing room. Yes. So, okay. All right. If there are no other questions. Madam Chair. Yes. Uh, Vice Chairman Robinson. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I meant it was processing one thing and heard you. So did we say that was that the federal or was that state? No, Executive federal. authority got lifted. What are we saying? No, the ARPA funding. We, we, we have to report our Tiffany Stewart Stanley submit a report. Um, yeah based on ARPA's request, you know, federal go uh, government funding request, which is probably every 30 days, but they just said, you know what, just your first reporting, actual reporting would be December 31st, because we really don't have a lot, nothing, first of all, we haven't even approved our list, so we needed, a, that time was great for us, that grace Madam, period. Madam Chair, I just looked at it, it's actually January 31st. Which is good, January 31st. We need a little time because we need to approve the list, and then we need to start chewing down some of the money because if you don't, you won't get to phase two. We need to be able to you know, expense the 14 million out of phase one before there's even any consideration from the federal government to receive our next uh, second package of 14 million. And I see our Tiffany Stewart Stanley, if you could explain it to the board for us, you just I saw your light to come on. Um, good afternoon, uh, Board of Good um, and Chair, um, County Administrator Subedan. So um, part of the ARPA requirements is to submit fund um, reports, uh, quarterly reports. We did have to submit an interim report that was due by August 31st. That report was submitted. It did show that we did not uh, pull down any funding for that period, but they have extended the deadline for our first uh, quarterly report to January 31st, uh, 2022, which will give us a lot more time to um, get the funding um, allocated and uh, we will have an opportunity to provide us a sufficient report at that time. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. Is that sufficient? Nothing? Yeah, let, yeah let, me, let me finish that. Yeah, let me pick it back, thank you. So um, to, to um, 
all these different title changes. De de <laughs> assistant Deputy Administrator. Uh, no, so two things. We're talking about the ARPA fund and not the original COVID money, correct? Two separate funding sources, the Trump versus the Biden administration. Is that correct? I just want to, we got to separate these dollars. So what yes. are we talking about? Yes, um, Vice Chairman Robinson. So the money that we are referring to is from the ARPA funding is the funding that we received. Um, this is under the Biden administration. Um, the CARES Act funding that we received uh, last year that money was, um, we actually received that from the state of Georgia um, because that money was sent directly to the states to be allocated to the counties and cities uh, based on population size. All right, so the CARES money, second, I would like a reconciliation, Madam Chair, from staff on where do we stand with the CARES money, round one, whatever that was. Just We just need an accounting for it. Um, now I'm going to move to the ARP. You guys are down that path. Um, similarly, um, again, we've got it's almost, and it, it goes back to things being shovel ready. We sit on $28 million access. It's almost half our spots. Money we've never received in our lifetime. At least not, not but another 100 years, I will not be here. Now. And yet, I'm like, okay, what's taking so long? This goes back to why the federal government, if you watch, like, okay, why is it taking states and counties so long to get the money to the people? whatever the need of the people is, whether it's infrastructure, whether it's housing, whether it's uh, whatever the case may be. And I'm, and I'm listening to y'all. I'm listening to the people. I'm listening to y'all. I'm like, okay, there has to be a, a reconciliation of reality. Like, guys, we've been waiting on this. Right? This is, this is like, they spotted us directly. Right? And I'm sure you got to go put your Mission Impossible picture on and you get this and we got this. And it's like, my like, guys, what's taking y'all so long? I thought we, we say we got a need, but why is it taking so long to manifest and move? I know staff have capacity issues, but you got plenty of people out there that's looking for these type of contracts to get work done. Now, again, Madam Minister, you're, you're, you're coming in on this, so you, but you're feeling the momentum. It's like, okay, but it's a momentum. We went through two you know, major economic downturns in a decade, right? We, we're, we're, so now we can really clean some stuff up. Right, so it's like, let's get our minds around here and let's go, guys. There's professionals around here that can come in and help get this done. But it's like, guys, this has perishability. Guys, this, okay, the COVID money, the CARES Act, not, but this one has perishability. If you don't use it, they're going to take it back. You've got to encumber it. Let's not pretend like this board cannot make a decision on an art list. We are very good at that. We're not slow. We're not slow. You need to feel that, guys, guys. Pay attention. Well, we got more time. What, what, what's up with this more time? We don't need more time. Make the decision go so we don't even have to worry about that. Go. You have to, you have to appreciate time and money is precious. This is 28 million that we would have never gotten like this, guys. I mean, no, we're not like the big five and got big bank. But guys, this is for us. That 28 million really makes a difference. Yes, we got a list, but still, even what, what makes the list, what gets the musical chair is still important. And so I, I don't want it to be marginalized, dismissed on the need to move on this. Like I'm looking at, like we're always comparing to other kinds. Well, everybody else is moving. We're still here talking about, well, we got the list and we got to go. Like, really, guys? It shouldn't take this. But anyway, I think you all get it that we got to go. Um, this does, this can be reclaimed. If you're not using it, they'll take it and give it to another county. They'll give it to somebody else. It makes sense to me. We must have didn't need it that much. Um, so I just need, I don't want staff because sometimes we get removed. We're internally focused. We're just focused on our nine to five. We don't see, like, are y'all paying attention to this bigger picture? Do y'all don't, the need is out there from the citizens, right? That we're looking for their fellow dollars to come down with. Well, let's ask questions about that spending. Huh. Okay. All right. But you get it, Madam Chair. I just wanted to highlight the need. They're, they're doing fine. I just, all right, guys, we're on time now. Let's, let's show some fruit of our efforts and stuff. Um, let's line all these things up. We've got a lot of buckets. We've got a lot of opportunity to really improve some things. So let's show the citizens what we're made of. And that's all I'm sure I'm good for. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vice Chair. I promise you we'll snap the ball, get it down the field. My brother served as a center this entire college collegiate uh, career. And um, our county administrator loves football. So she knows what that means. Snap the ball, get it down the field so we can have that information available to you. And this board, full board at our next meeting. We'll have it, okay?
I'm good at Yale. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. We're going to move on board. If there's nothing else, we're going to move on to our next item, which is tab number 13. I'm sorry, tab number 14. Authorization to enter into an MOU for grant writing services with core group of Georgia and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. With this pandemic, uh, it is critical that we not only be shovel ready, but we need to be grant ready as well. So we're so excited that uh, our uh, assistant county administrator is bringing some information before the board today, hopefully that to, uh, for your approval on tomorrow. You have the floor, Tiffany. Thank you. Um, um, as we've been speaking, um, there is a lot of federal grant funding and state grant funding available, especially through ARPA um, for local municipalities, counties. And so we are looking to take advantage of that funding and by entering into a contract contractual agreement um, with the core development group of Georgia for grant development services, specifically centered around the um, American Rescue Plan Act. Um, the purpose of this agreement will be for the core group of Georgia to provide funding, research, planning, and, applic and write applications. Um, the group will also do other administrative support services as determined by the county administrator to support the initial ARPA program development and project management efforts of Douglas County. Um, these uh, overview of these services will include prog program development and program management support assistance with research planning reports and presentations. Um, the project terms, we will be updating that for you today. Um, the term of this agreement will be instead of 60 days, 90 days. Um, the free structure will be $30,000. Uh, we will be working on multiple um, applications to the state for funding for ARPA. Um, and um, this funding, the, the funding for this will be allocated from, for, from the funds that have been set aside for the county administrator for grants. Um, and Ms. Latoya Cutts, who's the owner of a core group of Georgia has over 15 years of experience, especially working with uh, government grants. She is on the line if the board has any questions. Thank you. Okay. Um, hi, how you doing Ms. Cutts? Thank you for being here today. Your, your mic is, there you go. Thank you for being here for the Board of Commissioners today. If you could just speak to the board uh, briefly about what you plan to do in, in, in your experience and, and how you plan to secure grants opportunities, you know, this funding as we have so many grants that are available now with, uh, with this pandemic before us. Sure. Um, thank you, Madam Chairman, and thank you, uh, Board of Commissioners, for allowing me this opportunity to, uh, to be able to submit the proposal for your consideration. I think more specifically as it relates to my experience, I have over 15 years of experience working with uh, federal funds. I've served as a director for community and economic development for over five years um, with the city of Albany, and we were a 100% federally funded department. So when you talk about um, some of the types of programs that, um, or the types of, of dollars that um, are being administered through the state now with ARPA funds. I'm very familiar with those, very familiar with program development um, and actually submitting grant applications. But more specifically to um, this particular proposal and helping with, um, I think there are three specific projects that um, the county administrator has identified. Um, one of them is with the broadband infrastructure. The second one is related to the transitional housing project. And then another one or the third one is for a library that I think this is something that there are already committees working specifically on those projects. And there is a lot of um, information already ready in terms of getting it almost to the point of being shovel ready to be able to submit the applications. But I think what's most important in terms of my experience is that if you look at the uh, the requirements for the application to the state of Georgia, there's it's a nine um, there's there's nine specific things that have to be submitted for the application, and those nine things it really is um, kind of getting to the core of like program development. You really do have to be able to demonstrate um, that it meets the need, how it's going to be able to. Um, to, to tie back to COVID specifically and how it's addressing a, an, an issue that came up during COVID. You also have to be able to uh, demonstrate capacity. You're gonna also have to make sure that you're able to um, include a timeline and then 
ongoing monitoring and reporting requirements even after uh, these things that these projects are implemented. So when they're making decisions, they're not going to make them just solely based on a budget and just solely based on whether or not the project aligns in terms of whether or not it's eligible, but it's being able to demonstrate all of the other kind of key components of, of the projects as well and making sure that there is that impact is being met and you have a way to be able to measure that. And I have um, unique experience with having been able to do that um, and have worked on a number of different both state and federal grant programs. So um, that's, I guess, I'll yield back just to um, allow any questions that may need to be asked. Thank you so much, Ms. Cuts. Board of Commissioners, do you have any questions for Ms. Latoya Cuts regarding grants or what she's done in the past or how she planned? I have a question for you. You mentioned um, measure. Those, that's very important as you measure your, your performance. Will you develop a list of potential grants that you would try to secure? Because, you know, as we, I know you spoke about the state, but you also have those federal grants out there as we begin to build back better uh, under the Biden's administration, certainly the big uh, trans, the infrastructure, uh, hopefully that'll come through as well, have some grants available that are, you're gonna look at a tier, two tiers, both federal and state, because we wanna try to capture as much as we can. Uh, this is a big pond and we want every fish in there if we can get it. So what, what can you tell me? Yes, um, absolutely. So the, the primary focus of this particular um, proposal was on the ARPA funding applications, making sure that those were submitted timely by the October 31st deadline. But then there was also a specific requirement to uh, look at EDA and other uh, federal funding um, and that Build Back Better, um, specifically looking at the, um, the library project and looking at that as a potential funding source for that project. But of course, if the infrastructure bill is passed, then that would be one that we would definitely go ahead and um, look at and incorporate that into, um, you know, based on the, the timeline of between now and the end of December, um, being able to get in everything that we can, but those are the ones specifically that we talked about are the infrastructure and then also EDA and then the ARPA funding. Those are, I guess, kind of the, the three kind of areas of funding. Okay. Um, certainly, I, I, the, the tab does not in, in include a cost. Is there a certain cost or is this based on the, if you secure the grant, you receive 10% of, Tiffany, if you could explain yeah. it more. So Chairman Jones, um, yes. So we do have in there the, uh, the fee structure and it's a, right now it's a flat fee of $30,000 um, for, the, for, the, for, the, for the proposal. Um, I, like I said, we do have to uh, make an adjustment to the project term for the date. Um, and then I also have to get, um, we will be um, seeking the final legal review once we make that adjustment. Okay, thank you for explaining the fee structure. 30,000. Okay, board. Any questions, board? Are we good? Okay. Yes. Uh, okay. <laughs> Vice Chairman Robinson, you have Will somebody else speak? Want to go for me? I well, I, I, you can go and then behind you will be Commissioner Carthen. No, no, I'll yield. No, okay, Commissioner Carthen, you have the floor. <laughs> okay, thank you, uh, Vice Chair Robinson and Madam Chair. Um, my question is I lost her name. Ms. Ms. Cuts, uh, Latoya Cuts. <laughs> Thank you for joining us, Ms. Cuts. And um, I heard you have worked with municipalities. So you have worked in the city of Albany. So you've worked with our Madam Superdent before. So you understand her management style and what she's expecting of you, I assume. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, <laughs> wonderful. Uh, my, uh, my question to you is, will this be, just be you or will you have a team of individuals working with you to there help will you do this? <laughs> Yes, there's two other individuals that will be working with me on this. Okay, and my other question to you is once we secure this, does your contract involve you helping us to implement it and to make sure that our reporting is done back in time or is this contract just for you filling out the application, getting all of the reports and the gathering of the information so that we can submit it and, and possibly get awarded the grant? So the initial contract is um, specifically for putting together the application, but the application does include uh, making sure that you understand how the reporting and how the actual uh, monitoring is going to be handled. 
specifically for the ARPA funding. So a lot of that framework for program management will be kind of included because they're requiring it as a part of the application process. Now, in terms of after the December, I guess the end of the initial 90 day contract, then if there are opportunities to, um, to continue working in that capacity, then I, I would definitely be open to kind of an extended version of, of the contract. But initially we're just kind of focusing on the initial application. <laughs> and getting those ready. And as a part of ARPA funding, um, they do require in November, there's a timeline that the state has put out. And those who are successful, they'll know, um, the ones who the initial applications that are chosen to go to the next stage, there will be um, presentations that will be made on November the 29th. So in terms of making or being a part of that presentation process, then I will be, um, that'll be a part of the services that are provided. Awesome. So I'm going to keep my fingers crossed and hope that we will be a part of that so that that can be uh, those um, um, that project can be, you know, put forth before the state board and, and those who are making those decisions. Uh, my other question, and this may be to Director Stanley or Madam Subedin. So the team that will be working with Ms. Cuts will be who? We want to make sure that if the board goes ahead and, you know, approves this application, that we are giving her the resources, the people, everything to make this a success. So who would be a part of that team with Ms. Cuts from our end? Well, right now, um, the team is just me, but we are in the process of, we, have, we do have the grant writer uh, job out there. We are in the process of hiring someone for the grant writer position. And hopefully that person will be coming aboard along very soon to help okay. us with this process. Okay, so this is not to replace that. No. In the interim. Okay, I'm glad I asked that. All right, yeah. wonderful. Okay. And can I jump in, Commissioner Carthen? Sure. And to be clear, you know, um, Tiffany isn't really a team of one. Everybody is going to roll up their sleeves as long as they have any information, any part. Um, directors will get involved, subject matter expertise will be brought to the table because we will be really working with Latoya and her team on a team approach for grants. You know, one person doesn't have all the information. There isn't a silver bullet. Sometimes you have to bring finance to the table, capital to the table, the subject matter expertise to the table. Even our partners in the community on the broadband will be looking at community partners. Um, we will be potentially even looking at um, WSA. So, you know, as we start to put, pull these, these applications together, um, all directors have been put on notice that this is, a, this is a team approach. And Latoya knows me well. She knows that I'm all about the team and bringing everybody's expertise to the table to, give, to put our best foot forward, um, both in putting the grant application in, but then when we're successful, making sure that we deliver for the people. Absolutely, uh, that, that is critical. That's why I asked that question because in order for us to be successful, we got to make sure that everybody is on board and that it's not just a team of one because Director Stanley does have her hands full. We know she's, she's a Jill of all trades um, in the BOC suite and she is everywhere. So I just wanted to make sure that um, we were having people um, at Ms. Cut's disposal so that she can get everything she needed to be able to, um, to make sure that the BOC is successful because her success equals our success, which equals the success of the taxpayers because that's less money that'll have to come out of the general fund in order for us to get a lot of these projects which are desperately needed, funded. That's so I just wanted to make that point. Thank you so much, everyone. And with that, Madam Chair, I yield. Thank you so much, Commissioner Carthen. Commissioner, right. you have the floor. Yep, I, I, I knew the Commissioner Carthen was gonna frame that right. So, okay, um, then, then my question is, uh, more broadly, we have um, a formal grant writer position that we're out just listing and we're inserting this, this group in lieu of that. And, and, How do we select this this process? But I'm, I'm, I'm gonna let that go for a minute because it's, it's thirty thousand dollars for I think I heard ninety days. So that means that's one twenty a year. It keeps rolling. All right, I got to do the math here. All right, and so then there's is there any bonus or contingency upside? That's base. That's for her effort for collecting. 
If she's successful, does she get any points on that that's independent of the program management? I'm gonna come back to that. Right. Not, at this, oh. not at this time, and it's not in lieu of the grant writer. It's just that we need, we were advertising for the grant writer. I think we have three candidates, but we need help right now. And um, I, I reached out to Latoya to ask her if she had any capacity to add her, add us to her portfolio, and she submitted a proposal. No, I understand. Please don't be defensive. It just it was just my point. Um, I wish all the other roles could roll as fast as that. Right. Um, it, just be careful. Um, just be careful. Um, that being said. Um, I'm going to come back to my point, which, which I'm fine. Just, just flow with me. So we get um, $30,000 part time, 90 days. That's fine. Um, so staying on task, is there any success fee or contingency associated with this for the, the successful acquisition of the grant? And if so, how much? No, um, no. The contract we have now just states the flat $30,000 fee. So we don't have um, any success fees. And the contract, if we were to, to go further, we would have to come back before the Board of Commissioners for another contract the way we have it structured now. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean again, we've been talking about grant writing for two years. And plus six months. And we've been harping and harping. Now all of a sudden it's like, okay, guys, you you you, need, you really need we're we're one offing it. It's like, gosh, y'all need a formal function. We talked about this during the executive retreat. We talked about this. I get the spot. Just when I see it, I'm just saying, like, okay, I got expectations now. Then. Um this this it it has to deliver. Right. So I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, um, we talk about state alignment. Where's um, the other uh, Mr. Montgomery? Where's my status report on that? We haven't heard from that consultant in you know, two months. Like it, you, you have to be accountable for performance. See, we, we, we get grilled and we should. It's the same standard. Okay, we, we understand, but know that we're going to be asked these questions, have those answers ready for us. Um, and I just, I'm, I'm looking for, and I, I have maybe, if my peers have heard it, I, I'm okay with that. But I hadn't heard that we had shifted away from having a dedicated group, that we had this RFP out here. We're like, okay, well, that's in process, but we're going to hire this. Like, okay, oh, wow. Just like that. That, 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 that sleight of hand, it, it just didn't feel good right there. And I, and I get how it's framed about what it's going to accomplish in the three things. It's just I have to let that be known for the record. It's like, ooh, but okay, I'm going to let that go for right now. I'm, 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 I'm okay. Like I said, I'm going to yield the full will of the board. So it's where they go uh, on, on this one. And so um, thank you, Madam Chair. I yield. Okay. Thank you so much, Vice Chairman Robinson. Any other questions, board? Oh, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Cuts, for coming in today and uh, providing the presentation to the board and uh, certainly your intentions with regard uh, for the grant. I noticed I heard two things, sourcing the grants and, and applying the application piece, which is critical. And uh, board, we do have some things that are rather time sensitive, which is related to the state. I believe the deadline has been pushed to August 31st. And we're certainly um, really, we want to be very intentional about the broadband. That's something that we want to capture here in this county. So I, it sounds like that's going to be your first uh, a part of the duty. If this board approves, she's going to jump on that state side because the governor has quite a bit of money uh, in his vault and he's uh, has some things out there that we definitely want to take advantage of. So thank you so much again, Ms. Cuts, and thank you so much, uh, uh, County Administrator and also uh, Assistant County Administrator. If there's nothing else, board, I'm going to move on to the next item. The next Thank item. You, Madam Chair. Oh, you're welcome. Tab number 15. We're going to move to authorization to approve an MOU with the Georgia Department of Driver Services and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Assistant County Administrator Tiffany Stewart Stanley, you have the floor. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so as we know, in 2020, the Georgia General Assembly um, allocated $3.4 million to build and equip a new driver's license center here in Douglas County. Um, the MOU you see before you today, is it is still subject to final legal review. We just received this final document Friday, um, but this document is standing in the way of the getting the progress moving for the building. Um, I want to thank um, Senior Director Worthington, who has been very instrumental in getting the technical details of this um, document together for the county. Um, the county, the document does state the responsibilities of the county and the DDS. I will go over some of those, um, those um, responsibilities. Um, so the DDS has a maximum budget of $3.4 million. Um, I'm sorry, $3.4 $3 million for project completion. This agreement covers the construction of the DDS Customer Service Center in Douglas County. Um, and this agreement will be between the Georgia Department of Driver Services and Douglas County. Um, some of the responsibilities listed for Douglas County are things like uh, clearing the, and grubbing the land um, per the approved site plan. Um, Douglas County will be responsible for rough grading per approved site plan. Um, Douglas County will also be responsible for any subsurface necessary to achieve rough grading, um, included but not limited, limited to blasting of rocks, soil remediation, et cetera. Um, the county will also be responsible for installing stormwater pipes, head walls, manholes, catch basins, drop inlets as designed. Um, Douglas County will also be responsible for bringing power, water, sewer, and natural gas if needed to within five feet of the building. Um, and so there are um, other responsibilities such as uh, being responsible for water and sewer tap fees. Um, one of the things I also want to point out to the board that uh, we did have to put a clause in regarding any funding um, necessary to complete the project above the $3.4 million. Um, and um, one of the things that's being proposed is for any of those costs that the county would potentially pay if the board approves it not to exceed 5% or um, I think that would be around $170,000. Um, the duties of the DDS, of course, will be to provide the maximum project funding of the $3.4 million to construct the 8,000 square foot customer service center um, per the approved building plans. Um, construct 16 issuing counties, counters, I'm sorry, in the newly constructed customer service center subject available to funding, and then also to construct 20 testing stations to be used. Um, the DDS shall provide all fixtures, furniture, and equipment for the newly constructed customer service center. So this is just a brief overview of the agreement. Um, like I said, it is still subject to final legal review. So I'll yield at this time. Thank you so much. Tiffany, Board of Commissioners, do you have any questions? Okay. Uh, sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but... <laughs> no, no, this, this, again, I know we, we, this is an important meeting and it, it, it's rich, it's meaty. Mm -hmm. This is a project one more time that I, we have to thank um, um, Governor Kim mm -hmm. uh, for um, awarding this. It was a process that we have been soliciting for quite some time for those who have been here long enough to know that we believe that we needed that service to be fulfilled here versus going into other counties. We're the 10th largest county by way of population and eighth most dense. There was no reason why we, we continue, but we never advocated until we really got on watch and really went for it. We, we recognized that we could have got a used one, we could have got like a rental or rehab, but he gave us a state of the art facility. I'm quite sure that that switch and everything else when he came in helped like oh put us on the map with him, but we appreciate it. We appreciate the tip. This is an important project, guys. So I, I didn't want that to fall away. Like no, guys, this was important, right? This is something that we can be proud of, and that we but we we couldn't have done this without obviously the General Assembly, both sides, um, everybody who participated in that process for advocacy, getting us on the list. I will not neglect anybody, and I think everybody touched this in some kind of way on up, uh, up our delegation, et cetera, and the leadership in our delegation, and those are uh, in the House and the Senate. So this one was, we really appreciate it. So um, give credit where credit is due. I'm glad to see what $3.4 million over eight, 800, what, 8,000 8, square feet was about $300 a square foot. All right, I mean, I, that's, that's about right for commercial, especially institutional, it feels good for me. But anyway, Madam Chair, I just wanted to acknowledge that. I know we've been waiting and waiting 
but now, hey guys, it's about to go forth. So my question then becomes, once we sign this, Tiffany, from start to finish, relatively speaking, is what? Well, that I'm going to have to um, yield to Director Wardington because like I said, he is very instrumental in getting these terms That's together fine. for sure. the Senate. And James, you know, you don't have to box yourself. You're not, you're not, you put it, we're just saying, give us a relative so we can set the public sector. Sure. So we're expecting to have approved construction plans uh, within about a month. And that was based on the last meeting we had that was a week and a half ago. So um, once those plans are received, we'll have to go out to bid for our portion. One thing that did come up in the previous meeting that we are looking to entertain would be, um, whether or not we can do a single contract and just the county kind of pay our portion of the contract versus having to do two separate bid processes with two separate contracts for the county to do our portion and then turn it over to the state. It'd be faster if we can do it under one contract. Um, so at this point, I, I would say within a year, um, once construction begins, um, the grading work would probably take a few months and then you're probably looking at six months or so to go vertical on the building six to nine so I still think probably about a year would be before grand opening how about that right so the design has been done you you're at, did you say that again design has been done the design the final design is not approved yet they said in the last meeting um, they're expecting to have that within a month so, but it's been done they just haven't been signed off on that true it's mostly complete it's in the review process got it all right okay give or take of 30 days and so a year for construction for eight thousand square feet so we're talking about this time next year so by the end of next year because i mean I've, I've watched these things that are going up and they just you, you cannot guarantee a certain time frame so um we're talking about probably at the end of this time next year it'll be done correct December of 20 and i know i'm not boxing you but i mean just this is us talking Correct. And, and hopefully, you know, it will be sooner. The building itself on these buildings, they're a steel frame building. There's, there's not, they're not entirely complex on the interiors. You know, yep. it's generally a lot of waiting area, um, yep. counter space kind of thing. So it's not like it's a very elaborate construction yep. process. So hopefully it can be sooner, but. All right. How many jobs may come associated with this and who pays for the operations of this? Is this our contribution is simply the building, the land that we contributed to this and, and helping prepare it for them. But this is truly a state facility. Will there be any expectations of ongoing operating funding? Yes or no? Uh, no, sir. It will be completely operated by the Department of Driver Services. Okay. And it will be people here to be employed. Do they know how big the operation will be roughly? Um, I mean, I'm not making them committed. I'm just, do you have any insight based on what you've heard so far? Uh, there the construction plans are calling for 16 issuing counters yep. um, and then you would have some instructors and then some managerial positions as well so you're probably looking in the 20 20 25 employees total something like that okay and then back up and it's it's going all right I, i'm sure all the rest of operational stuff will come out later i just wanted to frame that um so um i yield the floor madam chair thank you thank you james thank you um Thank you, Director Worthington. Thank you so much, Commissioner Adam. Robinson. Okay, Commissioner Geider. Uh, just some clarification, because when Tiffany was reading the uh, MOU, she, she was referring to how many counters and everything. The state's paying for the building. We're furnishing the, the land and the infrastructure around it, right? Yes, according to this agreement, that's correct. <laughs> okay, well, I, I got confused. I was beginning to think, are we building that building? And I, I didn't remember <laughs> it that way. But uh, then uh, I think uh, Commissioner Robinson alluded to something about that. So I wanted to just clarify for the public, we're not building the building. It's going to be a state facility, but we did furnish the land and we will have to do the infrastructure and the the gas lines, um, the uh, the computer, I guess the internet connections and everything has to go up to five feet of the building. Is that right? That's James? correct. So we'll okay. bring it from the right of way up to five feet of the building, and then they'll take care of tying it into the building once the building is complete. Okay. I just wanted to clarify that because I kind of got confused when she was telling 
how many counters we had to have and everything. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I apologize. Anyway, that's okay. <laughs> but uh, with that, I yield back. And thank you, James and Tiffany. All right. Thank oh. you, Commissioner. And thank you, uh, James and Tiffany, for bringing such exciting news. We, we've been waiting quite a while. Now it seems like we're moving, beginning to move forward. So thank you all. All right, Board of Commissioners, uh, certainly we're going to move to our discussion items. Well, tab number 17 will be discussed in our executive session regarding board appointments, uh, which will be we have a board appointment for the uh, Board of Assessors and the Animal Advisory Control Board, and that will be discussed in the executive session. And then we're gonna move back up to tab number 16, which is legislative reform policies, uh, which includes procurement committees, uh, travels, and uh, that is the, being brought by commissioner uh, and vice chairman Robinson. I would like to thank our vice chairman for researching and drafting proposed legislation with consideration for the full board as we work to advance our policies and to expand our uh, ability uh, to, to focus a little differently. We don't always have to do things that we've done 100 years. We can bring our own spin to it. And certainly I had an opportunity to research uh, other counties uh, similar uh, to Douglas County and, and saw that there, there is a difference. So Vice Chairman Robinson, you have the floor with your, your three um, policies that you're bringing forth. All right, well, thank you, Madam Chair. And, and, and again, it's um, just to set expectation and it's, it's the county clerk, Available, Madam Chair, to support this process? Yes, she is. Walking. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir, I'm here. All right. So, to, to my peers, this is just again, um, follow the suit that we did last year with our financial policy review. Uh, we just expanded how we approach legislation here. Um, and so, the county clerk will read each one of them, we'll pause on each one of them to get feedback. Obviously, this is discussion, it's not on the work session to act. That will come um, and you obviously have time. One of the things we've all, five of us, have learned we don't like shotguns. <laughs> it doesn't feel good, right? So if there's time built into this that all of us can weigh in, submit your comments in writing. Um, I think that's the only way to be respectful. But again, one of the things that we've acknowledged, at least from district commissioners, um, and this is has not it just our own revelation is we don't do a lot of legislation. We do a lot of responses to what the executive side needs day to day. But that was one of the things I always got frustrated with, like, OK. You know, it's like, well, but it really that's up to uh, us as district commissioners to understand that there's a function to provide, which is legislation. Yes, the executive branch may have some amendments that need to be done that they can bring forth. But we are free to sponsor and advocate what we believe, representing obviously our respective um, um, constituents on what they may see the world. So again, we're just trying to raise our level of our game. Um, it is, we have to work together. And so again, it's time for you to be built in. So we wanna just take these one at a time. Again, there, there's no, it won't be on the agenda tomorrow, anything like that. And I know we're, we're gonna get through time, but we're gonna be thoughtful. Um, County clerk, we talked about doing the travel one first. Can we go ahead and get, get that one off the gate, please? Yes, sir. Sure. All righty. Um, the travel policy was first, um, I think, created uh, in May of 2009. Uh, the last revision date was October 2019. Um, a lot of what we did was just clean up um, some of the verbiage. Um, the most significant changes will allow for department heads to approve the travel and training within their departments in accordance with their budgets. Um, this, this amendment will also allow for the elected officials and constitutional officers to approve travel and training within their individual offices as well, which will eliminate all travel and training requests being submitted to the county administrator and the chairman for approval. Um, this will allow for a lot better efficiency. Right now, it's just a long process, like our new world system, it, it's just, it just takes a little too long to, to process these. Um, Travel expenditure, expenditure such as lodging, registration, reimbursements, et cetera, um, those will continue to have various approval levels within the new world system to ensure that budgetary funds are available and as well as adherence to our travel policy. Um, so if you have any other questions or if you want me to touch on any specific um, change, I'm happy to do that. 
Clark, um, certainly I, I would like to just uh, respond to that one. I think it's a, it's a, I appreciate all the changes because it really advances us. It takes a lot of that paperwork. That's one thing we're trying to do is make sure we focus more on technology rather than just paper moving from one side of the organization to the other. So this is a, a great move uh, for travel. I know we've been working on it since 2019, but certainly to, to go in and massage it uh, as the vice chairman did with uh, his uh, legislative aid, I think is perfect. Um, certainly it takes uh, both myself and the county administrator, just, we've just been mentioning paper. It's just too much paper moving back and forth. And those directors have the ability to manage their budgets. That's the purpose. And I wanted to see stronger leadership within the organization with regard to managing their own individual budgets. And so that, uh, that would allow them to keep up with what's going on and be more uh, closer to the wheel in their own departments to, to manage what's going on in terms of travel and things of that sort. And then if there's a problem, because they already have some the guardrails up regarding how much they can spend and what their capacity is like for each budget. So this is really gonna help our, our directors move to the next level of leadership and management and, and managing budgets because that's one of the areas that I pointed out when I first came on board. I said, I just don't think our staff, or should I say our directors are really astute to budget management. So this is great. So thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair. Perfect. Yes, and, and, and again, I, I won't take any credit for this. Again, I, I respect staff. You know, it's all about staff and stuff, things that they've captured over time that we just we were inspired to go deal with. But to that point, Madam Chair, I, I want to give credit, some, some acknowledgement to staff. This was started back in 09 where um, when we went through the recession, we decided to consolidate, we the board, decided mm -hmm. to consolidate everything under, uh, we went along with the recommendation to consolidate everything under the chair. So it was just one single point that everything had to be approved through the chair. So mm -hmm. you, took, you took decision making away from departments, they were more than capable of it, but when we took that away to sort of, we want to manage every dollar and stuff, if we're going through this recession, which I don't disagree per se. But here we are a decade later in another recession, but they, they're more than capable of doing it. We, right. We're moving from a centralized to a decentralized, but you you got too much seasoning. These, these, these are not frontline people. <laughs> we're not talking about just big, big, giant budgets, especially regarding travel. So some of it was trust and controls, but I, I think this is the right thing. You know, in addition to the paper, it's like, okay, it's too, it's too centralized. It's too much having the, the county administrator and you are having to do too much day to day, just like, okay, it, it's just, no, the Constitution office, these guys are more than capable. They got to get a ring like us. They're more than capable of running. That's 13 down. Plus your directors, you, they're more than capable. So some of it was that, Madam Chair, that it, it, we decided to consolidate it. I think it's right to sort of liberate it, push it back out. And I think we'll become more efficient with the technology to support it. So I'll make that point. I'll make that point. All right, Lisa. That, I mean, again, you guys all have comments. Um, um, you can submit comments by next week. If at any point in any of these that we walk through, if you think it's ready to go, that's great. Some of them may be in the ordinance, which obviously has a notification process that cannot go that fast. But if there's something that you think like, okay, I'm fine, that's just a text minute, please speak um, and we'll go from there. All right, so um, County Clerk, again, we're just gonna read them as we take them. So next one up. Um, I was going to start with committees, is that good? Yeah, it's fine. Okay. Um, okay, a committee in the government of Douglas County, Georgia is a body of one or more persons appointed or elected by the Board of Commissioners to consider or investigate or take action in regard to certain matters or subjects or to do all of these things. Committees may be divided into two distinct classes. Uh, one is standing committees. A standing committee is a permanent committee and includes the following organizational areas finance, transportation, procurement, policy safety, or I'm sorry, public safety, parks and recreation, economic development. The other is special committees. A special committee is, a temp is temporal in nature that exists to fulfill a, a specific assignment in a specific time frame, and a committee of the whole and its substitutes shall include such areas as personnel, hiring, evaluation, et cetera. The members can be compromised of a standing committee or a subcommittee appointed or selected thereof. Any action by, by committee shall be forwarded to the full board of commissioners as a recommendation only or extending to the administration 
as an instruction in the form of administrative concurrence. Uh, the formation. Committees of a Douglas County, Georgia government, whether standing, whether standing or special, shall be created and regulated by the Board of Commissioners. Membership on a committee is limited to one or two members of the Board of Commissioners. One of these members will serve as chair of the committee. The chair of a standing or special committee shall be approved by a vote or consensus of the entire BOC. The vice chair shall be selected by the chair of the committee from among the entire BOC. The remaining members of a standing or special committee shall be appointed by the county administrator slash manager from within the organization. Authority. The chair shall have the same authority as established by Robert's Rules of Order in fulfilling the duties of the committee. The chair shall have authority to approve agenda items, invite guests, pass resolutions, assemble the members, facilitate meetings, and fulfill assignments. The vice chair of a committee will serve as the chair in the event that the chair is unavailable to fulfill his or her duties during a specific meeting according to Robert's Rules of Order. The chair will serve no more than 24 consecutive months or two years in a single committee. There is no time duration that a vice chair can serve. For each committee, standing or select, a secretary who is a non-voting member must be established, established and shall serve as a permanent or temporal scribe to capture member comments during deliberations Ooh. and the exact outcome on votes. The exact A's, nays, and abstains for how each voting member voted must be captured in order to establish a formal voting record. In the event of an abstention, a committee member must produce in writing the reason where specificity is given to establish the financial conflict of interest. Specificity, I'm sorry, <laughs> of conflict must be provided to the secretary 24 hours before the vote. This would also include the motion itself and all conditions. These meetings result will these meeting results will serve as official meeting minutes that must be published to the general public within 72 hours before the next formal committee meeting. The secretary is also responsible for producing the agenda to be published to the public 48 hours prior to the meeting as established by the BOC Code of Ordinance. Member duties. For non-member of commissioner, for, for non-board of commissioner members, the county administrator shall appoint an organizational lead from the general government. This person shall provide technical expertise, input reports, briefings, presentations, whether directly or indirectly, to support considerations before the committee. All other members shall provide supporting subject matter expertise. Voting. Each committee comprising of no more than nine members shall vote on all matters before the committee once a quorum has been established. It is noted visiting organization members can attend and contribute to a, meet, to a meeting agenda. However, during the deliberation component of any agenda item, only the selected committee members may deliberate and vote. A standing committee will be called to order by its chair at a minimum of one time per month for a calendar year. The dates of this meeting must be pre-published at the beginning of each calendar year. This does not preclude special called meetings during any given month. A special committee shall establish the duration and the dates of its meeting at, at its inception and from amongst its members. And that concludes the one for committees. Thank you, um, Madam Clerk. Um, Madam Chair, may I continue this or would you like to facilitate the conversation? Um, you can, I just, I, you said you were gonna give us all a moment to chime in. Yep. Right. So I'll, you can keep going in. All right, I'll just make sure. Yeah, again, this is, um, again, this was something that we knew we need to look at. There's nothing formal within the county after 150, what, almost 151 years, they spoke formally to committees. It, it was always a de facto how we did things here. That's what I call those invisible rules. It's because if we allowed it, <clears throat> It was nothing to really point toward, uh, and we thought it was important to sort of like, okay, guys, let's let's address this. So there's really for people going forward. All five of us are pretty seasoned, but as new members are come on board in the future, it's, it's important that they have a reference point. Like this is how committees, this is where the authority comes from, this is how these things are done. So it's more educational, but we had nothing in our 
in our code to address it. So we thought it was important just to grab this and clarify some things. Just one point in mentioning, um, I think to, to my fellow members, is that um, the committee names, um, um, the standing committees were not fixed. It was just top of mind. As you know, this is just a draft. Please, I'm not sponsoring that those should be it. Um, it was a reference point. So if you're the county administrator, if you want to help weigh in, a map chair or any of you on that, uh, it was just more of a, well, here's the big five that we know that we got to be responsible for, but it, it, it could go from there. Secondly, um, on special committees, while we talk about voting and employees, I mean, it also can mean things like uh, redistricting or loss or SES, like we all just went through recently. So those are specialty committees that are just one off um, versus standing that are ongoing. So I just wanted to bring that clarity. But again, if you guys want to weigh in, I will yield the floor to anybody who wants to comment. Again, submit your comments um, formally by next week. But right now, any initial reactions, please weigh in respectfully. Okay, uh, I'll weigh in. Uh, Commissioner, certainly, uh, again, I want to commend you for taking the time to look at and draft some legislation. And I do agree with you, the, the uh, ability and capacity for our legislative body to function has been very limited. And I'm excited about the, the proposal that has come forth. And I'm not sure about my peers, but definitely I'm very excited. What I did, I had an opportunity to kind of look around because I know in previous years, and, and certainly I agree with you that I, I believe in expanding democracy and, and, and with the chairman making the actual assignments to me, we could do that different. I looked at other counties around surrounding areas. I did some research as well. And typically what happens to chair and the majority of the board board votes for the commission, you know, for these boards standing and both special, which is great. And then what happens uh, because it's legislative matters really coming before the executive body, uh, the, what I've seen, I saw several trends. The, uh, there's a few were making assignments and I said, okay, we don't wanna do that, that's old school. And then you had uh, either the chair just serves as the EXO official on all on the various boards or they serve as a non-member. So there was three various uh, models out there and I looked at them. So what I would do, I'm just, I submitted uh, just light rough draft, but I'm flexible ex officio to allow those matters to come before the executive body as we function. So I did look uh, very open-minded because I agree. I said, well, shoot, everybody need to have a way in on who serves on what particular board. So I just want to let you know, I did send some, just a, some light um, things that I wanted. I transcribed a few things that I thought would be good. And certainly I will uh, add the exo official member, which that uh, the chair usually serves. And I looked at about four or five surrounding, not outside of Georgia, right here in Georgia, where, where there's an uh, elected chair. They just use the service an EXO official member on all the boards. So that's just something that I'll just be adding. And certainly that's just something that come before this board for consideration. But otherwise it, it looks good. I think that the thought process is very good. Okay, we'll keep going. Anybody else then to that, Madam Chair, you want to make sure? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, yes, I'd like to come in. Madam Guider, please weigh in. Yes. Um, the federal, the Congress of the United States of America, the speaker sets the chair uh, members um, in a state legislature. Same thing is done by the speaker of the house or the uh, lieutenant governor. I, and I don't know why the chair's not <laughs> concerned about giving her authority away to appoint the committee uh chairs at least the chairs oh but, yeah I'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna be part of the appointing i'm so sorry yes i will be part of appointing the committee chairs with the majority of the board because that's what i'm saying it, i know well uh the way i read it it, it was going to be done by the board and that way you know a block uh group of the board will be steering the county rather than you the elected chairperson countywide. So that's what I would be concerned about. Well, can I just share something with you? I was, I did research and not only inside of Georgia, but outside of Georgia, it says the chair with the majority of the vo uh, vote of the board of commissioners may create a committee of members of the board to study any issue before the board. So that means the chair and the board. So all of us, and I looked at uh, Paulden County, they, that's where it's done there. 
looked at Carroll County, looked at DeKalb County, except uh, that, uh, well, which we know that uh, he is not the chair. He's really like the CEO. He does not serve. He serves as a non-member. So I looked around. I'm trying to be open-minded. Commissioner, it's not about giving up power, but if certainly I would be an exo official member on all the on the all the committees. And that's what these other uh, counties are doing as well. The chair serves as an exo official member. So I'm not giving up power. I'm still in the room. So I don't want to show doesn't vote though. So right. I, I could be concerned about that if I were you, but with that, I'll yield back. I know what you're saying, not voting, but this information has to come before the full board anyway. So I'm a vote. Uh, you know, in the, in the end, I will be because it'll be a body of five of us voting. So I will have a vote. This is just mainly they're voting just so they can bring this information to the full board of commissioners. This is what these committees do. Well, this is this is not normally how the government ha is run. Congress, state, whatever, cities. But anyway, but uh, I'm look, I'm back. looking at it, commissioner. That's what I'm saying. I looked. I understand when you say yield power. I'm not about power, I'm about production and making things happen. And I, don't, I, and I believe in democracy. What I did, I looked at other places and that chair is not just assigning. It depends in, on some areas, like the mayor position, she assigns, but she don't sit on any positions. I'm just saying those more mayoral positions. But I looked specifically at counties. So the chair and the majority of the board are selecting those board, uh, uh, those committees. They are the members who serves as a chair, vice chair, and then of course, the chair of those of that board is serving as an exo official of all the boards. That's what I'm just saying. So I'm not giving up any power. We don't have to do everything the same way that we've done a hundred years. I, I think it's fair. I mean, it's, I believe in just fair. Okay. Just <laughs> but you are elected countywide. So that's why you have been given the authority to appoint your chairs um, in the past. As long as I can remember, it's been done that way. But I go back. Yeah, and I know you did. And I looked in our at our ordinances and I looked at our legislation and there's nothing out there to support that. Commissioner, we, we don't have anything out there in our ordinance or our charter that says that I am responsible for appointing any board members. But I'm going to be well, that, that, that is because the other government branches are done that way. So. I'm looking at Paulding counties. I'm looking at Carroll counties, the chair and the majority of the board of the commissioners may create a committee of members so that is everybody involved. All five of us can vote who's gonna serve on the committees, but I will serve as an exo official for all the committees. So I, 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 I'm kind of, I'm content with that. I wanna try something different. Let's try it. Any other, um, I'll yield back to you, Vice Chairman. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I appreciate that the commentary between you two because again, <laughs> though, though this wasn't intended to make it a debate <laughs> moment, but duly noted that it's been leaked. Um, um, and to that point, um, again, but Madam Gatter brings up a good point. We're convenient when we want to use rules, when we want to say, well, what's, well, where is it written? Right? And it's that, that fact, or it's sort of like that Jedi mind trick, like, okay, but. Where is it in the code? Yes, yeah. Right. So we, we can't be convenient on one minute. We want to say, well, the code doesn't say this. We want to apply that. But then all of a sudden, we want to make, we, we're making rules. Of, that's the whole point. What this whole exercise is about enough with the invisible rules. Let's just be clear. Right. So, so I mean, again, somebody telling you it's so doesn't mean anything unless it's written. <laughs> Where's the contract? What establishes what this is about? This is good though. I appreciate that. Um, so, all right, let's keep going because I know we, we got a long, we got we got an executive session. Again, this was just a reading. We, we got plenty of time to weigh in. So I, I just said, you know, give your initial reaction, but let's not debate this right now. This is just a reading. There'll be time for us to plenty <laughs> weigh in just to be respectful because we, right. we, we this thing could go sideways real quick and it wasn't the intent. That's why it's even in discussion. It's just to be respectful and present it. So um, Madam Clerk, can you just grab the next one and go down? I'll submit those changes that will come before. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. County Clerk? Yes, sir. Okay, the next one will be procurement department. Just bear with me. It's a few pages. Uh, number one, purpose. 1.1. Uh, 1. 1. 
to establish policy, define responsibilities, and set forth procedures for the solicitation, negotiation, evaluation, and award of contracts for professional services. Number two, references. 2.1, see Douglas County Code of Ordinance section 9-25, purchase procedures. Section 2.2, see Douglas County Code of Ordinance section 9-28, bid procedures. Number three is the de definitions. 3.1, professional services. Professional services are services such as, but not limited to, the services of outside attorneys, physicians, architects, engineers, and other consultants or individuals or organizations that provide services which involve extended analysis, the exercise of discretion and independent judgment, and their performance and, and an advanced specialized type of knowledge, expertise, of, or training, customarily acquired either by a degree or a certificate or equivalent experience in the field. 3.2, minor professional services contract under $50,000. A professional services contract which does not exceed the amount requiring award by the Board of Commissioners as established by Code Section 9-25. 3.3, major professional services contract over $50,000. A professional services contract which exceeds the amount requiring award by the Board of Commissioners as established by the Board of Commissioners Code Section 9-25. 3.4, request for proposal. A written request for proposal is used to solicit proposals for major professional services contracts. The RFP shall include a description of the work scope and services to be performed, the specific criteria to be used in evaluating the proposals, and other pertinent information to assist consultants in ascertaining the needs of the county. RFP shall, shall state that the county will negotiate with the most qualified consultants to determine the final contract award. 3.5, qualified consultant. A consultant is qualified if that consultant has the technical capability, knowledge, facilities, and staff to perform the work required. 3.6, evaluation team. An evaluation team consists of a minimum of three persons appointed by the responsible department head and approved by the county manager slash administrator to handle the review and selection process on specific major consultant contracts. 3.7, department head. The department head shall mean the department head or designee. A department head shall mean the department head, I'm sorry, that was a duplicate. When the selection of a professional services involves contracting with a consultant to prepare an environmental impact report, department head shall mean the department head of the Department of Community Development or a designee. Number four, policy. 4.1, major professional services contract over $50,000. 4.11, general, con general consult Consultants for major professional services contracts shall be selected and retained utilizing the procedures specified in this section. A screening process may be employed to reduce all prospective consultants to a practical number for evaluation purposes. Number 4.1.2, waiver of, pro of proposals. The Board of Commissioners may waive its RFP proce procedure if waiver is in the best interest of the county. 4.1.3, evaluation team. With the approval of the county manager administration, the responsible department head shall appoint an evaluation team to assist in establishing a list of qualified consultants, evaluate proposals, and make award recommendations. The evaluation team may be drawn from the county staff, county officials, and persons who have no connection with the county or with the project to be undertaken. For some projects, it may be desirable to rely entirely upon the county staff as the evaluation, while other projects may call for the board to have a member of the profession under consideration or a public official from another agency who is knowledgeable in the particular field under consideration. 4.1.4, data file. Departments may elect to maintain a data file consisting of an established list of consultants, pre-qualified, or various types of recurring professional services. 4.1.5, pre-proposal meeting, pre meeting. For unique projects, a department head may hold a pre-proposal meeting and invite all interested consultants to attend. At this meeting, the general scope of the project shall be discussed. 
This meeting shall be devoted solely to the discussion of the project itself. Qualifications of the firm shall not be considered and interested firms which are not able to be represented at this meeting may be furnished minutes of the meeting and invited to ask questions prior to the issuance of their request for proposals. 4.1.6, initial screening. If the department head determines that there is an insufficient number of qualified consultants in the data file, an initial screening process may be utilized. Letters of interest and advertisements may be used including a general description of the project work scope and a request that the consultants respond by sending pertinent information about their firm's capabilities. The evaluation team shall screen all responding firms and compile a list of qualified consultants. 4.1.7, request for proposal. The department head shall assist the purchasing agent in soliciting proposals, pr proposals from at least three firms. The request for proposal shall include a statement of the project work scope and the services required. Each proposal shall include a resume of the proposed project manager, the name of the principal responsible for the work, a statement concerning the ability of the firm to meet required time schedules, a detailed outline describing how each would conduct the project, previous experience, present workload, ability to respond, number of qualified personnel, extent of subcontracting of work, previous projects and present relationship with the county, ability to perform scope of services, all or a portion of work, stability of firm, and reference response other, for other public projects. Um, and the last one is methodology. 4.1.8, evaluation and negotiation. The evaluation team shall review and evaluate all proposals and if necessary, schedule oral re interviews. The evaluation team shall select a priority list of consultants based on the criteria utilized. The department head shall contact the first choice of the evaluation team and commence negotiations of the terms of a consultant services agreement, including the fee for the services to be provided. If an agreement cannot be negotiated, excuse me, <coughs> with the first choice consultant within the budgetary limits established for the project. Excuse me, just one second. Take your time. <coughs> Sorry, let me start that sentence over. <coughs> Take your time. If an if an agreement cannot be negotiated with the first choice consultant within the budgetary limits established for the project, the second choice of the evaluation team shall be contacted and the first choice dismissed from, from further consideration on that particular project. Firms which have submitted proposals but were not among the final candidates should be notified in writing. The evaluation team members must sign an affidavit of confidentiality. 4.1.9, award. <clears throat> award. The department head shall forward the award recommendation to the purchasing agent. 4.110, notification of award. All consultants participating in the negotiation process shall be notified in writing of the successful award. Proposal submitted by <clears throat> competing consultants shall not be disclosed to the public or its competitors. 4.1.11, term. The professional services contract shall be for a term of one year with the option to renew for additional one year terms, not to exceed five years. The termination, <coughs> excuse me, shall be without penalty. 4.2, minor professional services contracts under 50,000. 4.2.1, general. Consult, consultants for minor professional services contracts shall be selected and retained utilizing the informal procedures specified in this section. 4.2.2, request for quotes. The department head shall solicit quotes from one to three firms. One quote is acceptable for services under $1,000. Three quotes are required for services over $1,001 up to $50,000. The quote shall be written and shall include a statement of the project work scope 
and the services to be provided and shall include the information specified in section 4.1.7. 4.2.3, Evaluation and Negotiation. The department head shall review and evaluate all quotes and if necessary, schedule oral interviews. The department head shall contact the first choice consultant and negotiate the terms of the consultant services agreement, including the fee for the services to be provided. If an agreement cannot be negotiated with the first choice consultant within the budgetary limits established for the project, the second choice shall be contacted and the first choice dismissed from further consideration on that particular project. 4.2.4, award. The department shall forward the award recommendation to the county administrator slash manager, who shall be the award authority for minor professional services contracts. The county administrator slash manager may delegate to department heads award authority for minor professional services contracts, not exceeding a, specific, a specified amount. Such delegation shall be in writing. 4.2.5, notification of award. All consultants participating in the negotiation process shall be notified in writing of the successful award. Quotes submitted by competing consultants shall not be disclosed to the public or to competitors. 4.2.6, contract modifications. The county administrator slash manager or a designee shall approve all contract modifications which when added to the amount of the initial contract and all other contract modifications do not exceed the county administrator slash manager's award authority. The Board of Commissioners shall approve any contract modifications, which when added to all other contract modifications and the original contract exceed the award authority of the county administrator slash manager. Once the Board of Commissioners has approved a contract modification, that has caused the total amount of the contract and prior modifications to exceed the county administrator manager's authority. A new baseline is established and subsequent modifications. If within the award of the county administrator slash manager shall be approved by the county administrator slash manager. Example, the board of commissioners enters into an agreement for $10,000. It is then amended a couple of times and the total of the original contract and amendment are now over the county administrator slash manager's approval authority of 25,000 and the commission chair's approval of authority of $50,000. The contract now amount now exceeds the county administrator slash manager and the commission chair's approval authority and has to go to the board of commissioners for approval. And that's it. Thank you, County Clerk. I know that was full, um, but again, that's a very important, like our finance policy last year, procurement is a very important one. So as a point of distinguishing, uh, County Clerk, the travel policy and the one you just read, can you di different between a departmental policy and a county ordinance? Just so as we're looking at those, which ones need to be made for notification and which one of those can just go right to the agenda? Can you clarify for us, please? Well, a county ordinance would have to, um, we would have to advertise for a public hearing and hold a public hearing before we can adopt any mm -hmm. amendment to the to the code. Is that what okay. you were asking? Yes. So I, the ones we're talking about as we go through them, can you let us know which one will be part of a notification process and which ones aren't? Yes, sir. Are you able to? Yeah. Yes, right. sir. And the, the one I just read for procurement department policy, that would be policy. Okay. Right, so we That's don't what have I to would suggest anyway. So, so Director Evers and, and County Administrator, you guys clear on that, that this would just be a, an amendment to the text manual you've already got out there on our site. Are we clear? If it's adopted by the board? I am clear. Okay, great. Um, to my peers, anybody want to weigh in on this one? Again, this is just a reading comments to do next week. Um, but I will yield, or we'll keep going. Or at least I think that's a hint, hint, because they know how to talk if they want to. Keep <laughs> going, Lisa, let's just plow through. Okay, hopefully my voice will um, <laughs> be able to finish it. Yep. Let me see, okay. Okay, this is the finance department policy dash compensation. The following represents changes to public safety, living wage, and level four employees. Public safety. The Board of Commissioners shall, shall create a public safety district to allow appropriate 
and salary funding for all areas of public safety, such as sheriff, fire, EMS, E911, animal control, and coroner. A separate accounting fund akin to the capital transportation fund shall be created. The source of funding shall be fixed on one mill on top of the annual millage rate, which is set every calendar year. This public safety rate shall be fixed on one mill independent of the set millage rate for 10 years. At the end of the 10 year term, the public safety rate can be reestablished in whole at one mill or quarter fractions thereof by majority vote of the Board of Commissioners for a period of five or 10 years thereafter. The proceeds within this public safety fund shall be only applied to the salary components of the public safety areas and cannot reduce the current annual appropriations amounts of the salaries of the salary parts of the budget to ensure compliance with any effective state budgetary laws. The effective date of this public safety millage rate shall occur simultaneously on the day which, <clears throat> which the Board of Commissioners sets its annual millage rate and the proceeds in the fund shall be available in the following fiscal year. Therefore, the first effective date of the public safety rate is September 1st, 2022, and the proceeds shall be applied to the 2023 fiscal budget. Discretion is given to elected officials or department heads for fund usage towards salary adjustments, promotions, overtime, bonuses, and or performance awards. Living wage. The Board of Commissioners desire to establish a countywide minimum wage for all employees, whether full or part-time, at the rate of $16.50 per hour. This also applies to temporary workers as well as all service contracts with hourly rate cards. The effective date of this countywide ordinance or policy shall be January 1st, 2022 and run into perpetu perpetuity. Level four. The Board of Commissioners desires to set and standardize salaries, supplements, allowances, expense accounts, as well as affirm pension, retirement, and medical benefits while in office and after, to fix and or normalize amounts, vesting, penalties, beneficiaries, and other associated terms. That's it? Yes, sir. That's it. All right. Uh, again, to my fellow commissioners, anybody want to weigh in on this? These are just proposals. Uh, this one particularly has um, a financial or a fiscal impact, um, obviously, um, to, to the positive, depends on how you want to look at it. But it gets into what we've been talking about for several years now. Right? And, and the main one is compensating our public safety, everybody in public safety. So this is one which I'm sponsoring personally because I said it would. We're like, okay, let's bring this forward. Let's deal with this and deal with it permanently. If we care about our public safety, then let's put something in place that will ensure the funding like military off the top. Military, it's done. Since we were talking about federal a little bit earlier, right? That gave me the inspiration. For this, just like we have a fire district and everything else, we can create, we, we can create, we can legislate, we can look at this, we can adopt it. So I'm proposing this. Um, I, I know it's different, uh, but this, this, this dog will hunt. Uh, it really comes down to the will of the board. Um, obviously, I've talked to some citizens uh, regarding this. Um, you know, at my listening posts, people didn't have any problem with that. Well, you know, that's all we paid them and stuff. So but again, here's a chance, here's our official chance for all of us, all five of us to finally weigh in on how we're gonna deal with um, compensating our front, um, I'm gonna say our public safety, uh, and I'm using public safety broadly, uh, public safety as uh, assigned inside our, our, our CAFR, uh, you know, sort of that annual financial report that we have produced. Um, obviously it's more from an accounting, everybody, all those functions in there are part of public safety. All right, so there's no distinguishing, there's no sub-selection. It's like everybody eats, everybody gets acknowledged, everybody gets fed. So that's what that one was about. The living wage is one, obviously we have a lot of people that are working in our parks. They're working in all over the place. And it's like, it's, it's, we, we can do better than this. And, that, and I'm, I'm thinking this on this one, this is a little bit more broader as anybody who not only within our footprint, when we talk about a countywide ordinance, a countywide, uh, minimum wage, whether it's $15 or what's being proposed here at $16.50, uh, 
it's, it's, it's anybody that we award money to. So if it's defects and they're below that, then that needs to be addressed. You need to make sure you would accommodate that county administrator. So when y'all come back with y'all fiscal impact, it's just not people to report to you. <clears throat> this is countywide ordinance. Please understand the, uh, the intent of proposing this so there's no confusion. Right? Anybody get county dollars, just like with federal, anybody get county dollars that we're appropriating your funding that anybody that you have, you must have a minimum wage if, if it's the desire of the board. And the last one there is really should be level, it was level three and four, which means all elected officials, all elected officials where that one is going. So Lisa just says that a mark, it was level three and four is all elected officials. Um, level four is board commissioners by itself. And obviously that was not the intent. It's all elected officials, which would be three and four um, to normalize, to, to, to pick up what we hadn't finished from last year and to uh, have that conversation about normalizing versus the one-off, but uh, whether it's this retirement or that supplement or this, let's normalize this, let's go in here. And again, one more time, let's codify this thing. We, we do a lot of trying to figure out what, what the history was and what were they thinking and looking at meeting minutes like, well, just put it in the code. Just, just put it in the code, clarify it. And so we got to fix some of those things. So hopefully this will give direction to obviously our new leadership and those who will come after us. We're doing justice by establishing, doing things that um, are typically um, politically inconvenient, but this is what's right. We need to fix this and do it well. So anyway, I'm just making that note. So I'm going to pause right here. Anybody want to weigh in? Again, this one's media as well, but you know, talk to your citizens, um, get back feedback. There's no obligation to to do anything other than just to to hear it out. So I'll yield to anybody who wants to speak. Yes, I want. I want to jump in. On yes, this. ma'am. Ma uh, sure, sure. Yeah, I love your pro thought process. You think big, uh, but I just want to just kind of scale back and think. I said, you know, I was I come, came from the world of healthcare where we had multiple levers of just generating revenue. And I've been cursed with two levers, which is just a sales tax and property taxes. And I heard, I, I'm not sure if I heard um, the reading, one meal per year going forward to take care of our, of our public safety, which I agree, but um, that's rather ambitious in my, in my opinion. Just wondering if we could toggle maybe a quarter of a meal or something, because we're focusing on one particular discipline, which would be public safety, uh, because that one meal may be uh, yield more than what we would need for public safety. I'm just trying to think uh, big with you, but at the same time, be realistic, uh, knowing that it's only two levers, and then also be very sensitive to our citizens here in Douglas County, particularly our property owners. And then I like the hourly salary uh, proposal. Our, our county administrator is working on something that she's going to bring before the board. We have, uh, we're below the threshold of 15000 I mean, $15 per hour uh, across the board. And we just thought that that would be one, but we certainly, we, I would love to negotiate with you on that. I see the 1650, that's gonna, we, we already got a, we have a plan and wanted to bring before the board. She has one. Let me just say our county administrator and to see what the thought process, but we agree with you. Those salaries need to be increased uh, because $10 an hour is, is that that's not, no longer <laughs> the school of thought for paying our citizens. Uh, McDonald's is even paying more than $10 an hour now, and I agree. So we are going to bring something to you and just see if there's some room for negotiation uh, as you uh, certainly proceed down the field with this, uh, with your uh, new uh, policies. Um, yeah, on the meal, not sure. Did, did I hear one meal, Commissioner? I just wasn't sure. Did I hear one meal per year going forward? <laughs> I'm just not sure. Yeah, no, I, I, I was, um, if you're asking, no, I wasn't joking. Oh. Uh, it's, it's showing you the math that says, well, here's the math of an ideal world, but the rest of it, it is a process, yeah. right? In other yeah. words, but you're doing it for fire districts. Right, right. You're, 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 you're doing it now, right? There's other counties that actually has this mm -hmm. um, in place. So it's just one of those to be thoughtful. Uh, yeah. And it's like, okay, well, again, let's, let's, Let's have the conversation. So the intent, again, is just a proposal to think through it. Talk yeah. about it with your citizens. I mean, I mean, they said, I mean, in the strategic plan, the number one priority was public safety across yeah. the board. Yeah. All right. So here we go. So listen, but but again, this is just a proposal. This this everybody's going to weigh in, and you guys yeah. will come up with the numbers accordingly. Okay. Um, again, can you break it down? Make a sub a, um, a fraction there? Sure, you can. If you want to just say a quarter, sure you can. 
Mm -hmm. so none of this is locked. So by all means, Madam Chair, this is not an up or down for just a mill. Again, the financial, I'd, I'd go get our financial advisor or somebody, our finance guys, run the numbers real quick and show Madam Chair what this means. I mean, one mill is $5 million. Add $5 million to your bucket right now. How much did that get you for paying public safety? What is that? What, their budget is $35 million. That gets you, what, about an 8% raise per year? All right, so then you can subdivide that. I mean, mm -hmm. I can get through this math pretty quickly, but it gives you something to think about. Your right. staff should be able to provide the additional detail for this. So for my fellow commissioners, it's not, our, it's not for them to come back and respond to what we're proposing and then help us understand what we're looking at. I don't expect any of us to go do a spreadsheet, Madam Chair. It's for them to now like, okay, what is the financial or fiscal impact for that? Like we said, we need staff to now help us make decisions as was stated earlier by the county administrator. So right. but if this is just a proposal. It's to get the thoughts going. But please, I'm not proposing this as a lock or one or zero because right. I know that, that that's not what this is about. So. Yeah, and, and I'm hoping that this this whatever percentage of meal we look at, you know, that, that you're proposing, certainly we will not uh, dismiss the the loss for those op, uh, capital items. And I'm hoping we just continue to do that. But this would be primarily for salaries. Is that what I'm hearing? Yes, for only salary. Yes, it's salary. unique. It's only yes. salary. You got yes. splos, T splos, whatever splos. Keep going with that. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to address the elephant that's been in the room that we hear we've heard. Yes. For five years. Yes, I, I hear. Right. That's all I'm trying to address. I'm not trying to solve the rest of the problems that I know you and your staff are working on. It's that one issue. Yes. Let's deal with it. Okay. All right. You said there's room for negotiation. I like that. And then uh, certainly, Rosalind, I know you're on the line as well and sharing. But just crunch some numbers and break it down by quarter of a meal, half of a meal, three quarters of a meal and a meal. Just see what the impact is. And then and then percentage of raise, if we said uh, every year, 5%, 10% what our plan was, so we'll make sure that that money is available for our public safety uh, uh, employees. So if we can look at it, just build a model, would that be something you can do, uh, Rosalind? Uh, yeah. And that, that'll show the board, give us something to look at. Okay. All right. Yeah. I see you, Commissioner Carthen. I, well, I sure, I'm not sure if you see it. No, but no I, you're good. You, you can keep going. Madam Carthen, go right ahead. Yes. Okay, thank you so much. And um, uh, Madam Chair to uh, Madam Subedin and Rosalind Miller, uh, our Interim Finance Director, uh, I would implore that you get with each of the um, public safety directors all the way from um, Chief Joe Levet all the way to Sheriff Pounds, um, E911, I think that's Jason, um, our coroner, uh, and please don't leave out our um, Russell to zone over in code enforcement uh, mm -hmm. as part of safety as well. Please mm -hmm. include them because uh, their offices work so hard in maintaining safety and decorum in Douglas County. And sometimes I think that they are left out of those conversations. Um, I know Chief Joe Levette, um, office um, has done some research into what the baseline should be for our fire and EMS workers. And so at minimum, we need to at least do the baseline so that we will stop losing employees in those areas to other counties. We need to establish a baseline. We need to come up with what our counter, um, our um, contiguous counties around us are paying their employees. Um, although we may not be able to compete with private sector, I believe other public entities should not be stealing away our good men and women that we have trained and given experience to, and they're leaving the county because we're not paying them what they are worth, and we know their worth. So again, I ask that um, you all get with each of those prospective um, directors and department heads and at least do the baseline, and then let's go up from there um, because we need um, all of them to understand that we value them that they are worth it and that we as a county can can do what we need to do in order to ensure that they can feed their families and continue to be a part of, of Douglas County. Um, we just cannot allow for them not to be making the equivalent of what their counterparts are making in counties around us, such as Paulding County. And um, Madam Chair, I do hear you about a quarter of a meal and a meal. Um, I think, you know, I as a taxpayer, would definitely want to pay an extra meal if I knew that my fire department, my sheriff's department, my E911, if I knew that those people were there and they were um, and they needed to get paid a living wage, I would be more 
and glad to pay that meal. And I'm pretty sure a lot of the people that I have spoken with would be glad to know that that's what that meal is going to. So I don't want us to, to you know, minimize um, doing half a meal when we know half a meal probably won't get what we need to ensure that going forward, we are paying these people and we are continuing to meet the needs as inflation and everything else goes up. We wanna make sure that our workers are compensated accordingly. And that's my comment. Thank you, Madam Chair and Vice Chair Robinson, good work. Oh, thank you, Commissioner. No, I, I thank you again, Madam Carlton. Great comments. And, and again, one more time, even like with our, we have human infrastructure that needs to be maintained, you know, order, oiled, watered, everything else. And we, we put a lot of intention, um, intention and focus on inanimate objects, shiny objects, right? But every now and then, you know, the, the county is made of people. They are the government, not the buildings that we put so much emphasis, not the shiny wheels and stuff. So again, one more time, um, they've had play, there's been plenty of time where this could have been taken up and addressed, uh, but now we're going to take this up and face it and see what comes out the other side. And I so saw no other comments. I'm just going to come back to the one about level three or level four. That's a conversation we don't have to broach yet. This is for all of our constitution and fellow elected officials. We'll see you on Friday. Um, we, we've got our marker for you that we we this is how we do it. You guys know that if you're looking for some type of um, adjustment or something like that, this is the time that you do it in a public venue, um, um, in, a, in a public meeting. Um, no, no emails, no, no nothing like that. Y'all have got to get the ring like we do. You've got to advocate for your interests. So that's for you and yours, as well as for all um, the people that are within your areas that you think are appropriate. So Madam Chair, I just wanted to disclaim that, that this is a focus on normalizing all elected officials no matter who they may be and what size um, um, they are um, in, in various charters at the state. Um, but it, this is just that we've heard things along the way that they wanted to be addressed. So we're saying, we heard you. Okay, well, we'll see you on Friday. So that was all, Madam Chair. I yield back on that one. So um, guys, anything else from anybody else? We got a couple more. We can, those will be much, much faster than this one. Madam Guider, Commissioner Mitchell. We're good. Okay, Lisa, keep plowing. Yes, sir. Okay, this one is planning and zoning department policy. It's concerning HOAs and Airbnbs. And I would, this may go actually under the Unified Development Code, yep. um, which would require public hearings as well. Okay. Okay, homeowners associations. The Board of Commissioners desire to amend the Unified Development Code to include a provision whereby all new subdivisions, homeowner associations, COA, um, or POA, I'm not sure, Commissioner, can you say what those? Yeah, it's COA and POA, condominium, and, and one is, is, is property owner okay. association, condominium owner association and property okay. owner association. Okay. okay, they shall be required to include a stipulation in their covenant where the HOA registers with the county to provide, to provide name of HOA, mailing address, current HOA president name, address, email, phone number, to provide an ongoing annual election date notice, as well as an election results of officers with their names, addresses, and emails for subsequent elections for their results must be published to the county via email with the officer's name, address, email, and title within 10 business days of the election night. Election day notices must be given 30 days to all homeowners by United States mail or 75% of existing homeowners email 30 days prior to an election day. The HOA shall also provide to the county on an, on an annual basis, an annual summary of their financial report, which was submitted to all existing homeowners via US mail or email. The BOC shall list the HOAs, their annual elections results and annual financial reports on its website, establishing a 10 day compliance window and a $100 penalty. The BOC shall establish for a community portal on its website to upload HOA reports. For existing HOAs, the Board of Commissioners shall communicate with all homeowners to solicit their registration of their existing officers, election dates, and financial reports to establish a baseline for ongoing self-maintenance with an effective date of January 1, 2022. Airbnb. The Board of Commissioners desire that all Airbnb Airbnbs are registered with the county to ensure taxation 
and regulation of said rental properties in residentially zoned communities. And that's the end. Okay. Again, just a placeholder, um, Madam Carthen, I'm going to call on you to take that one and I, I'll deal with the other one, um, the sub one. No problem, Chair, uh, Vice Chair Robinson. I can take that up and I am just a piggyback. We have over 400 HOAs. The county only has 12 emails and phone numbers. So this one is, is pretty important. Um, so I'm glad you are bringing this, this one up and um, I can take the wheels on that one, definitely. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Carthen. And again, the, 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 in the first one um, that we brought up as far as registration, this is something that we've been talking about uh, for five years now since I um, um, joined um, Lisa Cupid, who at that time was a commissioner of Cobb County and Marvin Arrington for South Fulton. We, we began to hear these issues with homeownership associations um, and, and, and that is unregulated nature. Um, we've already changed our code, our unified, uh, unified development code. Thank you, James Worthington. Thank you, Ron Roberts, for all the work that your staff did in establishing when the developer or the declarant builds their community. Um, and eventually they turn it over to um, the actual residents once they buy into the covenant. Uh, we recognize that we need to address that in about dealing with amenities. This is once the de declarant or the developer turns over to the HOA. Now you've got living residents that are running their own communities. Um, it's unregulated. And what we've noticed over time, not just in our county, but throughout our region and our state, is that you have officers um, and people who were um, overexerting the power that's there. Um, and um, while some things are, are, are respectfully should be done um, by way of penalties, if you don't pay your, your home ownership of association fees, there, there, there's no recourse. There's no real communication regarding elections um, or financial reports. And we see a lot of what I want to call uh, resident shenanigans. It's like, come on, guys. But that's a state issue. And so we hear, like, um, this morning, I have residents who are upset, not necessarily at me personally, but, but the fact that I, I can't do anything. I don't use my office to go beat up on an HOA when it's like, well, I can't. They're regulated by the state. We don't have the authority unless we're able to codify that locally. That's a state issue. An HOA is state charter. Right, so, but here we are trying to say, but oh, we see some things that are happening. You're putting liens on people's property. So we as legislators are trying to do our part where we can to be able to influence, uh, put elections in place where, you know, guys, you know what's going on. Where's your money going? Just to your point earlier, but where's these tax dollars going? Think about in the HOA. You don't even see your financials. You don't even know who elected. You got your power broker attorneys and stuff that's running things in there and stuff. And they're, they're, they're just, I mean, just the drama that comes out of that, I mean, we see it. And it's not regulated. And we're hurting ourselves and, and, and our neighbors. So that's something that we took up. I mean, it's a process. That is, a um, Ron, um, you, you know, you guys, um, um, James, I'm going to, uh, directors, I'm going to let you guys handle that, pro um, that process for me and Madam Carthen, because that's something that's actually going to fall squarely over there with there um, in that area. So. If there's no more comments on this one, again, that's a process in and of itself. You'll see that in the PMZ and you, we'll speak to that accordingly. Madam Chair, any thoughts on this? I mean, you have any initial reaction or reservations to what we're proposing? Yeah, loser. You're on mute, Madam Chair. I'm sorry, I'm so mute. No, I, everything, it, it sounds good. I, I'm not sure if the other board wanna weigh in, but I think it's okay. I'm okay with it. And again, it's a process. I want to hit on something about, you know, we talk about transparency, right? We're, it, it's sort of like Angie's List or whatever, um, BBB, uh, Better Business Bureau. We're, we're trying to create an atmosphere like, look, I, I can't solve that directly. It is state regulated. But if I can create an atmosphere that says, look, so when people come in, realtors are, are promoting people to come into our community, well, go on the county's website and see, do they at least do their elections? Ooh. To at least put their financials out there. Oh boy. Think about what, what we're sponsoring here. We're just saying, just put it up there. It's, it's self maintenance, put your stuff up there. It's just the penalty, it's just sort of like, okay, are y'all serious about this? Are, are we being hypocritical? That one thing, the standard is what the county, and what, you know, we wear these pins, we're held to a standard. You gotta be transparent. We're trying to create an atmosphere because we see that covenant as strong as our constitution and things that we do. So we're saying, okay. 
Well, let's, let's like, y'all have to agree this now. Now come to the public hearing and weigh in. Is this something good that you want us to put this in play that you will self-report and hold yourselves accountable so when other people come and they see they're like, okay, so what's going on in that community, right? Put some light on it. So again, it is not, we're not dictating this. Uh, our job is to sponsor things that we've heard that perhaps can solve problems. We hear the pain from our citizens that are out there. Um, I, I cannot cure. Uh, we also talked about an HOA court. I, I did talk to one of our um, 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 Superior Court judges, um, Bo McLean, last week. Um, while he may not be at um, our constitutional retreat this week because he's beginning a murder trial today, it's something that we did talk about, which is um, um, HOA court. And while he has his own position on those things, he understood. How do we deal with this? This is, this is outside of our swim lane. We got to go across the aisle on this one, guys. So one more time to our citizens who are upset, like Mr. Dixon this morning, like, look, this is outside my, my swim lane, but I'm going to do all I can to create an atmosphere in which you're, 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 you can get you know, redress. But, but that, no means this is really in our sweet spot because we don't have the authority. So again, this is good. Again, we're raising our level of thinking that we can solve major problems. Again, we do know that the HOA bill is up at the state. We already sponsoring some um, legislation with that. Um, and so we know that last year it didn't go forth. So we've been working on trying to change state laws regarding that. We know that it's not right being liked or looked at uh, because the current leg um, legislative leadership, that's fine. We could do it locally to the extent that we have power to move it along. So nevertheless, that's it, Madam Chair. Um, if there's no more questions on that one, again, people, um, um, to our citizens, this is something that you'll be able to weigh in on through a public hearing um, and, and sometime in the near future. So. With that being said, kind of Clark, how many more we got to go? One more? We're almost done. <laughs> All right, keep going, plow through. These last two would be amendments to our code of ordinances. Okay. Um, this one would be an amendment to our purchasing procedures, section 9-25, paragraph D. Um, I'm, if it's okay with you, I'm just gonna read the last sentence that we've added to. Yes, please. Okay. Okay, requisitions for professional services rendered to the county by attorneys at law, engineers, accountants, medical doctors, insurance agencies, and other such professional personnel shall be approved or denied by a majority of the commissioners. And what was what is proposed to be added is, is if the amount is greater than $50,000. That's pretty straightforward. Some of these guys were just text amendments while we're in there. We're just cleaning up, you know, veins and arteries, et cetera. But this wasn't, that wasn't intended to be major uh, constructive. Madam Chair, any thoughts? Or that was just it. Okay. I don't have any thoughts. Mm -mm. Yeah, yeah, it's minor. Lisa, get the last one so we can move on. You know, give yes, Madam Chair sir. back the floor. Yes. Yes, sir. The last one um, would be an amendment to our policy for boards, commissions, and authority appointments. Um, we added a paragraph, uh, number five, under funding. Any Douglas County board, commission, committee, or authority in which the Douglas County Board of Commissioners provides funding must provide annual reports on use of funds and outcomes. Failure to adhere to this policy could result in reduction, elimination, or non-approval of future rounds of funding. And again, that would be an amendment to our policy. Okay, again, um, you know, Madam Chair, I'm gonna yield after this final comment. This one is intended to deal with, um, as we talked about, we do fund other agencies outside okay. of county administrators um, direct reports. Um, and there's inconsistency on um, accountability. Um, and so we thought, we would, again, one more time, we're normalizing. We're normalizing something that just, some people do reporting better than others. Some just, it, 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 we, we can do better. We, we talk about transparency where the spend is. We talk about, okay, what is our outcome? So not only do they have to provide a report, but it's also not just report on where the spending was, but did you accomplish what we're giving you money for, or what you stated that you were going to get uh, do, or what was the outcome? So that is something that we've, we've talked about. It. We, we do it one off, like with our mental health, we award somebody $25,000, $50,000, they have to give it, or Sharehouse, who does a, a very good job um, in reporting, but there's others that um, we just never held them to a standard. And so now we're trying to get attention, says, no, this is important. We just can't spot money, and then it goes into a vacuum as if there's an entitlement without any type of um, accountability. 
Um, if my peers want to weigh in on that one, that was pretty straightforward. We're just picking that up from last year. But if there's nothing else, Madam Chair, from anybody else, I'm just going to yield the floor and let you take it from here. I yield, Madam Chair. Thank you for the time. Let me propose this to the full board. Okay. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. And thank you again for taking the time to research and draft the legislation to come before the board for our first readings and, and certainly encourage our peers uh, to uh, submit any changes or any recommendations to how do you want these recommendations? We'll just submit them to uh, Lisa, our clerk, uh, and then she can uh, pull all that information together and then we'll go from there and be prepared to discuss yeah, it. Send them, yeah, send them back. Um, there is a date in, um, um, at the header of this. So send them back by the time frame in writing. It should come back to me as I'm aggregating these since I'm sponsoring them. So it's like the tab with finance and I'll work with um, Lisa to get this done. Mm -hmm. I want to be careful, Lisa. You didn't, she didn't draft it, Madam Chair, we did. So I want to be sensitive to that. Thank you. Uh, right, a lot of these policies is good that we're massaging our policies because uh, some of these, some of the things that that brought forth today, we've been talking about it, but we haven't been about it. Uh, we haven't done our due diligence on some of those items. So thank you for grabbing some of those items. So we'll stop talking. I, I was wondering if you were speaking of outside agencies when Lisa read the last piece, and then you you hit the nail on the head. Outside agencies. We've been talking about that for the last three budget cycles. And we really hadn't put our teeth in it. We need to put some legislation around it so we could have, uh, so they'll be focused and understand what our, what our ask is from the beginning and then they could deliver at the end when we need to see reports. So thank you. All right, um, well, is there anything else to come before, the, before I call for an executive um, session? I'll talk to our attorney. Attorney Bernard, do we need to go into executive session? Okay, uh, we need an executive session for personnel. We need to confirm that with Chair and Superintendent, please. Yes, that is correct. And you have a board appointment as well. Yeah, personnel. Okay, Madam Chair, did you get that? Chairman Jones. Board of Commissioners, do we have a motion to go into executive session? So second. We have a motion and a second. Board of Commissioners, any discussion? We have a motion and a second. When I call your district, please respond accordingly. District one? Yes. District two? Yes. District three? Yes. District four? Yes. Chairman, yes. We have a 5 0 unanimous vote to go into executive session. Board of Commissioners, please take a 10 minute break. Uh, this is probably going into our seventh hour in our. <laughs> Apologize, number one, and thank you for being able to hold out uh, this uh, for seven hours. All right, uh, um, citizens of Douglas County, we will uh, go, engage in our executive sessions. When I say that, the Board of Commissioners, and we will return momentarily.
Thank you, citizens of Douglas County, for your patience. Uh, it is now 4.40 p.m., and uh, we had a quite robust executive session, and we appreciate your patience. Board of Commissioners, I have final comments before we end our meeting today, and I would like to also thank you all for your time today uh, for um, making sure that we review all the things that are necessary to make our, our county government efficient and effective. Um, I will just end by just saying to our citizens, we are beginning, our vaccination rate is creeping up some. Uh, kudos to our citizens, certainly want to commend you for doing a great job. Uh, my last um, report came in at 48% is what we're looking at that's fully vaccinated. And I remember about two months ago, we were about 22%. So that's very uh, promising and, and, and very exciting news. And just ask our citizens to continue uh, pushing forward and considering taking the vaccine. But meanwhile, if you could just continue with your three W's, wash your hands repeatedly throughout the day, watch your social distancing and wear your mask as your weapon and also as your defense mechanism until we certainly succumb, succumb to the virus. If there's nothing else to come before this body, Board of Commissioners, again, thank you for your time and talent today. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you.